Section 0 of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Noreen. The Ingoldsby Legends, second series by Richard Harris Barham. Second series. To Richard Bentley, Esquire. My dear sir, you tell me that a generous and enlightened public has given a favourable reception to those extracts from our family papers which, at your suggestion, were laid before it some two years since. And you hint, with all possible delicacy, that a second volume might not be altogether unacceptable at a period of the year when old world stories are more especially in request. With all my heart, the old oak chest is not yet empty, in addition to which I have recently laid my hand upon a long manuscript, correspondence of my great-uncle, Sir Peregrine Inglesby, a cadet of the family, who somehow contrived to attract the notice of George the Second, and received from his honour-giving hand the accolade of knighthood. To this last-named source I am indebted for several of the accompanying histories, while my inestimable friend Simpkinson has bent all the powers of his mighty mind to the task. From Father John's stores I have drawn largely. Our honourable friend, Suckle Thumpkin, by the way, he has been beating our covers lately when he shot a woodcock, and one of the governor's pointers, gives a graphic account of the operatic row in which he was heretofore so conspicuous. Why, even Mrs. Barney Maguire, Nay, Mademoiselle Pauline, whose horror of Mrs. Botherby's cap has no jot diminished, furnishes me with the opening legend of the series from the Histoire of her own Belle France. Why, will you not run down to Tappington this Christmas? We have been rather busy of late in carrying into execution the enclosure of Swingfield Minnis under the auspices of my Lord Radnor, and Her Majesty's visit to the neighbourhood has kept us quite alive. The prince, in one of his rides, pulled up at the end of the avenue, and as A, told Suckle Thumpkin, was much taken with the picturesque appearance of our old gable ends. Unluckily, we were all at Canterbury that morning, or proud indeed should we have been to offer his royal highness the humble hospitalities of the hall. And then fancy Mrs. Botherby's magricious, by the way, the old lady tells me you left your nightcap here on your last visit. It is laid up in lavender for you. Come and reclaim it. The Yule log will burn bright as ever in the cedar room. Bin number six is still one liquid ruby. The old October yet smiles like mantling amber, in utter disdain of that vile concoction of chamomile which you so pseudonymously dignify with the title of bitter ale. Make a start, then. Pitch printer's ink to old Harry, and come and spend a fortnight with yours till the crack of doom, Thomas Inglesby. Tappington Everard, December the 16th, 1842. End of section zero. Section one of the Inglesby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. The Black Mousquetaire, A Legend of France. Francois Xavier Auguste was a gay mousquetaire, the pride of the camp, the delight of the fair. He'd a mien so distingué and so débonnaire, and shrugged with a grace so recherché and rare, and he twirled his moustache with so charming an air, his moustaches, I should say, because he'd a pair, and in short showed so much of the true savoir-faire, all the ladies in Paris were wont to declare that could anyone draw them from Diane's strict law, into what Mrs. Ramsbottom called a fox paw, it would be Francois Xavier Auguste de Savoie. Now I'm sorry to say, at that time of day, 
The court of Versailles was a little too gay. The courtiers were all much addicted to play, to Bordeaux, Chambertin, Frontignac, saint Perret, Lafitte, Chateau Margaux, and Siri a cargo, on which John Bull sensibly lays an embargo, while Louis XIV kept about him in scores what the noblesse, in courtesy, termed his Jane Shores. They were called by a much coarser name out of doors. This we all must admit in a king's not befitting. For such courses, when followed by persons of quality, are apt to detract on the score of morality. François Xavier Auguste acted much like the rest of them, dressed, drank, and fought, and chassed with the best of them, took his oeil de perdri till he scarcely could see, he would then sally out in the streets for a spree. His rapier he'd draw, pink à bourgeois, a word which the English translate Johnny Raw. For your thorough French courtier, whenever the fit he's in, thinks it's prime fun to astonish a citizen. And perhaps it's no wonder that this kind of scrapes, in a nation which Voltaire, in one of his japes, defines an amalgam of tigers and apes, should be merely considered as little escapes. But I'm sorry to add, things are almost as bad, a great deal nearer home, and that similar pranks amongst young men who move in the very first ranks are by no means confined to the land of the Franks. Be this as it will, in the general still, though blame him we must, it is really but just to our lively young friend, François Xavier Auguste, to say that however well known his faults were, at his bacchanal parties he always drank fair, and when gambling his worst, always played on the square. So that being much more of a pigeon than rook, he lost large sums at faro, a game like blind hooky, and continued to lose, and to give IOUs, till he lost in the credit he had with the Jews. And a parallel, if I may venture to draw, between François Xavier Auguste de Saint Foy and his namesake, a still more distinguished François, who wrote to his sœur, From Pavie, mon cœur, I have lost all I had in the world for l'honneur. So Saint Foy might have wrote, no dissimilar note, Vive la bagatelle, toujours gay, idem semper. I've lost all I had in the world but my temper. From the very beginning, indeed, of his sinning, his air was so cheerful, his manners so winning, that once he prevailed, or his friends coined the tale for him, on the bailiff who nabbed him himself to go bail for him. Well, we know in these cases, your crabs and deuce aces are wont to promote frequent changes of places. Town doctors, indeed, are most apt to declare that there's nothing so good as the pure country air. Whenever exhaustion of person or purse in an invalid cramps him and sets him a-cursing, a habit I'm very much grieved at divulging, François Xavier Auguste was too prone to indulge in. But what could be done? It's clear as the sun, that though nothing's more easy than, say, cut and run, Yet a guardsman can't live without some sort of fun. E'en I or you, if we'd nothing to do, should soon find ourselves looking remarkably blue. And since no one denies what's so plain to all eyes, it won't, I am sure, create any surprise that reflections like these half reduced to despair, François Xavier Auguste, the gay black mousquetaire. Patience par force he considered, of course, but in vain he could hit on no sort of resource. Love, liquor, law, loo, they would each of them do. There's excitement enough in all four, but in none he could hope to get on sans l'argent, i.e. money. Love? No. Ladies like little cadeau from a suitor. Liquor? No, that won't do when reduced to the pewter. Then law, tis the same. It's a very fine game, but the fees and delays of the courts are a shame. As Lord Brougham says himself, who's a very great name, though the times made it clear, 
he was perfectly lost in his classic attempt at translating Demosthenes, and don't know his particles, who wrote the articles, showing his Greek up so is not known very well. Many thought Barnes, others Mitchell, some Merivelle, but it's scarce worth debate, because from the date of my tale one conclusion we safely may draw, viz. "'Twas not François-Xavier Auguste de Saint-Foy. Lou, no, that he had tried. "'Twas, in fact, his weak side, "'but required more than any a purse well supplied. "'Love, liquor, law, Lou, no, tis all the same story. "'Stay, I have it, ma foi. "'That's odds bobs, there is glory. "'Away with dull care, vive le roi, vive la guerre. "'Peste, I almost forgot, I'm a black mousquetaire.' When a man is like me, sans si sou, sans souci, a bankrupt in purse, and in character worse, with a shocking bad hat and his credit at zero, what on earth can he hope to become but a hero? What a famous thought this is. I'll go as Ulysses. Of old did, like him, I'll see manners and no countries. Cut Paris and gaming and throats in the low countries. So said and so done, he arranged his affairs, and was off like a shot to his black mousquetaires. Now it happened just then that Field Marshal Touraine was a good deal in want of some active young men to fill up the gaps which through sundry mishaps had been made in his ranks by a certain great conde, a general unrivaled, at least in his own day, whose valor was such that he did not care much if he fought with the French or the Spaniards, or Dutch, a fact which has stamped him a rather cool hand, being nearly related to Louis Le Grand. It had been all the same had that king been his brother. He fought sometimes with one, and sometimes with another, for war so exciting, he took such delight in. He did not care whom he fought, so he was fighting, and as I've just said, had amused himself then, by tickling the tail of Field Marshal Touraine, since when the Field Marshal's most pressing concern was to tickle some other chief's tail in his turn. What a fine thing a battle is, not one of those which one saw at the late Mr. Andrew Ducrow's, where a dozen of scene-shifters drawn up in rows would a dozen more scene-shifters boldly oppose, taking great care their blows, did not injure their foes, and alike, save in color and cut of their clothes, which were varied to give more effect to tableaus, while Stickney the Great flung the gauntlet to fate, and made us all tremble, so gallantly did he come, unto encounter bold General Widdicombe, but a real good fight like Pultawa or Lutzen, which Gustavus the Great ended all his disputes in, or that which Suaro engaged without boots in, or Dedingen, Fontenoy, Blenheim, or Minden, or the one Mr. Campbell describes Hohenlinden, where the sun was low, the ground all over snow, and dark as midwinter, the swift Iser's flow, till its color was altered by General Moreau, while the big drum was heard in the dead of the night, which rattled the bard out of bed in a fright, and he ran up the steeple to look at the fight. Twas in just such another one, Names only bother one. Dutch ones, indeed, are sufficient to smother one. In the Netherlands somewhere, I cannot say where, suffice it that there La Fortune de Guerre gave a cast of her calling to our mousquetaire. One fine morning, in short, François-Xavier Auguste, after making some scores of his foes bite the dust, got a mouthful himself of the very same crust, and though, as the bard says, no law is more just than for nesis artifices, so they called fiery soldados at Rome, arte sua periri, yet fate did not draw this poetical law to its fullest extent in the case of Saint-Foy. His good genius most probably found out some flaw and diverted the shot from some deadlier spot to a bone which I think to the best of my memories called by professional men the os femoris, and the ball being one of those named from its shape and some fancied resemblance it bears to the grape, Saint-Foy went down, 
with a groan and a frown, and a hole in his small clothes the size of a crown. Staggered a bit by this palpable hit, he turned on his face and went off in a fit. Yes, a battle's a very fine thing while you're fighting. These same ups and downs are so very exciting. But a somber sight is a battlefield to the sad survivor's sorrowing eye where those who scorn to fly or yield in one promiscuous carnage lie. When the cannon's roar is heard no more and the thick dun smoke has rolled away, and the victor comes for a last survey of the well-fought field of yesterday. No triumphs flush that haughty brow, no proud, exulting look is there. His eagle glance is humbled now, as earthward bent in anxious care, it seeks the form whose stalwart pride but yester morn was by his side. And there it lies, on yonder bank of courses, which themselves had breath, but yester morn, now cold and dank, with other dews than those of death, powerless as it had ne'er been born, the hand that clasped his yester morn. And there are widows wandering there that roam the blood besprinkled plain and listen in their dumb despair for sounds they ne'er may hear again. One word, however faint and low, I, in a groan, were music now, and this is glory fame, but pshaw, Miss Muse, you're growing sentimental. Besides, such things we never saw. In fact, they're merely continental. And then your ladyship forgets some widows came for epaulets. So go back to your canter, for one, I declare, is now fumbling about our capsized musketeer, a beetle-browed hag with a knife and a bag and an old tattered bonnet which thrown back discloses the ginger complexion and one of those noses peculiar to females named Levi and Moses, such as nervous folks still, when they come in their way shun, old vixen face tramps of the Hebrew persuasion. You remember, I trust, François Xavier Auguste had uncommon fine limbs and a very fine bust. Now there's something I cannot tell what it may be, about good-looking gentlemen turned twenty-three, above all when laid up with a wound in the knee, which affects female hearts in no common degree, with emotions in which many feelings combine, very easy to fancy, though hard to define, ugly or pretty, stupid or witty, young or old, they experience in country or city what's clearly not love, yet it's warmer than pity, and some such a feeling, no doubt, tis that stays, the hand you may see that old Jezebel raise. Armed with the blade, so oft used in her trade, the horrible calling e'en now she is plying, despoiling the dead and dispatching the dying. For these nimble conveyancers, after such battles, regarding as treasure trouvé all goods and chattels, think not in perusing and settling the titles, so safe as six inches of steel in the vitals. Now don't make a joke of that feeling I spoke of, for as sure as you're born, that same feeling, whate'er, it may be saves the life of the young musketeer. The knife that was leveled erewhile at his throat is employed now in ripping the lace from his coat, and from what I suppose I must call his culotte, and his pockets, no doubt, being turned inside out, that his mouchoir and gloves may be put up the spout. For of coin you may well conceive all she can do fails to ferret out even a single écu. As a muscular giant would handle an elf, the virago at last lifts the soldier himself, and like a she-Samson at length lays him down in a hospital formed in the neighboring town. I am not very sure, but I think t'was Namur, and there she now leaves him, expecting a cure. Canto two, I abominate physic, I care not who knows, that there's nothing on earth I detest like a dose. That yellowish-green looking fluid whose hue I consider extremely unpleasant to view, with its sickly appearance that trenches so near on what Homer defines the complexion of fear. Claudon, I mean, a nasty pale green, though for want of some word that may better avail, I presume our translators have rendered it pale. 
For consider the cheeks of those well-booted Greeks. Their Egyptian descent was a question of weeks. Their complexion, of course, like a half-decayed leeks. And you'll see in an instant the thing that I mean in it. A Greek face in a funk had a good deal of green in it. I repeat, I abominate physique. But then, if folks will go campaigning about with such men as the great Prince de Conde and Marshal Turenne, they may fairly expect to be now and then checked by a bullet or saber cut. Then their best solace is found, I admit, in green potions and boluses. So, of course, I don't blame saint foy wounded and lame, if he swallowed a decent quantité suffisante of the same. Though I'm told in such cases, it's not the French plan to pour in their drastics as fast as they can, the practice of many an English savant, but to let off a man with a little tisane and gently to chafe the patella, knee pan. O woman, Sir Walter observes, when the brow's wrung with pain, what a ministering angel art thou? Thou'rt a ministering angel in no less degree, I can boldly assert, when the pain's in the knee, and medical friction is past contradiction, much better performed by a she than a he, a fact which indeed comes within my own knowledge, for I well recollect when a youngster at college, and therefore can quote a surgeon of note, Mr. Grovesner of Oxford, who not only wrote on the subject a very fine treatise, but still, as his patients came in, certain soft-handed phyllises were at once set to work on their legs, arms, and backs, and rubbed out their complaints in a couple of cracks. Now they say to this day, when sick people can't pay, on the continent many of this kind of nurses attend without any demand on their purses, and these females, some old, others still in their teens, some call sisters of charity, others beguines. They don't take the vows, but half nun and half lay attend you, and when you've got better, they say, you're exceedingly welcome, there's nothing to pay, our task is now done, you are able to run, we never take money, we cure you for fun. Then they drop you a curtsy and wish you good day and go off to cure somebody else the same way. A great many of these, at the date of my tale, in Namur walked the hospitals, workhouse, and jail. Among them was one, a most sweet demi-nun, her cheek pensive and pale, tresses bright as the sun. Not carroty, no, though you'd fancy you saw burn such locks as the Greeks loved, which moderns call auburn. These were partially seen through the veil which they wore all. Her teeth were of pearl and her lips were of coral. Her eyelashes silken, her eyes fine large blue ones, were sapphires. I don't call these similes new ones, but in metaphors freely confess I've a leaning to such new or old as convey best one's meaning. Then for figure, in faith it was downright barbarity to muffle a form might an anchorite warm in the fusty stuff gown of a sœur de la Charité. And no poet could fancy, no painter could draw, one more perfect in all points, more free from a flaw, than hers who now sits by the couch of saint foy chafing there with such care, and so dove-like an air, his leg, till her delicate fingers are charred with the steer's opal deldic, joint oil and goulard. Their Dutch appellations are really too hard to be brought into verse by a transmarine bard. Now you'll see and agree, I am certain with me, when a young man's laid up with a wound in his knee, and a lady sits there on a rush-bottomed chair to hand him the mixtures his doctors prepare, and a bit of lump sugar to make matters square, above all when the lady's remarkably fair, and the wounded young man is a gay mousquetaire. It's a ticklish affair, you may swear, for the pair, and may lead on to mischief before they're aware. I really don't think, spite of what friends would call his penchant for liaison and graver men folies, for my own part, I think, planting thorns on their pillows and leaving poor maidens to weep and wear willows is not to be classed among mere peccadilloes. His faults, I should say, I don't think François Xavier 
entertained any thoughts of improper behavior towards his nurse or that once to induce her to sin he meant while superintending his drafts and his liniment but as he grew stout and was getting about thoughts came into his head that had better been out while cupid's an urchin we know deserves birchin he's so prone to delude folks and leave them the lurchin twas doubtless his doing that absolute ruin was the end of all poor dear therese's shampooing tis a subject i don't like to dwell on but such things will happen i e'en monks the phlegmatic dutch when woman as goldsmith declares stoops to folly and finds out too late that false man can betray she is apt to look dismal and grow melancholy and in short to be anything rather than gay he goes on to remark that to punish her lover wring his bosom and draw the tear into his eye there is but one method which he can discover that's likely to answer that one is to die he's wrong the wan and withering cheek the thin lips pale and drawn apart the dim yet tearless eyes that speak the misery of the breaking heart the wasted form the enfeebled tone that whispering mocks the pitying ear the imploring glances heavenward thrown as heedless helpless hopeless here these wring the false one's heart enough if made of penetrable stuff and poor therese thus pines and decays till stung with remorse saint foy takes a pochaise with four wheelers to bays and four leaders to greys and soon reaches france by the help of relays flying shabbily off from the sight of his victim and driving as fast as if old nick had kicked him she poor sinner grows thinner and thinner leaves off eating breakfast and luncheon and dinner till you'd really suppose she could have nothing in her one evening twas just as the clock struck eleven they saw she'd been sinking fast ever since seven she breathed one deep sigh threw one look up to heaven and all was o'er poor therese was no more she was gone the last breath that she managed to draw escaped in one half-uttered word twas sa foi who can fly from himself bitter cares when you feel em are not cured by travel as horace says culum non anima mutant qui curunt transmare it's climate not mind that by roaming men vary remorse for temptation to which you have yielded is a shadow you can't sell as peter schlemiel did his it haunts you for ever in bed and at board i e'en in your dreams and you can't find it seems any proof that a guilty man ever yet snored it is much if he slumbers at all which but few francois xavier auguste was an instance can do indeed from the time he committed the crime which cut off poor sister therese in her prime he was not the same man that he had been his plan was quite changed in wild freaks he no more led the van he'd scarce sleep a wink in a week but sit thinking from company shrinking he quite gave up drinking at the mess-table too where now seldom he came fish fricassee fricando potage or game dindon aux truffes or turbot à la crème no he still shook his head it was always the same still he never complained that the cook was to blame twas his appetite failed him no matter how rare and russia shared the dish how delicious the fare what he used to like best he no longer could bear but he'd there sit and stare with an air of despair took no care but would wear boots that wanted repair such a shirt too you'd think he'd no linen to spare he omitted to shave he neglected his hair and looked more like a guy than a gay mousquetaire one thing above all most excited remark in the evening he seldom sat long after dark not that then as of yore he'd go out for a lark with his friends but when they after taking cafe would have broiled bones and kidneys brought in on a tray which i own i consider a very good way if a man's not dyspeptic to wind up the day no persuasion on earth could induce him to stay but he'd take up his candlestick just nod his head by way of good evening and walk off to bed yet even when there he seemed no better off for he'd wheeze and he'd sneeze and he'd hem and he'd cough and they'd hear him all night sometimes sobbing outright while his valet who often endeavoured to peep declared that his master was never asleep but would sigh and would groan 
slap his forehead and weep that about ten o'clock his door he would lock and then never would open it let who would knock he had heard him he said sometimes jump out of bed and talk as if speaking to one who was dead he'd groan and he'd moan in so piteous a tone begging some one or other to let him alone that it really would soften the heart of a stone to hear him exclaim so and call upon heaven then the bother began always just at eleven francois xavier auguste as i've told you before i believe was a popular man in his corps and his comrades not one of whom knew of the nun now began to consult what was best to be done count cordon bleu and the sieur de la rue confessed they did not know at all what to do but the chevalier hippolyte hector achille alfonso stanislas emile de granville made a fervent appeal to the zeal they must feel for their friend so distinguished an officer's wheel the first thing he said was to find out the matter that bored their poor friend so and caused all this clatter mort de ma vie here he took some rapie be the cause what it may he shall tell it to me he was right sure enough in a couple of days he worms out the whole story of sister therese now entombed poor dear soul in some dutch pere la chaise but the worst thing of all francois xavier declares is whenever i've taken my candle upstairs there's therese sitting there upon one of those chairs such a frown too she wears and so frightfully glares that i'm really prevented from saying my prayers while an odor the very reverse of perfume more like rhubarb or senna pervades the whole room hector achille stanislas emile when he heard him talk so felt an odd sort of feel not that he cared for ghosts he was far too genteel still a queerish sensation came on when he saw him whom for fun they'd by way of a pun on his person and principles nicknamed sans foi a man whom they had you see marked as a sadducee in his horns all at once so completely to draw and to talk of a ghost with such manifest awe it excited the chevalier granville's surprise he shrugged up his shoulders he turned up his eyes and he thought with himself that he could not do less than lay the whole matter before the whole mess repetitions detestable so as you're best able paint to yourself the effect at the mess table how the bold brigadiers pricked up their ears and received the account some with fears some with sneers how the sieur de la rue said to count cordon bleu ma foi c'est bien drôle monseigneur what say you how count cordon bleu declared he thought so too how the colonel affirmed that the case was quite new how the captains and majors began to lay wagers how far the ghost part of the story was true how at last when asked what was the best thing to do everybody was silent for nobody knew and how in the end they said no one could deal with the matter so well from his prudence and zeal as the gentleman who was the first to reveal the strange story viz hippolyte hector achille alphonse stanislas emile de granville i need scarcely relate the plans little and great which came into the chevalier hippolyte's pate to rescue his friend from his terrible foes those mischievous imps whom the world i suppose from extravagant notions respecting their hue has strangely agreed to denominate blue inasmuch as his schemes were of no more avail than those he had early in life found to fail when he strove to lay salt on some little bird's tail in vain did he try with strong waters to ply his friend on the ground that he never could spy such a thing as a ghost with a drop in his eye saint foy never would drink now unless he was dry besides what the vulgar call sucking the monkey has much less effect on a man when he's funky in vain did he strive to detain him at table till his dark hour was over he never was able save once when at mess with that sort of address which the british call humbug and frenchman finesse it's blarney in irish i don't know the scotch he fell to admiring his friend's english watch he examined the face and the back of the case and the young lady's portrait there done on enamel he saw by the likeness was one of the family cried superbe magnifique with his tongue in his cheek then he opened the case just to take a peep in it 
and seized the occasion to pop back the minute hand. With a demi-conché and a shrug and grin, he returns the bijou and c'est une affaire fini. I've done him, thinks he. Now I'll wager a guinea. It happened that day. They were all very gay. T'was the Grand Marnac's birthday, that is, t'was saint Louis which in Catholic countries, of course, they would view as his. So when Hippolyte saw him about to withdraw, he cried, Come, that won't do, my fine fellow saint foy Give us five minutes longer and drink vive le roi. François Xavier Auguste, without any mistrust of the trick that was played, drew his watch from his fob, just glanced at the hour, then agreed to hobnob, filled a bumper and rose, with Monsieur, I propose. He paused, his blanched lips failed to utter the toast. T'was eleven, he thought at half-past ten at most. Every limb, nerve, and muscle grew stiff as a post. His jaw dropped, his eyes swelled to twice their own size, and he stood as a pointer would stand at a ghost, then shrieked as he fell on the floor like a stone. Ah, Sister Thérèse, now do let me alone. It's amazing by sheer perseverance what men do, as waters were stone by the sepe cadendo, if they stick to Lord Somebody's motto, agendo. Was it not Robert Bruce? I declare I forgot, but I think it was Robert. You'll find it in Scott, who, when cursing Dame Fortune, was taught by a spider. She's sure to come round if you will but abide her. Then another great Rob, called White-Headed Bob, whom I once saw receive such a thump on the knob from a fist which might almost an elephant brain that I really believed at the first he was slain, for he lay like a log on his back on the plain, till a gentleman present, accustomed to train, drew out a small lancet and opened a vein just below his left eye, which, relieving the pain, he stood up like a trump with an air of disdain, while his backer was fain, for he could not refrain, he was dressed in pea-green with a pin and gold chain, and I think I heard somebody call him Squire Hain to whisper ten words one should always retain. Take a suck at the lemon and at him again. A hint ne'er surpassed, though thus spoken at random, since Toyser's apostrophe, Neil Desperandum, Granville acted on it and ordered his tandem. He had heard saint say that no very great way from Namur was a snug little town called Grand Pré, near which, a few miles from the banks of the Maze, dwelt a pretty twin sister of poor dear Thérèse, of the same age, of course, the same father, same mother, and as like to Thérèse as one pea to another. She lived with her mamma, having lost her papa, late of contraband schnapps and the unlicensed distiller, and her name was Des Moulins, in English Miss Miller. Now, though Hippolyte Hector could hardly expect her to feel much regard for her sister's protector when she'd seen him so shamefully leave and neglect her, still he very well knew in this world there are few, but already must Christian forgiveness to shew for other folks' wrongs, if well paid so to do. And he'd seen to what acts Res Auguste compelled bows and bells, whose affairs have once got out at elbows, with the magic effect of a handful of crowns, upon people whose pockets boast nothing but browns. A few francs well applied, he no doubt would decide, Miss Agnès de Moulin to jump up and ride as far as headquarters next day by his side, for the distance was nothing to speak by comparison to the town where the mousquetaires now lay in garrison. Then he thought, by the aid of a veil and gown maid, like those worn by the lady his friend had betrayed, they might dress up Miss Agnès, so look to the shade, which he fancied he saw, of that poor injured maid, come each night with her pale face, his guilt to upbraid, that if once introduced to his room thus arrayed, and then unmasked as soon as she'd long enough stayed, t'would be no more difficult task to persuade him the whole was a scurvy trick, cleverly played, out of spite and revenge, by a mischievous jade. With respect to the scheme, though I do not call that a gem, still I've known soldiers adopt a worse stratagem, and that too among the decided approvers of General Sir David Dundas' maneuvers. There's a proverb, however, I've always thought clever, which my grandmother never was tired of repeating, the proof of the pudding is found in the eating. We shall see in the sequel how Hector Achille had mixed up the suet and plums for his meal, the night had set in, t'was a dark and a gloomy one. Off went saint to his chamber, a roomy one, 
five stories high, the first floor from the sky, and lofty enough to afford great facility for playing a game with the youthful nobility of Crackcore, a deal in, request when they're feeling, in dull country quarters, ennui on them stealing, a wet wafer supplied to a sixpence's side, then it's spun with a thumb up to stick on the ceiling. Intellectual amusement, which custom allows old troops, I've seen it here practiced at home by our household troops. He'd a table and bed and three chairs and all said, a bachelor's barrack where e'er you discern it, you're sure to find not overburdened with furniture. Francois Xavier Auguste locked and bolted his door with just the same caution he'd practiced before. Little he knew that the Count Cordon Bleu, with Hector Achille and the Sieur de la Rue, had been up there before him and drawn every screw. And now comes the moment. The watches and clocks all point to eleven. The bolts and the locks give way, and the party turn out their bag fox. With step, noiseless and light, though half in a fright, a cup in her left hand, a draught in her right. In her robe long and black, and her veil long and white, Mademoiselle Agnès de Moulin walks in as a sprite. She approaches the bed with the same silent tread, just as though she had been at least half a year dead. Then sitting herself on the rush-bottomed chair, throws a cold stony glance on the black mousquetaire. If you're one of the play-going public, kind reader, and not a Moravian or rigid seceder, you've seen Mr. Keene, I mean in that scene of Macbeth, by some thought the crack one of the piece, which has been so well painted by Mr. MacLeese, when he once, after having stood up to say grace, to sit down to his haggis and can't find a place. You remember his stare at the high-backed armchair, where the ghost sits that nobody else knows is there, and how, after saying, what man dares I dare, he proceeds to declare he should not so much care if it came in the shape of a tiger or bear, but he don't like it shaking its long gory hair, while the obstinate ghost, as determined to brave him, with a horrible grin, sits and cocks up his chin, just as though he was asking the tyrant to shave him. And Lennox and Ross seem quite at a loss, if they ought to go on with their sheep's head and sauce. And Lady Macbeth looks uncommonly cross, and says in a huff, It's all proper stuff. All this you'll have seen, reader, often enough. So perhaps twill assist you in forming some notion of what must have been Francois Xavier's emotion, if you fancy what troubled Macbeth to be doubled, and instead of one Banco to stare in his face, without speculation, suppose he'd a brace. I wish I'd pour Fuseli's pencil, who ne'er, I believe, was exceeded in painting the terrible, or that of Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was so adroit in depicting it, vide his piece, descriptive of Cardinal Beaufort's decease, where that prelate is lying, decidedly dying, with the king and his suite, standing just at his feet, and his hands, as Dame quickly says, fumbling the sheet, while close at his ear, with the air of a scorner, busy meddling, old Nick's grinning up in the corner. But painting's an art I confess I am raw in. The fact is, I never took lessons in drawing. Had I done so instead, of the lines you have read, I'd have given you a sketch, should have filled you with dread. Francois Xavier Auguste squatting up in his bed, his hands widely spread, his complexion like lead, every hair that he has standing up on his head, as when Agnès de Moulin first catching his view, now right and now left, rapid glances he threw, then shrieked with a wild and unearthly halloo, Mon Dieu, voilà deux! By the Pope there are two! He fell back, one long aspiration he drew, in flew de la rue, and Count Cordon Bleu, Pomade, Pomme de Terre, and the rest of the crew. He stirred not, he spoke not, he none of them knew, and Achille cried, Adzooks, I fear by his looks, our friend Francois Xavier has popped off the hooks. T'was too true, Malheureux. It was done. He had ended his earthly career. He had gone off at once with a flea in his ear. The black mousquetaire was as dead as small beer. Lombon. A moral, more in point, I scarce could hope than this from Mr. Alexander Pope. If ever chance should bring some cornet gay and pious maid, as possibly it may, from Knightsbridge barracks and the shades serene of Clapham Rise as far as Kensal Green, 
or some pale marble when they join their heads to kiss the falling tears each other sheds. Oh, may they pause and think in silent awe, he that he reads the words, si j'y sa foi, she that the tombstone which her eyes surveys bears this sad line, hic jacet sur Thérèse. Then shall they sigh and weep and murmuring say, oh, may we never play such tricks as they, and if at such a time some bard there be, some sober bard, addicted much to tea and sentimental song, like Ingoldsby, if such there be, who sings and sips so well, let him this sad, this tender story tell. Warned by the tale, the gentle pair shall boast, I've scaped the broken heart, and I the ghost. End of section one, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, March 22nd, 2023. Section 2 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Sir Rupert the Fearless. The next in order of these lays of many lands refers to a period far earlier in point of date and has for its scene the banks of what our Teutonic friends are wont to call their own imperial river. The incidents which it records afford sufficient proof, and these are days of demonstration, that a propensity to flirtation is not confined to age or country, and that its consequences were not less disastrous to the mail-clad ritter of the Dark Ages than to the silken courtier of the 17th century. The whole narrative bears about it the stamp of truth, and from the papers among which it was discovered, I am inclined to think it must have been picked up by Sir Peregrine in the course of one of his valetudinary visits to the German spa. Sir Rupert the Fearless, A Legend of Germany Sir Rupert the Fearless, a gallant young knight, was equally ready to tipple or fight, crack a crown or a bottle, cut sirloin or throttle, in brief, or as Hume says, to sum up the toddle, unstained by dishonor, unsullied by fear, all his neighbors pronounced him a prue chevalier. Despite these perfections, corporeal and mental, he had one slight defect, namely a rather lean rental, Besides, as his own, there are spots in the sun, so it must be confessed that Sir Rupert had one. Being rather unthinking, he'd scarce sleep a wink in a night, but addict himself sadly to drinking. And what moralists say is as naughty to play to rouge et noir, hazard, short whist, écarté, till these and a few less defensible fancies brought the knight to the end of his slender finances. When at length through his boozing and tenants refusing their rents, swearing times were so bad they were losing, his steward said, Oh, sir, it's some time ago, sir, since aught through my hands reached the baker or grocer, and the tradesmen in general are grown great complainers. Sir Rupert the Brave thus addressed his retainers. My friends, since the stock of my father's old hawk is out, with the Kirchwasser, Barzak, Moselle, and were fairly reduced to the pump and the well, I presume to suggest we shall all find it best for each to shake hands with his friends ere he goes, mount his horse if he has one, and follow his nose. As to me, I opine, left some money or wine, my best way is to throw myself into the Rhine, where pitying travelers may sigh as they cross over, though he lived a roué, yet he died a philosopher. The knight, having bowed out his friends thus politely, got into his skiff, the full moon shining brightly, by the light of whose beam he soon spied on the stream a dame whose complexion was fair as new cream, pretty pink silken hose covered ankles and toes, in other respects, she was scanty of clothes, for, so says tradition, both written and oral, 
Her one garment was looped up with bunches of coral. Full sweetly she sang to a sparkling guitar, with silver cords stretched over Derbyshire spar. And she smiled on the knight, who, amazed at the sight, soon found his astonishment merged in delight. But the stream by degrees now rose up to her knees, till at length it invaded her very chemise, while the heavenly strain as the wave seemed to swallow her, and slowly she sank, sounded fainter and hollower. Jumping up in his boat and discarding his coat, Here goes, cried Sir Rupert. By jingo, I'll follow her. Then into the water he plunged with a souse that was heard quite distinctly by those in the house. Down, down, forty fathom and more from the brink, Sir Rupert the Fearless continues to sink. And as downward he goes, still the cold water flows through his ears and his eyes and his mouth and his nose till the rum and the brandy he'd swallowed since lunch wanted nothing but lemon to fill him with punch. Some minutes elapsed since he entered the flood ere his heels touched the bottom and stuck in the mud. But oh, what a sight met the eyes of the knight when he stood in the depth of the stream bolt upright, a grand stalactite hall like the cave of Fingal, rose above and about him, great fishes and small, came thronging around him regardless of danger, and seemed all agog for a peep at the stranger. Their figures and forms to describe language fails. They'd such very odd heads and such very odd tails. Of their genus or species a sample to gain, you would ransack all hunger ford market in vain. Even the famed Mr. Myers would scarcely find buyers, though hundreds of passengers doubtless would stop to stare were such monsters exposed in his shop. But little wrecked Rupert, these queer-looking brutes, or the F's and the newts that crawled up his boots, for a sight beyond any of which I've made mention, in a moment completely absorbed his attention. A huge crystal bath, which, with water far clearer than George Robin's filters, or Thorpe's, which are dearer, have ever distilled, to the summit was filled. They stretched out before him, and every nerve thrilled, as scores of young women were diving and swimming, till the vision a perfect quandary put him in, all slightly accoutred in gauzes and lawns, they came floating about him like so many prawns. Sir Rupert, who, barring the few peccadilloes alluded to, ere he leapt into the billows, possessed irreproachable morals, began to feel rather queer as a modest young man. When forth stepped a dame, whom he recognized soon as the one he had seen by the light of the moon, and lisped while a soft smile attended each sentence. Sir Rupert, I'm happy to make your acquaintance. My name is Lorleen, and the ladies you've seen all do me the honor to call me their queen. I'm delighted to see you, sir, down in the Rhine here, and hope you can make it convenient to dine here. The knight blushed and bowed as he ogled the crowd of subaqueous beauties, then answered aloud, Ma'am, you do me much honor. I cannot express the delight I shall feel if you'll pardon my dress. May I venture to say when a gentleman jumps in the river at midnight for want of the dumps, he rarely puts on his knee-breeches and pumps. If I could but have guessed what I sensibly feel your politeness, I'd not have come and dishabille, but have put on my silk tights in lieu of my steel. Quoth the lady, Dear sir, no apologies, pray. You will take our potluck in the family way. We can give you a dish of some decentish fish, and our waters thought fairish, but here in the Rhine, I can't say we pique ourselves much on our wine. The knight made a bow more profound than before when a dory-faced page oped the dining-room door and said, bending his knee, Madame, on a servi. Rupert tendered his arm, led Lurleen to her place, and a fat little merman stood up and said grace. What boots it to tell of the viands or how she apologized much for their plain water sauce want of Harvey's and Cross's and Burgess's sauces, or how Rupert on his side protested by Jove he preferred his fish plain without soy or anchovy. Suffice it the meal boasted trout, perch, and eel, besides some remarkably fine salmon peel. The knight, sooth to say, thought much less of the fishes 
than of what they were served on, the massive gold dishes, while his eye, as it glanced now and then on the girls, was caught by their persons much less than their pearls, and a thought came across him and caused him to muse, if I could but get hold of some of that gold, I might manage to pay off my rascally Jews. When dinner was done, at a sign to the lasses, the table was cleared, and they put on fresh glasses. Then the lady addressed her redoubtable guest, much as Dido of old did the pious Aeneas. Dear sir, what induced you to come down and see us? Rupert gave her a glance most bewitchingly tender, lolled back in his chair, put his toes on the fender, and told her outright how that he, a young knight, had never been last at a feast or a fight, but that keeping good cheer every day in the year and drinking neat wines all the same as small beer had exhausted his rent and his money all spent, how he'd borrowed large sums at two hundred per cent, how they followed, and then the once civilest of men, Messrs. Howard and Gibbs, made him bitterly rue it he ever raised money by way of annuity, and his mortgages being about to foreclose, how he jumped in the river to finish his woes. Lurleen was affected and owned with a tear that a story so mournful had ne'er met her ear. Rupert, hearing her sigh, looked uncommonly sly, and said with some emphasis, Ah, miss, had I a few pounds of those metals you waste here on kettles, then lord once again of my spacious domain, a free count of the empire once more I might reign, with Lurleen at my side, my adorable bride, for the parson should come and the knot should be tied. No couple so happy on earth should be seen as Sir Rupert the Brave and his charming Lurleen. Not that money's my object. No, hang it, I scorn it. And as for my rank, but that you'd so adorn it, I'd abandon it all to remain your true thrall, and instead of the great be called Rupert the Small, to gain but your smiles, were I Sardanopolis, i descend from my throne and be boots at an alehouse. Lurleen hung her head, turned pale, and then red, growing faint at this sudden proposal to wed, as though his abruptness in popping the question so soon after dinner disturbed her digestion. Then averting her eye with a lover-like sigh, you are welcome, she murmured in tones most bewitching, to every utensil I have in my kitchen. Up started the knight, half mad with delight, Round her finely formed waist, he immediately placed one arm, which the lady most closely embraced. Of her lily-white fingers the other made capture, and he pressed his adored to his bosom with rapture. And, oh, he exclaimed, let them go catch my skiff, I'll be home in a twinkling and back in a jiffy, nor one moment procrastinate longer my journey than to put up the bands and kick out the attorney. One kiss to her lip and one squeeze to her hand, and Sir Rupert already was halfway to land, for a sour-visaged triton with features would frighten old Nick, caught him up in one hand, though no light one, sprang up through the waves, popped him into his funny, which some others already had half filled with money. In fact, was so heavily laden with ore and pearls, t'was a mercy he got it to shore. But Sir Rupert was strong, and while pulling along, still he heard, faintly sounding, the water nymph's song, Lay of the Naiads. Away, away to the mountain's brow, where the castle is darkly frowning, and the vassals all in goodly row weep for their lord a-drowning. Away, away to the steward's room, where law with its wig and robe is. Throw us out, John Doe and Richard Roe, and sweetly we'll tickle their tobies. The unearthly voices had ceased their yelling when Rupert reached his old baronial dwelling. What rejoicing was there! How the vassals did stare! The old housekeeper put a clean shirt down to air, for she saw by her lamp that her master's was damp, and she feared he'd catch cold and lumbago and cramp. But scorning what she did, the knight never heeded wet jacket or trousers nor thought of repining, since their pockets had got such a delicate lining. But, oh, what dismay filled the tribe of Cassay, when they found he'd the cash and intended to pay. Away went Cognovitz, bills, bonds, and his sheets. 
Rupert cleared off all scores and took proper receipts. Now no more he sends out for pots of brown stout or schnapps, but resolves to do henceforth without. Abjure from this hour all excess and ebriety, enroll himself one of a temperance society. All riot eschew, begin life anew, and new cushion and hassock the family pew. Nay, to strengthen him more in his new mode of life, he boldly determines to take him a wife. Now many would think that the knight, from a nice sense of honor, should put Lurleen's name in the license, and that for a man of his breeding and quality, to break faith and troth, confirmed by an oath, is not quite consistent with rigid morality. But whether the nymph was forgot, or he thought her, from her essence, scarce wife, but at best wife and water, and declined as unsuited, a bride so deluded, be this as it may, he, I'm sorry to say, for all things considered, I own t'was a rum thing, made proposals in form to Miss Unafon something, her name has escaped me, sole heiress and niece to a highly respectable justice of peace. Thrice happy's the wooing, that's not long a doing, so much time is saved in the billing and cooing, the ring is now bought, the white favors and gloves, and all the etc., which crown people's loves, a magnificent bride cake comes home from the baker, and lastly appears, from the German long acre, that shaft, which the sharpest in all Cupid's quiver is, a plum-colored coach, and rich pompadour liveries. T'was a comely sight to behold the knight, with his beautiful bride dressed all in white, and the bridesmaids fair with their long lace veils, as they all walked up to the altar rails, while nice little boys, the incense dispensers, marched in front with white surplices, bands, and gilt censers. With a gracious air and a smiling look, Mess John had opened his awful book and had read so far as to ask if to wed he meant, and if he knew any just cause or impediment, when from base to turret the castle shook. Then came a sound of a mighty rain, dashing against each storied pane. The wind blew loud, and a coal-black cloud o'ershadowed the church and the party and crowd. How it could happen they could not divine. The morning had been so remarkably fine. Still the darkness increased, till it reached such a pass that the sextoness hastened to turn on the gas. But harder it poured, and the thunder roared, as if heaven and earth were coming together. None ever had witnessed such terrible weather. Now louder it crashed, and the lightning flashed, exciting the fears of the sweet little dears in the veils as it danced on the brass chandeliers. The parson ran off, though a stout-hearted Saxon, when he found that a flash had set fire to his caxon. Though all the rest trembled as might be expected, Sir Rupert was perfectly cool and collected, and endeavored to cheer his bride in her ear, whispering tenderly, Pray don't be frightened, my dear. Should it even set fire to the castle and burn it, you're amply insured, both for buildings and furniture. But now, from without, a trustworthy scout rushed hurriedly in, wet through to the skin, informing his master the river was rising and flooding the grounds in a way quite surprising. He'd no time to say more, for already the roar of the waters was heard as they reached the church door, while high on the first wave that rolled in was seen, riding proudly the form of the angry Lurleen, and all might observe, by her glance fierce and stormy, she was stung by the spretai in Uria formi. What she said to the knight, what she said to the bride, what she said to the ladies who stood by her side, what she said to the nice little boys in white clothes, oh, nobody mentions, for nobody knows. For the roof tumbled in, and the walls tumbled out, and the folks tumbled down all confusion and rout. The rain kept on pouring, the flood kept on roaring, the billows and water nymphs rolled more and more in, ere the close of the day all was clean washed away. Only one survived who could hand down the news, a little old woman that opened the pews. She was borne off but stuck by the greatest good luck in an oak tree, and there she hung, crying and screaming, and saw all the rest swallowed up the wild stream in. In vain all the week did the fishermen seek for the bodies and poke in each cranny and creek. In vain was their search. 
After aught in the church, they caught nothing but weeds and perhaps a few perch. The Humane Society tried a variety of methods and brought down to drag for the wreck tackles, but they only fished up the clerk's tortoise shell spectacles. Moral. This tale has a moral. Ye youth, oh beware of liquor and how you run after the fair. Shun playing at shorts, avoid quarrels and jars, and don't take to smoking those nasty cigars. Let no run of bad luck or despair for some Jewish-eyed damsel induce you to contemplate suicide. Don't sit up much later than ten or eleven. Be up in the morning by half after seven. Keep from flirting, nor risk, worn by Rupert's miscarriage, an action for breach of a promise of marriage. Don't fancy old fishes. Don't prig silver dishes. And to sum up the whole, in the shortest phrase I know, beware of the Rhine and take care of the rhino. End of section two, read by Martha Weller, Champagne, March 31st, 2023. Section three of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham, The Merchant of Venice. And now for sunny Italy, the land of the unforgotten brave, the land of blue skies and black-eyed signoras. I cannot discover from any recorded memoranda that Uncle Perry was ever in Venice, even in carnival time. That he ever saw Garrick in Shylock, I do not believe, and am satisfied that he knew nothing of Shakespeare, a circumstance that would by no means disqualify him from publishing an edition of that poet's works. I can only conclude that, in the course of his continental wanderings, Sir Peregrine had either read or heard of the following history, especially as he furnishes us with some particulars of the eventual destination of his dramatis personae, which the Bard of Avon has omitted. If this solution be not accepted, I can only say with Mr. Puff that probably two men hit upon the same idea and Shakespeare made use of it first. The Merchant of Venice, A Legend of Italy Of The Merchant of Venice, there are two quarto editions in 1600, one by Hayes and the other by Roberts. The Duke of Devonshire and Lord Francis Egerton have copies of the edition by Hayes, and they vary importantly. It must be acknowledged that this is a very easy and happy emendation, which does not admit of a moment's doubt or dispute. Readers in general are not all aware of the nonsense they have in many cases been accustomed to receive as the genuine text of Shakespeare. Reasons for a New Edition of Shakespeare's Works by J. Payne Collier I believe there are few, but have heard of a Jew named Shylock of Venice, as errant a screw in money transactions as ever you knew, an exorbitant miser who never yet lent a ducat at less than three hundred per cent., insomuch that the various spendthrift in Venice, who take no more care of his pounds than his pennies, when pressed for a loan at the very first sight of his terms, would back out and take refuge in flight. It is not my purpose to pause and inquire, if he might not, in managing thus to retire, jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Suffice it that folks would have nothing to do who could possibly help it with Shylock the Jew." But however discreetly one cuts and contrives, we've been most of us taught in the course of our lives that needs must when the elderly gentleman drives. In proof of this rule, a thoughtless young fool, Bassanio, a lord of the Tom Noddy school, who by showing at operas, balls, plays, and court, a swelling, Payne Collier would read swelling, port, and inviting his friends to dine, breakfast, and sup, had shrunk his weak means and was stumped and hard up, took occasion to send to his very good friend Antonio, a merchant whose wealth had no end, and who'd often before had the kindness to lend him large sums on his note which he'd managed to spend. Antonio, said he, now listen to me. I've just hit on a scheme which I think you'll agree, all matters considered, is no bad design, and which, if it succeeds, will suit your book and mine. 
In the first place, you know all the money I've got, time and often from you, has been long gone to pot. And in making those loans, you have made a bad shot. Now do as the boys do when shooting at sparrows and tomtits they chance to lose one of their arrows. Shoot another the same way, I'll watch well its track, and turtle to tripe, I'll bring both of them back. So list to my plan and do what you can to attend to and second it. That's a good man. There's a lady, young, handsome, beyond all compare, at a place they call Belmont, whom, when I was there at the suppers and parties my friend Lord Montferrat was giving last season, we all used to stare at. Then as to her wealth, her solicitor told mine, besides vast estates, a pearl fishery and gold mine, her iron strong box seems bursting its locks. It's stuffed so with shares in grand junctions and docks, not to speak of the money she's got in the stocks, French, Dutch, and Brazilian, Colombian, and Chilean, in English a shecker bills full half a million, not kites manufactured to cheat and inveigle, but the right sort of flimsy all signed by Monteagle. Then I know not how much in canal shares and railways, and more speculations I need not detail ways of vesting which, if not so safe as some think em, contribute a deal to improving one's income. In short, she's a mint. Now I say deuce is int, if with all my experience I can't take a hint, and her eyes speechless messages plainer than print, at the time that I told you of, no from a squint. In short, my dear Tony, my crusty old crony, do stump up three thousand once more as a loan. I am sure of my game, though of course there are brutes of all sorts and sizes preferring their suits to her you may call the Italian Miss Coots. Yet Portia, she's named from that daughter of Cato's, is not to be snapped up like little potatoes, and I have not a doubt I shall rout every lout ere you whisper Jack Robinson, cut them all out, surmount every barrier, carry her, marry her. Then hey, my old Tony, when once fairly noosed, for her three and a half percents, new and reduced. With a wink of his eye, his friend made reply, in his jocular manner, sly, caustic, and dry. Still the same boy, Bassanio, never say die. Well, I hardly know how I shall do it, but I'll try. Don't suppose my affairs are at all in a hash, but the fact is, at present, I'm quite out of cash. The bulk of my property, merged in rich cargoes, is tossing about, as you know, in my argosies. Tending, of course, my resources to cripple, I've one bound to England, another to Tripoli, Cyprus, Mazulipatam, and Bombay. A sixth, by the way, I consigned t'other day to Sir Richard MacGregor, cacique of Poyer, a country where silver's as common as clay. Meanwhile, till they tack and come some of them back, what with custom house duties and bills falling due, my account with Jones, Lloyd, and Co. looks rather blue, while, as for the ready, I'm like a church mouse. I really don't think there's five pounds in the house. But no matter for that, let me just get my hat and my new silk umbrella that stands on the mat, and we'll go forth at once to the market, we two, and try what my credit in Venice can do. I stand well on change, and when all's said and done, I don't doubt I shall get it for love or for money. They were going to go, when lo, down below, in the street they heard somebody crying, Oh, Clo, by the Pope, there's the man for our purpose, I knew. We should not have to search long. Solano, run you. Salarino, quick, haste, ere he get out of view, and call in that scoundrel, old Shylock the Jew. With a pack, like a sack, of old clothes at his back, and three hats on his head, Shylock came in a crack, saying, Rest you fair, Signor Antonio, vat pray, might your worship be pleased for to vant in my way. Why, Shylock, although, as you very well know, I am what they call warm, pay my way as I go, and as to myself, neither borrow nor lend, I can break through a rule to oblige an old friend. And that's the case now, Lord Bassanio would raise some three thousand ducats, well knowing your ways, and that naught's to be got from you say what one will, unless you've a couple of names to the bill. Why, for once, I'll put mine to it, yea, seal and sign to it. Now then, old sinner, let's hear what you'll say, as to doing a bill at three months from today. 
three thousand gold ducats, mind, all in good bags of hard money, no sealing wax slippers or rags. Well, my dear, says the Jew, I'll see what I can do. But Mr. Antonio, hark you, tish funny. You say to me, Shylock, my dear, we'd have money. Then you very well knows how you spit on my clothes, and use naughty words, call me dog, and a vouch that I put too much interest by half in my pouch. And while I, like the rest of my tribe, shrug and crouch, you find fault mid my pargans and say I'm a schmouch. Well, no matters, my dear, fun word in your ear. I'd be friends mid you both, and to make that appear, why, I'll find you the monies as soon as you will. Only fun little joke must be put in the bill. My dear, you must say, if on such and such day, such sum or such sums you shall fail to repay, I shall cut where I like, as the pargain is broke, a fair bound of your flesh, just by way of a joke. So novel a clause caused Bassanio to pause, but Antonio, like most of those sage Johnny Raws, who care not three straws about lawyers or laws, and think cheaply of old father Antic because they have never experienced a gripe from his claws, pooh-poohed the whole thing, let the smouch have his way. Why, what care I pray for his penalty? Nay, it's a forfeit he'd never expect me to pay. And come what come may, I hardly need say, my ships will be back a full month ere the day. So anxious to see his friend off on his journey, and thinking the whole but a paltry concern, he affixed with all speed his name to a deed, duly stamped and drawn up by a sharp Jew attorney. Thus again furnished forth, Lord Bassanio, instead of squandering the cash, after giving one spread, with fiddling and masks at the Saracen's head, in the morning made play, and without more delay, started off in the steamboat for Belmont next day. But scarcely had he from the harbor got free, and left the lagoons for the broad open sea, ere the change and Rialto both rung with the news that he'd carried off more than mere cash from the Jews. Though Shylock was old, and if rolling in gold was as ugly a dog as you'd wish to behold, for few in his tribe, amongst their Levi's and Moseses, sported so Jewish an eye, beard, and nose as his. Still, whate'er the opinions of Horace and some be, your Aquilae generate sometimes Colombi. Like Jephthah, as Hamlet says, he'd one fair daughter, and every gallant who caught sight of her thought her a jewel, a gem of the very first water. A great many sought her, till one at last caught her, and upsetting all that the rabbis had taught her, to feelings so truly reciprocal brought her, that the very same night Bassanio thought right to give all his old friends that farewell invite. And while Shylock was gone there to feed out of spite, on wings made by a tailor, the damsel took flight. By these wings I'd express a gray duffel dress, with brass badge and muffin cap made as by rule for an upper-class boy in the national school. Jessie ransacked the house, popped her breeks on, and when so disguised, bolted off with her beau Juan Lorenzo, an unthrift who lost not a moment in whisking her into the boat, and was fairly afloat ere her paw had got rid of the smell of the griskin. Next day, while old Shylock was making a racket, and threatening how well he'd dust every man's jacket, who'd helped her in getting aboard of the packet. Bassanio at Belmont was capering and prancing, and bowing and scraping and singing and dancing, making eyes at Miss Portia, and doing his best to perform the polite and to cut out the rest. And if left to herself, he no doubt had succeeded, for none of them waltzed so genteelly as he did. But an obstacle lay of some weight in his way. The defunct Mr. P., who was now turned to clay, had been an odd man, and though all for the best he meant, left but a queer sort of last will and testament, bequeathing her hand with her houses and land, etc., from motives one don't understand, as she reverenced his memory and valued his blessing to him who should turn out the best hand at guessing. Like a good girl, she did just what she was bid. In one of three caskets, her picture she hid and clapped a conundrum atop of each lid. A couple of princes, a black and a white one, tried first, but they both failed in choosing the right one. Another from Naples, who shooed his own horses. A French lord whose graces might vie with Count Dorses. 
a young English baron, a Scotch peer, his neighbor, a dull drunken Saxon, all mustache and saber, as followed, and all had their pains for their labor. Bassanio came last, happy man be his dole, put his conjuring cap on, considered the whole, the gold put aside as mere hard food for Midas, the silver bade trudge as a pale common drudge, then choosing the little lead box in the middle, came plump on the picture and found out the riddle. Now you're not such a goose as to think, I dare say, gentle reader, that all this was done in a day, any more than the dome of St. Peter's at Rome was built in the same space of time, and in fact, whilst Bassanio was doing his billing and cooing, three months had gone by ere he reached the fifth act. Meanwhile, that unfortunate bill became due, which his lordship had almost forgot to the Jew. And Antonio grew in a deuce of a stew, for he could not cash up, spite of all he could do. The bitter old Israelite would not renew. What with contrary winds, storms, and wrecks, and embargoes, his funds were all stopped or gone down in his Argozies. None of the set having come into port, and Shylock's attorney was moving the court for the forfeit supposed to be set down in sport. The serious news of this step of the Jews, and his fixed resolution all terms to refuse, gave the newly made bridegroom a fit of the blues, especially, too, as it came from the pen of his poor friend himself on the wedding day then, when the parson had scarce shut his book up and when the clerk was yet uttering the final amen. Dear friend, it continued, all's up with me, I have nothing on earth now to do but to die, and as death clears all scores, you're no longer my debtor. I should take it as kind, could you come, never mind, if your love don't persuade you, why, don't let this letter. I hardly need say this was scarcely read or, ere a post-chase in four was brought round to the door. And Bassanio, though doubtless he thought it a bore, gave his lady one kiss and then started at score. But scarce in his flight had he got out of sight, ere Portia, addressing a groom, said, My lad, you a journey must take on the instant to Padua. Find out there Bellario, a doctor of laws, who like Follett is never left out of a cause, and give him this note, which I've hastily wrote, Take the papers he'll give you, then push for the ferry. Below where I'll meet you, you'll do it in a wherry. If you can't find a boat on the Brenta with sails to it, stay, bring his gown too, and wig with three tails to it. Giovanni, that's Jack, brought out his hack, made a bow to his mistress, then jumped on its back, put his hand to his hat, and was off in a crack. The signora soon followed herself, taking as her own escort Nerissa, her maid, and Balthazar. The court is prepared, the lawyers are met, the judges all ranged, a terrible show. As Captain McKeith says, and when one's in debt, the sight's as unpleasant a one as I know, yet still not so bad after all, I suppose, as if, when one cannot discharge what one owes, they should bid people cut off one's toes or one's nose. Yet here a worse fate stands Antonio of late, a merchant, might vie e'en with princes in state, with his waistcoat unbuttoned, prepared for the knife, which in taking a pound of flesh must take his life. On the other side Shylock, his bag on the floor, and three shocking bad hats on his head as before, imperturbable stands, as he waits their commands, with his scales and his great snicker snee in his hands, between them, equipped in a wig, gown, and bands, with a very smooth face, a young dandified lawyer, whose air, nevertheless, speaks him quite a top sawyer, though his hopes are but feeble, does his possible, to make the hard Hebrew to mercy incline, and in lieu of his three thousand ducats take nine, which Bassanio, for reasons we well may divine, shows in so many bags all drawn up in a line, but vain are all efforts to soften him. Still he points to the bond he so often has conned, and says in plain terms, he'll be shot if he will. So the dandified lawyer, with talking grown horse, says, I can say no more. Let the law take its course. Just fancy the gleam of the eye of the Jew, as he sharpened his knife on the sole of his shoe. 
from the toe to the heel and grasping the steel with a business-like air was beginning to feel whereabouts he should cut as a butcher would veal when the dandified judge puts a spoke in his wheel stay shylock says he here's one thing you see this bond of yours gives you here no jot of blood the words are a pound of flesh that's clear as mud slice away then old fellow but mind if you spill one drop of his claret that's not in your bill i'll hang you like haman by jingo i will when apprised of this flaw you never yet saw such an awfully marked elongation of jaw as in shylock who cried flesh of my heart is that law off went his three hats and he looked as the cats do whenever a mouse has escaped from their claw is the law where well, the thing won't admit of a query no doubt of the fact only look at the act acto quinto cap tercio dogi falieri nay if rather than cut you'd relinquish the debt the lawmaster shy has a hold on you yet see foscari's statutes at large if a stranger a citizen's life shall with malice and danger the whole of his property little or great shall go on conviction one half to the state and one to the person pursued by his hate and not to create any further debate the doge if he pleases may cut off his pate so down on your marrow bones jew and ask mercy defendant and plaintiff are now wizzy worsy what need to declare how pleased they all were at so joyful an end to so sad an affair or bassanio's delight at the turn things had taken his friend having saved to the letter his bacon how shylock got shaved and turned christian though late to save a life interest in half his estate how the dandified lawyer who managed the thing would not take any fee for his pains but a ring which mrs bassanio had given to her spouse with injunctions to keep it on leaving the house how when he and the spark who appeared as his clerk had thrown off their wigs and their gowns and their jetty coats there stood nerissa and portia in petticoats how they pouted and flouted and acted the cruel because lord bassanio had not kept his jewel how they scolded and broke out till having their joke out they kissed and were friends and all blessing and blessed drove home by the light of a moonshiny night like the one in which troilus the brave trojan knight sat astride on a wall and sighed after his cressid all this if twere meet i'd go on to repeat but a story spun out so's by no means a treat so i'll merely relate what in spite of the pains i have taken to rummage among his remains no edition of shakespeare i've met with contains but if the account which i've heard be the true one we shall have it no doubt before long in a new one in an m s then sold for its full weight in gold and knocked down to my friend lord tomnoddy i'm told it's recorded that jessie coquettish and vain gave her husband lorenzo a good deal of pain being mildly rebuked she levanted again ran away with a scotchman and crossing the main became known by the name of the flower of dumblain that antonio whose piety caused as we've seen him to spit upon every old jew's gabardine and whose goodness to paint all colors were faint acquired the well-merited prefix of saint and the doge his admirer of honor the fount having given him a patent and made him a count he went over to england got naturalized there and espoused a rich heiress in hanover square that shylock came with him no longer a jew but converted i think may be possibly true but that walpole as the self-same papers aver by changing the y in his name into air should follow him a fictitious surname to dishop and in seventeen twenty eight made him a bishop i cannot believe but shall still think them two men till some sage proves the fact with his usual acumen moral from this tale of the bard it's uncommonly hard if an editor can't draw a moral tis clear then in every young wife seeking bachelor's ear a maxim above all other stories this one drums pitch greek to old harry and stick to conundrums to new married ladies this lesson it teaches your know that far wrong in assuming the breeches moneyed men upon change and rich merchants in schools to look well to assets nor play with edge tools last of all this remarkable history shows men what caution they need when they deal with old clothes men so bid john and mary to mind and be wary and never let one of them come down the airy 
End of section three, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, April 2nd, 2023. Section 4 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. The Auto de Fe. From St. Mark to St. Lawrence, from the Rialto to the Escurial, from one peninsula to another, it is but a hop, step, and jump, your toe at Genoa, your heel at Marseille, and a good hearty spring pops you down at once in the very heart of old Castile. That Sir Peregrine Ingoldsby, then a young man, was at Madrid soon after the Peace of Ryswick, there is extant a long correspondence of his to prove. Various passages in it countenance the supposition that his tour was partly undertaken for political purposes, and this opinion is much strengthened by certain allusions in several of his letters addressed, in after life, to his friend Sir Horace Mann, then acting in the capacity of envoy to the court of Tuscany. Although the knight spent several months in Spain and visited many of her principal cities, there is no proof of his having actually seen Seville, beyond the internal evidence incidentally supplied by the following legend. The events to which it alludes were, of course, of a much earlier date, though the genealogical records of the kings of both the Indies have been in vain consulted for the purpose of fixing their precise date, and even Mr. Simpkinson's research has failed to determine which of the royal stock rejoicing in the name of Ferdinand is the hero of the legend. The conglomeration of Christian names usual in the families of the haute noblesse of Spain adds to the difficulty. Not that this inconvenient accumulation of prefixes is peculiar to the country in question. Witness my excellent friend, Field Marshal Count Hermann Karl Heinrich Socrates von der Nordgiri zu Pfefferkorn, whose appellations puzzled the recording clerk of one of our courts lately, and that not a little that a splendid specimen of the genus Homo species monk flourished in the earlier Moiti of the 15th century under the appellation of Torquemada is notorious, and this fact might seem to establish the era of the story, but then his name was John, not Dominic, though he was a Dominican, and hence the mistake, if any, may perhaps have originated, but then again the Spanish queen to whom he was confessor, was called Isabella, and not Blanche. It is a puzzling affair altogether. From his own silence on the subject, it may well be doubted whether the worthy transcriber knew himself the date of the transactions he has recorded. The authenticity of the details, however, cannot be well called in question. Be this as it may, I shall make no further question, but at once introduce my pensive public to... The Auto de Fe, A Legend of Spain With a moody air from morn till noon, King Ferdinand paces the royal saloon. From morn till eve he does nothing but grieve, Sighings and sobbings his midriff heave, And he wipes his eyes with his ermine sleeve, And he presses his feverish hand to his brow, And he frowns and he looks, I can't tell you how, And the Spanish grandees, in their degrees, are whispering about in twos and in threes, and there is not a man of them seems at his ease, but they gaze on the monarch as watching what he does with their very long whiskers and longer Toledos, Don Gaspar, Don Guzman, Don Juan, Don Diego, Don Gomez, Don Pedro, Don Blas, Don Rodrigo, Don Jerome, Don Giacomo, join Don Alfonso, in making inquiries of grave Don Ramirez, the Chamberlain, what it is makes him take on so, a monarch so great that the soundest opinions maintain the sun can't set throughout his dominions. But grave Don Ramirez, in guessing no nigher is than the other grave Dons who propound these inquiries, when pausing at length, as beginning to tire, his majesty beckons with stately civility, 
to Senor Don Luis Conde de Ranues, who in birth, wealth, and consequence second to few is, and Senor Don Manuel Count de Pacheco, a lineal descendant from King Pharaoh Neco, both knights of the Golden Fries, high-born Hidalgos, with whom e'en the king himself quite as a pal goes. Don Luis, says he, just listen to me, and you, Count Pacheco, I think that we three, on matters of state, for the most part agree. Now you both of you know that some six years ago, being then, for a king, no indifferent bow, at the altar I stood, like my forebears of old, the peninsula's paragon, fair Blanche of Aragon, for better, for worse, and to have and to hold, and you're fully aware, when the matter took air, how they shouted and fired the great guns in the square, cried viva, and rung all the bells in the steeple, and all that sort of thing the mob do when a king brings a queen concert home for the good of his people. Well, six years and a day have flitted away since that blessed event, yet I'm sorry to say, in fact, it's the principal cause of my pain, I don't see any signs of an infant of Spain. Now I want to ask you, cavaliers true, and counselors sage, what the deuce shall I do? The state, don't you see, hey, an heir to the throne, every monarch, you know, should have one of his own. Disputed succession, a terrible go. Hmm, hey, old fellows, you see, don't you know? Now, reader, dear, if you've ever been near enough to a court to encounter a peer, when his principal tenant's gone off in arrear, and his brewer has sent in a long bill for beer, and his butcher and baker with faces austere, ask him to clear off for furnished good cheer, bills, they say, have been standing for more than a year, and the tailor and shoemaker also appear with their little account of trifling amount for wellingtons, waistcoats, pea jackets, and gear, which to name in society's thought rather queer, while Drummond's chief clerk, with his pen in his ear, and a kind of a sneer says, we've no effects here. Or if ever you've seen an alderman keen after turtle peep into a silver tureen in search for the fat called par excellence green, when there's none of the meat left, not even the lean, or if ever you've witnessed the face of a sailor returned from a voyage and escaped from a gale, or poetice boreas, that blustering railer, to find that his wife, when he hastens to hail her, has just run away with his cash and a tailor. If one of these cases you've ever surveyed, you'll, without my aid, to yourself have portrayed the beautiful mystification displayed and the puzzled expression of manner and air exhibited now by the dignified pair when thus unexpectedly asked to declare their opinions as counselors, several and joint, on so delicate, grave, and important a point. Senor Don Luis Conde d'Aranuez at length forced a smile twixt the prim and the grim, and looked at Pacheco, Pacheco at him. Then, making a reverence and dropping his eyes, coughed, hemmed, and delivered himself in this wise. My liege, unaccustomed as I am to speaking in public, an art I'm remarkably weak in, I feel I should be quite unworthy the name of a man and a Spaniard, and highly to blame, were there not in my breast what can't be expressed, and can therefore your majesty only be guessed, what I mean to say is, since your majesty deigns to ask my advice on your welfare and Spain's, and on that of your majesty's bride, that is wife, it's the, as I may say, proudest day of my life. But as to the point, on a subject so nice, it's a delicate matter to give one's advice, especially, too, when one don't clearly view the best mode of proceeding or know what to do. My decided opinion, however, is this, and I fearlessly say that you can't do amiss if with all that fine tact, both to think and to act, in which all know your majesty so much excels, you are graciously pleased to ask somebody else. Here the noble grandee made that sort of congi which, as Hill used to say, I once happened to see, the great Indian conjurer Ramo Sami make, while swallowing what all thought a regular choker, namely a small sword as long and as stiff as a poker. Then the Count of Pacheco, 
whose turn t'was to speak, omitting all preface, exclaimed with devotion, Sire, I beg leave to second Don Lewis's motion. Now a monarch of Spain, of course, could not deign to expostulate, argue, or much less complain, of an answer thus given, or to ask them again. So he merely observed, with an air of disdain, Well, gentlemen, since you both shrink from the task of advising your sovereign, pray, whom shall I ask? Each felt the rub, and in Spain not a sub, much less than Hidalgo can stomach a snub, so the noses of these Castilian grandees rise at once in an angle of several degrees, till the underlips almost becoming the upper, each perceptibly grows, too, more stiff in the crupper. Their right hands rest, on the left side the breast, while the hilts of their swords by their left hands depressed make the ends of their scabbards to cock up behind, till they're quite horizontal instead of inclined, and Don Lewis, with scarce an attempt to disguise the disgust he experiences, gravely replies, Sire, ask the Archbishop, his grace of Toledo. He understands these things much better than we do. Poca verba, enough, each turns off in a huff, this twirling his mustache, that fingering his ruff, like a blue-bottle fly on a rather large scale, with a rather large corking pin stuck through his tail. King Ferdinand paces the royal saloon, with a moody brow, and he looks like a spoon, and all the court nobles who form the ring have a spoony appearance, of course, like the king. All of them eyeing King Ferdinand as he goes up and down with his watch in his hand, which he claps to his ear as he walks to and fro, what is it can make the archbishop so slow? Hark! At last there's a sound in the courtyard below, where the beef-eaters all are drawn up in a row. I would say the guards, for in Spain they're in chief eaters of omelets and garlic and can't be called beef-eaters. In fact, of the few individuals I knew who ever had happened to travel in Spain, there has scarce been a person who did not complain of their cookery and dishes as all bad in grain, and no one, I'm sure, will deny it who's tried a vile compound they have that's called olla podrida. This, by the by, is a mere rhyme to the I, for in Spanish the I is pronounced like an E, and they've not quite our mode of pronouncing the D. In Castilla, for instance, it's given through the teeth, and what we call Madrid, they sound more like Madrid. Of course, you will see in a moment they've no men, that it all corresponds with our beef-eating yeomen. So call them Walloons, or whatever you please, by their rattles and slaps, they're not standing at ease. But beyond all disputing, engaged in saluting some very great person among the grandees, here a gentleman usher walks in and declares, His grace, the archbishop's a coming upstairs. The most reverend Don Garcilaso Quevedo was just at this time, as he now held the primacy, always attached to the see of Toledo, a man of great worship, Officiae virtuti, versed in all that pertains to a counselor's duty, well skilled to combine civil law with divine, as a statesman inferior to none in that line, as an orator, too, he was equaled by few, uniting, in short, in tongue, headpiece, and pen, the very great powers of three very great men, Talleyrand, who will never drive down Piccadilly more, to the Travelers' Clubhouse, Charles Phillips and Fillimore. Not only at home, but even at Rome, there was not a prelate among them could cope with the primate of Spain in the eyes of the Pope. The conclave was full, and they'd not a spare hat, or he'd long since been Cardinal Legate a la Terry, a dignity fairly his due without flattery. So much he excited among all beholders their marvel to see, at his age thirty-three, such a very old head on such very young shoulders. No wonder the king, then, in this his distress, should send for so sage an adviser express, who you'll readily guess could not do less than start off at once without stopping to dress in his haste to get majesty out of a mess. His grace, the archbishop, comes up the back way, 
set apart for such nobles as had the entree, namely, grandees of the first class, both cleric and lay, walks up to the monarch and makes him a bow, as a dignified clergyman always knows how, then replaces the mitre at once on his brow, for in Spain recollect, as a mark of respect to the crown, if a grandee uncovers, it's quite as a matter of option and not one of right, a thing not conceded by our royal masters, who always make noblemen take off their casters, except the heir's male of John Lord Kinsale, a stalwart old baron, who, acting as henchman to one of our early kings, killed a big Frenchman, a feat which His Majesty, deigning to smile on, allowed him thenceforth to stand with his tile on, and all his successors have kept the same privilege, down from those barbarous times to our civil age. Returning his bow with a slight demi-bob, and replacing the watch in his hand in his fob, "'My lord,' said the king, "'here's a rather tough job, which it seems of a sort is to puzzle our Cortes.' And since it is quite flabbergasted that diet, I look to your grace with no little anxiety. Concerning a point which has quite out of joint, put us all with respect to the good of society. Your grace is aware that we've not got an heir. Now it seems, one and all, they don't stick to declare that of all our advisers there is not in Spain one can tell, like your grace, the best way to obtain one. So put your considering cap on, we're curious, to learn your receipt for a prince of Asturias. One without the nice tact of his grace would have backed out at once, as the nobleman did, and in fact he was at the first rather posed how to act. One moment, no more, bowing then as before, he said, Sire, t'were superfluous for me to acquaint the most Catholic king in the world that a saint is the usual resource in these cases, of course. Of their influence, your majesty well knows the force. If I may be, therefore, allowed to suggest the plan which occurs to my mind as the best, your majesty may go at once to St. Iago, whom, as Spain's patron saint, I pick out from the rest. If your majesty looks into Guthrie or Brooks, in all the approved geographical books, you will find Compostela laid down in the maps some 270 miles off, and perhaps in a case so important you may not decline a pedestrian excursion to visit his shrine. And, sire, should you choose to put peas in your shoes, the saint, as a gentleman, can't well refuse so distinguished a pilgrim, especially when he considers the boon will not cost him one penny. His speech ended, his grace bowed, and put on his mitre, as tight as before, and perhaps a thought tighter. Pooh, pooh, says the king, I shall do no such thing. It's nonsense, old fellow, you see, no use talking. The peas set apart, I abominate walking. Such a deuced way off, too. Hey, walk there, what, me? Pooh, it's no go, old fellow, you know, don't you see? Well, sire, with much sweetness, the prelate replied, if your majesty don't like to walk, you can ride. And then, if you please, in lieu of the peas, a small portion of horsehair cut fine will insert as a substitute under your majesty's shirt. Then a rope round your collar instead of a laced band, a few nettles tucked into your majesty's waistband. As fatita mixed with your bouquet and civet, I'll warrant you'll find yourself right as a trivet. Pooh, pooh, I tell you, quoth the king, it won't do. A cold perspiration began to bedew his majesty's cheek, and he grew in a stew. When José de Jumez, the king's privy purse-keeper, many folks thought it could scarce have a worse keeper, came to the rescue and said with a smile, "'Sire, your majesty can't go. "'Twould take a long while, "'and you won't post it under two shillings a mile. "'Twenty-seven pounds ten to get there, "'and then twenty-seven pounds ten more to get back again.' Sire, the tottle's enormous. You ought to be king of Golconda, as well as the Indies, to fling such a vast sum away upon any such thing. At the second rebuff, the archbishop looked gruff, and his eye glanced on Humez as if he'd say, Stuff! But seeing the king seemed himself in a huff, he changed his demeanor and grew smooth enough. 
Then taking his chin twixt his finger and thumb, as a help to reflection gave vent to a hum. Twas the pause of an instant his eye assumed fast, that expression which says, Come, I've got it at last. There's one plan, he resumed, which with all due respect to your majesty, no one, I think, can object to. Since your majesty don't like the peas in the shoe, or to travel, what say you to burning a Jew or two? Of all cookeries most, the saints love a roast, and a Jew's, of all others, the best dish to toast. And then for a cook, we have not far to look. Father Dominic self, sire, your own grand inquisitor. Luckily, now at your court is a visitor. Of his reverence's functions, there is not one weightier than heretic burning. In fact, tis his matier. Besides alguazils, who still follow his heels, he has always familiars enough at his beck at home to pick you up Hebrews enough for a hecatomb. And depend on it, sire, such a glorious specific would make every queen throughout Europe prolific. Says the king, that'll do. Pooh, pooh, burn a Jew. Burn half a score Jews. Burn a dozen, burn two. Your grace, it's a match. Burn all you can catch. Men, women, and children. Pooh, pooh, great and small. Oh, clothes, slippers, ceiling wax. Pooh, burn them all. For once we'll be gay. A grand auto da fe is much better fun than a ball or a play. So the warrant was made out without more delay, drawn, sealed, and delivered, and signed, Yo El Rey. Canto two. There is not a nation in Europe but labors to toady itself and to humbug its neighbors. Earth has no such folks, no folks such a city, so great or so grand, or so fine, or so pretty, said Louis Quatorze, as this Paris of ours, Mr. Daniel O'Connell exclaims, by the powers, old Ireland's on all hands admitted to be the first flower of the earth and first gem of the sea. Mr. Bull will inform you that Neptune, a lad he with more of affection than reverence styles daddy, did not scruple to say to freedom one day that if ever he changed his aquatics for dry land, his home should be Mr. B's tight little island. He adds, too, that he, the said Mr. B, of all possible Frenchmen can fight any three, that with no greater odds he knows well how to treat them, to meet them, defeat them, and beat them, and eat them. In Italy, too, tis the same to the letter. There each Lazzaroni will cry to his crony, See Naples, then die, and the sooner the better. The Portuguese say, as a well-understood thing, who has not seen Lisbon has not seen a good thing, while an old Spanish proverb runs glibly as under, quien no ha visto Sevilla, no ha visto Maravilla. He who ne'er has viewed Seville has ne'er viewed a wonder, and from all I can learn this is no such great blunder. In fact, from the river, the famed Guadalquivir, where many a knight's had cold steel through his liver, the prospect is grand. The Iglesia Mayor has a splendid effect on the opposite shore, with its lofty heralda, while two or three score of magnificent structures around, perhaps more, as our Irish friends have it, are there to the fore. Then the old Alcazar, more ancient by far, as some say, while some call it one of the palaces built in 1200 and odd by Abdalasis, with its horseshoe-shaped arches of arabesque tracery, which the architect seems to have studied to place awry, Saracenic and rich, and more buildings, the which, as old Lily, in whom I've been looking a bit late, says you'd be bored should I now recapitulate. In brief, then, the view is so fine and so new, it would make you exclaim, t'would so forcibly strike ye, if a Frenchman superb, if an Englishman crikey. Yes, thou art wonderful, but oh, tis sad to think, mid scenes so bright as thine fair Seville, sounds of woe and shrieks of pain and wild affright and soul-wrung groans of deep despair and blood and death should mingle there. Yes, thou art wonderful, the flames that on thy towers reflected shine 
while earth's proud lords and high-born dames, descendants of a mighty line, with cold, unaltered looks are by to gaze with an unpitying eye on wretches in their agony. All speak thee wonderful, the phrase befits thee well, the fearful blaze of yon piled faggot's lurid light, where writhing victims mock the sight, the scorched limb shriveling in its chains, the hot blood parched in living veins, the crackling nerve, the fearful knell, rung out by that remorseless bell, those shouts from human fiends that swell, that withering scream, that frantic yell, all Seville, all too truly tell, thou art a marvel and a hell. God, that the worm whom thou hast made should thus his brother worm invade. Count deeds like these good service done, and deem thine eye look smiling on. Yet there at his ease, with his whole court around him, King Ferdinand sits in his glory, confound him, leaning back in his chair with a satisfied air, and enjoying the bother, the smoke, and the smother, with one knee cocked carelessly over the other. His pouncet box goes to and fro at his nose, as somewhat misliking the smell of old clothes, and seeming to hint, by this action emphatic, the Jews, e'en when roasted, are not aromatic. There, too, fair ladies, from Ziris and Cadiz, Catalinas and Julias, and fair Ignacias, in splendid lace veils and becoming mantillas, Elviras, Antonias, and Claras, and Floras, and dark-eyed Yacintas, and soft Isadoras, are crowding the boxes and looking on coolly as though twas but one of their common tertulias. Partaking as usual of wafers and ices, snow water and melons cut out into slices, and chocolate furnished at coffee house prices, while many a suitor and gay coadjutor in the eating and drinking line scorns to be neuter, one being perhaps just returned with his tutor from travel in England is tempting his future with a luxury neat as imported the pewter, and charming the dear Violantes and Ineses with a three-cornered sandwich and soup son of Guinnesses, while another from Paris but newly come back hints the least taste in life of the best cognac. Such ogling and eyeing, in short, and such sighing, and such complimenting, one must not say lying, of smart cavaliers with each other still vying, mixed up with the crying and groans of the dying, all hissing and spitting and broiling and frying, form a scene which, although there can be no denying, to a bon catholique it may prove edifying. I doubt if a Protestant, smart beau or merry belle, might not shrink from it as somewhat too terrible. It's a question with me if you ever surveyed a more stern-looking mortal than old Torquemada, renowned Father Dominic, famous for twisting domestic and foreign necks all over Christendom, Morescos or Jews, not a penny to choose. If a dog of a heretic dared to refuse a glass of old port or a slice from a griskin, the good padre soon would so set him a frisking, that I would not, for more than I'll say, be in his skin." "'Twas just the same thing with his own race and nation, "'and Christian dissenters of every persuasion, "'Muggletonian or Quaker or Jumper or Shaker, "'no matter with whom in opinion partaker, "'George Whitfield, John Bunyan, or Thomas Gutacre, "'they'd no better chance than a Bonds or a Fakir. "'If a woman it skilled not, "'if she did not deem as he, "'bade her to deem touching papal supremacy.' By the Pope, but he'd make her, from error awake her, or else pop her into an oven and bake her. No one, in short, ever came half so near as he did to the full extirpation of heresy. And if, in the times of which now I am treating, there had been such a thing as a Manchester meeting, pretty pork he'd have made, moderator and minister, had he but caught them on his side Cape Finisterre. Pie Smith, 
and the rest of them once to his bonfire henceforth, you'd have heard little more of the conference. And there on the opposite side of the ring, he too sits in his glory confronting the king, with his cast-iron countenance frowning austerely, that matched with his embonpoint body but queerly, for though grim his visage, his person was Percy, belying the rumor of fat folks' good humor. Above waves his banner of justice and mercy. Below and around stand a terrible band, adding much to the scene, namely the Holy Hermandad. That's brotherhood, each looking grave as a granddad. Within the arena before them is seen a strange, odd-looking group, each one dressed in a garment, not dandified, clearly, as certainly varmint, being all over vipers and snakes, and stuck thick with multiplied silhouette profiles of Nick, and a cap of the same, all devils in flame, extinguisher-shaped, much like Salisbury's spire, except that the ladder's, of course, somewhat higher. A long yellow pinafore hangs down each chinafore, on which, ere the wearer had donned it, a man drew the Scotch badge, a saltier, or cross of St. Andrew. Though I fairly confess I am quite at a loss, to guess why they should choose that particular cross, or to make clear to you what the Scotch had to do at all with the business in hand, though it's true that the vestment aforesaid perhaps from its hue, namely yellow, in juxtaposition with blue, a tinge of which latter tint could but accrue on the faces of wretches, of course in a stew, as to what their tormentors were going to do, might make people fancy who no better knew they were somehow connected with Geoffrey's review, especially, too, as it's certain that few things would make Father Dominic blither or happier than to catch hold of it or its chef, Macvay Napier. No matter for that, my description to crown, all the flames and the devils were turned upside down. On this habit facetiously termed San Benito, much like the dress suit of some nondescript brute, from the Chauvin of Wombwell, not George, or Polito, and thrice happy they, dressed out in this way, to appear with eclat at the auto da fe. Thrice happy indeed whom the good luck might fall to, of devil's tail upward and fuego revolto, for only see there in the midst of the square, where perched upon poles six feet high in the air, sit, chained to the stake, some two, three, or four pair of wretches, whose eyes, nose, complexion, and hair, their Jewish descent but too plainly declare, each clothed in a garment more frightful by far, a smock-frock sort of gabardine called a samara, with three times the number of devils upon it, a proportion observed on the sugar-loafed bonnet, with this further distinction of mischief of proof that every fiend jack stands upright on his hoof, while the pictured flames spread over body and head, are three times as crooked and three times as red, while two pointing upwards as much as to say, here's the real bonne bouche of the auto de fe. Torquemada, meanwhile, with his cold, cruel smile, sits looking on calmly and watching the pile as his hooded familiars, their names, as some tell, come from their being so much more familiar than welcome, have by this time begun to be poking their fun and their firebrands, as if there were so many posies of lilies and roses up to the noses of Lazarus, Levi, and Money Ben Moses, while similar treatment is forcing out hollow moans from Abby Ben Lasco and Ike Ben Solomons, whose beards, this a black, that inclining to grizzle, are smoking and curling and all in a fizzle, the king at the same time, his dons and his visitors, sit, sporting smiles like the holy inquisitors. Enough, no more, thank heaven tis o'er. The tragedy's done, and we now draw a veil, or a scene which makes outraged humanity quail, the last fires exhausted and spent like a rocket, the last wretched Hebrews burnt down in his socket. The barriers are open, and all saints and sinners King, court, lords, and commons, gone home to their dinners, with a pleasing emotion produced by the notion of having exhibited so much devotion, all chuckling to think 
how the saints are delighted at having seen so many smouches ignited. All save privy purse whom as, who sconced in his room is, and cocker in hand in his leather-backed chair, is puzzling to find out how much the affair, by deep calculations the which I can't follow, cost, the toddle, in short, of the whole of the Holocaust. Perhaps you may think it a rather odd thing that while talking so much of the court and the king, in describing the scene through which we've just been, I've not said one syllable as to the queen, especially, too, as her majesty's whereabouts all things considered, might well be thought thereabouts. The fact was, however, although little known, Sa Majestad had hit on a plan of her own, and suspecting, perhaps, that an auto alone might fail in securing this heir to the throne, had made up her mind, although well inclined towards galas and shows of no matter what kind, for once to retire and bribe the saints higher than merely by sitting and seeing a fire, a sight, after all, she did not much admire. So she locked herself up, without platter or cup, in her oriel, resolved not to take bite or sup, not so much as her matin draught, our early pearl, nor put on her jewels, nor e'en let the girl who helped her to dress take her hair out of curl, but to pass the whole morning in telling her beads and in reading the lives of the saints and their deeds, and in vowing to visit without shoes or sandals their shrines with unlimited orders for candles, holy water, and masses of Mozarts and Handels. And many a pater and ave and credo did she and her father confessor Cavido, the clever archbishop, you know, of Toledo, who came, as before, at a very short warning, get through without doubt in the course of that morning, shut up as they were, with nobody there, to it all interfere with so pious a pair. And the saints must have been stony-hearted indeed, if they have not allowed all these pains to succeed. Nay, it's not clear to me, but their very ability might, Spain throughout, have been brought into doubt, had the royal bed still remained cursed with sterility. St. Iago, however, who always is jealous in Spanish affairs, as their best authors tell us, and who, if he saw anything like a flaw, in Spain's welfare would soon sing, Old Rose, burnt the bellows, set matters to rights like a king of good fellows. By his interference, three-fourths of a year hence, there was nothing but capering, dancing, and singing, cachucas, boleros, and bells set a-ringing, in both the Castiles, triple bob major peals, rope dancing and tumbling and somerset flinging, segadillas, fandangos, while every gun bangos, and all the way through, from Gibraltar to Biscay, Figueras and Sherry made all the dons frisky, save Moors, Blakes, and O'Donnells who stick to the whiskey. All the day long the dance and the song continue the general joy to prolong, and even long after the close of the day you can hear little else but Hip, 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 hooray! The Escurial, however, is not quite so gay. For whether the saint had not perfectly heard the petition the queen and archbishop preferred, or whether his head, from his not being used, to an auto da fe was a little confused, or whether the king, in the smoke and the smother, got bothered and so made some blunder or other, I am sure I can't say. All I know is that day... There must have been some mistake that I'm afraid is only too clear, inasmuch as the dear royal twins, though fine babies, proved both little ladies. Moral. Reader, not knowing what your persuasion may be, Mohammedan, Jewish, or even Parsi, take a little advice which may serve for all three. First, when you're at Rome, do as Rome does, and note all her ways drink what she drinks, and don't turn teetotaler. In Spain, raison de plus, you must do as they do, inasmuch as they're all there at sixes or sevens, just as you know they were some years ago in the days of Don Carlos and Brigadier Evans. Don't be nice then, but take what they've got in their shops, whether griskins or sausages, ham or pork chops. Next, 
Avoid fancy trousers. Their colors and shapes, sometimes, as you see, may lead folks into scrapes. For myself, I confess, I've but small taste in dress. My opinion is, therefore, worth nothing or less. But some friends I've consulted, much giving to watch one's apparel, do say it's by far the best way, and the safest to do as Lord Brougham does by Scotch ones. I might now volunteer some advice to a king. Let Whigs say what they will, I shall do no such thing, but copy my betters and never begin until, like Sir Robert, I'm duly called in. End of section four, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 7th, 2023. Section five of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. The Ingoldsby Penance. In the windows of the Great Hall, as well as in those of the Long Gallery and the Library at Tappington, are, and have been, many of them from a very early period, various storied panes of stained glass, which, as Blue Dick's exploits did not extend beyond the neighboring city, have remained unfractured down to the present time. Footnote about Blue Dick. Richard Culmer, parson of Chartham, commonly so called, distinguished himself, while Loud was in the tower, by breaking the beautiful windows in Canterbury Cathedral, standing on the top of the city ladder, near sixty steps high, with a whole pike in his hand, when others would not venture so high. This feat of vandalism, the cerulean worthy called rattling down proud Becket's glassy bones. End of footnote. Among the numerous escutcheons there displayed, charged with armorial bearings of the family and its connections, is one in which a chevron between three eagles' quisses, sable, is blazoned quarterly with the engrailed satire of the Ingoldsby's. Mr. Simpkinson from Bath, whose merits as an antiquary are so well known and appreciated as to make eulogy superfluous, not to say impertinent, has been for some time bringing his heraldic lore to bear on those monumenta vetusta. He pronounces the code in question to be that of a certain Sir Ingoldsby Bray who flourished in the time of Richard I and founded the Abbey of Ingoldsby in the county of Kent and diocese of Rochester early in the reign of that monarch's successor. The history of the origin of that pious establishment has been rescued from the dirt and mildew in which its chartillaries have been slumbering for centuries, and is here given. The link of connection between the two families is shown by the accompanying extract from our genealogical tree. Narrator's note. This is a description of the family tree presented by the author to show the connection between the Ingoldsby and de Bray families. At the top of the tree is Peter de Ingoldsby, Lord of Tappington, in the time of Stephen, killed at the Battle of Lincoln, ex parte regis. Peter had two children, Richard Ingoldsby of Tappington aforesaid, from whom came Hodiernus Ingoldsby, and Joan Ingoldsby, his only daughter, married Geoffrey de Bray. Joan and Geoffrey had two sons, Ingoldsby de Bray, Chevalier, after his marriage assumed his mother's name, founder of Ingoldsby Abbey in 1202 AD, and died without issue about 1214, and Reginald de Bray, second son, heir to his brother, from whom descended Edmund Lord Bray, summoned to Parliament 1521-28 to during the reign of Henry VIII. As a separate branch, we see Vitalis de Angen wed Alice de Lisieux, second wife. They had a daughter and heir, Alicia, and it is noted suspenda ter percolum, meaning hanged by the neck. Alicia wed Ingoldsby de Bray. End of narrator's note. In this document, it will be perceived that the death of Lady Alice Ingoldsby is attributed to strangulation superinduced by suspension, whereas in the veritable legend annexed, no allusion is made to the intervention of a halter. Unluckily, Sir Ingoldsby left no issue, 
or we might now be calling cousins with ci-devant Mrs. Otway Cave, in whose favor the abeyance of the old barony of Bray has recently been determined by the crown. To this same barony we ourselves were not without our pretensions, and Teste Simpkinson had as good a right to it as anybody else. The collective wisdom of the country has, however, decided the point, and placed us among that very numerous class of claimants who are wrongfully kept out of their property and dignities by the right owners. I seize with pleasure this opportunity of contradicting a malicious report that Mr. Simpkinson has, in a late publication, confounded King Henry V with the Duke of Monmouth and positively deny that he has ever represented Walter Lord Clifford, father to fair Rosamond, as the leader of the O.P. Row. The Ingoldsby Penance, a legend of Palestine and West Kent. I'll devise thee brave punishments for him. Shakespeare. Out and spake Sir Ingoldsby Bray, a stalwart knight, I ween, was he. Come east, come west, come lance in rest. Come falchion in hand, I'll tickle the best of all the soldan's chivalry. Oh, they came west and they came east, twenty-four emirs and sheiks at the least. And they hammered away at Sir Ingoldsby Bray, fall back, fall edge, cut, thrust, and point. But he topped off head and he lopped off joint, twenty and three of high degree, lay stark and stiff on the crimson lee. All, all save one, and he ran up a tree. Now count them, my squire, now count them and see. Twenty and three, twenty and three, all of them nobles of high degree. There they be lying on Ascalon Lee. Out and spake Sir Inglesby Bray. What news, what news, come tell to me. What news, what news, thou little foot page. I've been whacking the foe till it seems an age since I was in Inglesby Hall so free. What news, what news from Inglesby Hall. Come tell me now, thou page so small. O oh, hawk and hound are safe and sound, beast and buyer and steed and stall, and the watchdog's bark, as soon as it's dark, bays wakeful guard round Ingoldsby Hall. I care not a pound for hawk or for hound, for steed and stall or for watchdog's bay. Fain would I hear of my dainty dear. How fares Dame Alice, my lady gay? Sir Ingoldsby Bray, he said in his rage, What news, what news, thou naughty foot page? That little foot page, full low crouched he, and he doffed his cap and he bended his knee. Now lithe and listen, Sir Bray, to me. Lady Alice sits lonely in bower and hall. Her sighs they rise and her tears they fall. She sits alone and she makes her moan. Dance and song she considers quite wrong. Feast and revel, mere snares of the devil. She mendeth her hose and she crieth, Alack, when will Sir Ingoldsby Bray come back? Thou liest, thou liest, thou naughty foot page. Full loud dost thou lie, false page to me. There in thy breast, neath thy silken vest, what scroll is that false page I see? Sir Inglesby Bray in his rage drew near. That little foot page he blenched with fear. Now where may the prior of Abington lie? King Richard's confessor, I ween, is he. And tidings rare to him do I bear, and news of price from his rich abbey. Now nay, now nay, thou naughty page, no learned clerk I trow am I, but well I ween, may there be seen Dame Alice's hand with half an eye. Now nay, now nay, thou naughty page, from Abington Abbey comes not thy news. Although no clerk, well may I mark the particular turn of her P's and her Q's. Sir Inglesby Bray in his fury and rage, by the back of the neck takes that little foot page. The scroll he seizes, the page he squeezes, and buffets and pinches his nose till he sneezes. Then he cuts with his dagger the silken threads, which they used in those days, instead of little queen's heads. When the contents of the scroll met his view, Sir Inglesby Bray in a passion grew. Backward he drew his mailed shoe, and he kicked that naughty foot page that he flew like a cloth yard shaft from a bended yew. I may not say whither, I never knew. Now count the slain upon Ascalon Plain. Go count them, my squire, go count them again. Twenty and three, there they be, stiff and stark on that crimson lee. Twenty and three, stay, let me see. Stretched in his gore, there lieth one more. 
By the Pope's triple crown there are twenty and four. Twenty-four trunks, I ween, are there, but their heads and their limbs are nobody knows where. I twenty-four courses I read there be, though one got away and ran up a tree. Look nigher, look nigher, my trusty squire. One is the course of a barefooted friar. Out and spake Sir Inglesby Bray. A boon, a boon, King Richard, quoth he. Now heaven thee save, a boon I crave. A boon, Sir King, on my bended knee. A year and a day have I been away, King Richard, from Inglesby Hall so free. Dame Alice, she sits there in lonely guise, and she makes her moan, and she sobs and she sighs, and tears like raindrops fall from her eyes, and she darneth her hose, and she crieth, Alack! Oh, when will Sir Inglesby Bray come back? A boon, a boon, my liege, quoth he, Fair Inglesby Hall I fain would see. Rise up, rise up, Sir Inglesby Bray, King Richard said right graciously, Of all in my host that I love the most, I love none better, Sir Bray, than thee. Rise up, rise up, Thou hast thy boon, but mind you make haste and come back again soon. Fit two. Pope Gregory sits in St. Peter's chair. Pontiff proud, I ween, is he, and a belted knight in armor dight is begging a boon on his bended knee. With signs of grief and sounds of woe, featly he kisseth his holiness toe. Now pardon, Holy Father, I crave. O Holy Father, pardon and grace. In my fury and rage, a little foot-page I have left, I fear me, in evil case. A scroll of shame from a faithless dame did that naughty foot-page to a paramour bear. I gave him a lick with a stick and a kick that sent him, I can't tell your holiness where. Had he as many necks as hairs, he had broken them all down those perilous stairs. Rise up, rise up, Sir Inglesby Bray. Rise up, rise up, I say to thee. A soldier, I trow, of the cross art thou. Rise up, rise up from thy bended knee. Ill it beseems that soldier true of holy church should vainly sue. Foot pages, they are by no means rare. A thriftless crew, I ween, be they. Well, mote we spare a page or a pair, for the matter of that, Sir Inglesby Bray, but stout and true soldiers like you grow scarcer and scarcer every day. Be prayers for the dead duly read. Let a mass be sung and a potter be said. So may your qualms of conscience cease, and the little foot page shall rest in peace. Now pardon, Holy Father, I crave. O Holy Father, pardon and grace. Dame Alice, my wife, the bane of my life, I have left, I fear me, in evil case. A scroll of shame in my rage I tore, which that caitliff page to a paramour bore. Twere bootless to tell how I stormed and swore. Alack, alack, too surely I knew the turn of each pea and the tail of each cue. And away to Inglesby Hall I flew. Dame Alice I found, she sank on the ground. I twisted her neck till I twisted it round. With jibe and jeer and mock and scoff, I twisted it on till I twisted it off. All the king's doctors and all the king's men can't put fair Alice's head on again. Well a day, well a day, Sir Inglesby Bray. Why, really, I hardly know what to say. Foul sin, I trow, a fair lady to slay, because she's perhaps been a little too gay. Monk must chant, and none must pray, for each mass they sing and each prayer they say. For a year and a day, Sir Inglesby Bray, a fair rose noble must duly pay. So may his qualms of conscience cease, and the soul of Dame Alice may rest in peace. Now pardon, Holy Father, I crave. O Holy Father, pardon and grace. No power could save that paramour knave. I left him, I wot, in evil case. There midst the slain upon Ascalon plain, unburied, I trow, doth his body remain. His legs lie here, and his arms lie there, and his head lies, I can't tell your holiness where. Now out and alas, Sir Inglesby Bray, foul sin it were, thou doughty knight, to hack and to hew a champion true of holy church in such pitiful plight, foul sin her warriors so to slay when they're scarcer and scarcer every day. A chantry fair, and of monks a pair, to pray for his soul for ever and a. Thou must duly endow, Sir Inglesby Bray, and fourteen marks by the year must thou pay, for plenty of lights, 
to burn there o' nights. None of your rascally dips, but sound round ten penny moulds of four to the pound, and a shirt of the roughest and coarsest hair, for a year and a day, Sir Inglesby, wear. So may your qualms of conscience cease, and the soul of the soldier shall rest in peace. Now nay, holy father, now nay, now nay, lest penance may serve, quoth Sir Inglesby Bray. No champion free of the cross was he, no belted baron of high degree, no knight nor squire did there expire. He was, I trow, but a barefooted friar, and the abbot of Abingdon long may wait, with his monks around him, and early and late, may look from loophole and turret and gate. He hath lost his prior, his prior his pate. Now thunder and turf, Pope Gregory said, and his hair raised his triple crown right off his head. Now thunder and turf, and out and alas, a horrible thing has come to pass. What? Cut off the head of a reverend prior, and say he was only a barefooted friar? What baron or squire, or knight of the shire, is half so good as a holy friar? O turpissime, virnequissime, celeratissime, Kissime, Isime, never I trow, have the servi servorum had before him such a breach of decorum, such a gross violation of morum bonorum, and won't have again secula seculorum. Come hither to me, my cardinals three, my bishops in partibus, masters in artibus, hither to me, A, B, and D, D, doctors and proctors of every degree, go fetch me a book. Go fetch me a bell, as big as a dustman's, and a candle as well. I'll send him where good manners won't let me tell. Pardon and grace, now pardon and grace. Sir Inglesby Bray fell flat on his face. Mea culpa, in sooth I'm in pitiful case. Peccavi, peccavi, I've done very wrong. But my heart it is stout, and my arm it is strong and I'll fight for Holy Church all the day long, and the Inglesby lands are broad and fair, and they're here, and they're there, and I can't tell you where, and Holy Church shall come in for her share. Pope Gregory paused, and he sat himself down, and he somewhat relaxed his terrible frown, and his cardinals three, they picked up his crown. Now, if it be so that you own you've been wrong, and your heart is so stout, and your arm is so strong, and you really will fight like a trump all day long if the Inglesby lands do lie here and there, and Holy Church shall come in for her share. Why, my cardinals three, you'll agree with me that it gives a new turn to the whole affair, and I think the penitent need not despair. If it be so, as you seem to say, rise up, rise up, Sir Inglesby Bray. An abbey so fair, Sir Bray shall found, whose innermost walls encircling bound shall take in a couple of acres of ground, and there in that abbey all the year round a full choir of monks and a full choir of nuns shall live upon cabbage and hot cross buns, and Sir Inglesby Bray, without delay, shall hie him again to Ascalon Plain, and gather the bones of the foully slain, and shall place said bones with all possible care in an elegant shrine, in his abbey so fair, and plenty of lights shall be there a nights, none of your rascally dips, but sound best superfine wax wicks, four to the pound, and monk and nun shall pray each one for the soul of the prior of Abingdon. And Sir Inglesby Bray, so bold and so brave, never shall wash himself, comb or shave, nor adorn his body, nor drink gin toddy, nor indulge in a pipe, but shall dine upon tripe, and blackberries gather before they are ripe, and forever abhor, renounce, and abjure rum, hollands, and brandy, wine, punch, and liqueur. Sir Inglesby Bray here gave way to a feeling which prompted a word profane, but he swallowed it down by an effort again, and his holiness luckily fancied his gulp a mere repetition of O oh, mea culpa. Thrice three times upon Candlemas Day, between Vespers and Compline, Sir Inglesby Bray, shall run round the abbey as best he may, subjecting his back to thump and to thwack, well and truly laid on by a barefooted friar, with a stout cat of nine-tails, 
of whip-corded wire, and nor he nor his heir shall take, use, or bear any more from this day the surname of Bray, as being dishonored, but all issue male he has shall with himself go henceforth by an alias, so his qualms of conscience at length may cease, and page, dame, and prior shall rest in peace. Sir Ingoldsby, now no longer Bray, is off like a shot away and away, over the brine to far Palestine, to rummage and hunt over Ascalon Plain, for the unburied bones of his victim slain. Look out, my squire, look higher and nigher, look out for the corpse of a barefooted friar, and pick up the arms and the legs of the dead, and pick up his body, and pick up his head. Fit three. Ingoldsby Abbey is fair to see. It hath manners a dozen, and royalties three, with right of free warren, whatever that be, rich pastures in front, and green woods in the rear, all in full leaf at the right time of year. About Christmas or so they fall into the sear, and the prospect, of course, becomes rather more drear. But it's really delightful in springtime, and near the great gate, Father Thames rolls sunbright and clear. Cobham Woods to the right, on the opposite shore, Landon Hills in the distance, ten miles off or more. Then you've Milton and Gravesend behind, and before you can see, almost all the way down to the Nore. So charming a spot, it's rarely one's lot to see, and when seen, it's as rarely forgot. Yes, Ingoldsby Abbey is fair to see, and its monks and its nuns are fifty and three, and there they all stand, each in their degree, drawn up in the front of their sacred abode, two by two, in their regular mode, while a funeral comes down the Rochester Road. Palmer's twelve, from a foreign strand, cockle in hat and staff in hand, come marching in pairs, a holy band. Little boys twelve, dressed all in white, each with his brazen censer bright, and singing away with all their might, follow the Palmers, a goodly sight. Next high in air, twelve yeomen bear on their sturdy necks, with a good deal of care, a patent sarcophagus firmly reared, of Spanish mahogany not veneered, and behind walks a knight with a very long beard. Close by his side is a friar supplied with a stout cat of nine tails of tough cowhide, while all sorts of queer men bring up the rear, men-at-arms, nigger captives, and bowmen and spearmen. It boots not to tell, what you'll guess very well, how some sang the requiem, some told the bell. Suffice it to say, twas on Candlemas Day, the procession I speak about reached the Sacellum, and in lieu of a supper, the knight on his crupper received the first taste of the father's flagellum, that, as chronicles tell, he continued to dwell all the rest of his days in the abbey he'd founded, by the pious of both sexes ever surrounded, and partaking the fare of the monks and the nuns, ate the cabbage alone, without touching the buns, that year after year, having run round the quad, with his back, as enjoined him, exposed to the rod, having not only kissed it, but blessed it, and thanked it, he died, as all thought, in the odor of sanctity. When strange to relate, and you'll hardly believe what I'm going to tell you, next Candlemas Eve, the monks and the nuns in the dead of the night tumble all of them out of their beds in a fright, alarmed by the bawls and the calls and the squalls of someone who seemed running all round the walls. Looking out soon, by the light of the moon, there appears most distinctly to everyone's view and making, as seems to them, all this ado, the form of a knight with a beard like a Jew, as black as if steeped in that matchless of hunts, and so bushy it would not disgrace Mr. Munts. A barefooted friar stands behind him and shakes a flagellum, whose lashes appear to be snakes, while more terrible still, the astounded beholders perceive the said friar has no head on his shoulders, but is holding his pate, in his left hand out straight, as if by a closer inspection to find where to get the best cut at his victim behind. With the aid of a small bull's-eye lantern, as placed by our own new police, in a belt round his waist, 
all gaze with surprise, scarce believing their eyes, when the knight makes a start like a racehorse and flies from his headless tormentor, repeating his cries in vain, for the friar to his skirts closely sticks, running after him, so said the abbot, like bricks. Thrice times did the phantom knight course round the abbey as best he might, bethwacked and besmacked by the headless sprite, while his shriek so piercing made all hearts thrill, then a whoop and a halloo, and all was still. Ingoldsby Abbey has passed away, and at this time of day one can hardly survey any traces or track, save a few ruins gray with age and fast moldering into decay, of the structure once built by Sir Ingoldsby Bray. But still there are many folks living who say that on every Candlemas Eve the knight, accoutred and dight, in his armor bright, with his thick black beard, and the clerical sprite, with his head in his hand and his lantern alight, run round the spot where the old abbey stood, and are seen in the neighboring Glebland and Wood. More especially still, if it's stormy and windy, you may hear them for miles kicking up their wild shindy, and that once in a gale of wind, sleet, and hail, they frighten the horses and upset the mail. What tis breaks the rest of these souls unblessed would now be a thing rather hard to be guessed. Though some say the squire on his deathbed confessed that on Ascalon Plain, when the bones of the slain were collected that day and packed up in a chest, caulked and made watertight by command of the knight, though the legs and the arms they'd got all pretty right and the body itself in a decentish plight, yet the friar's pericranium was nowhere in sight. So to save themselves trouble they picked up instead and popped on the shoulders a Saracen's head. Thus the knight in the terms of his penance had failed, and the Pope's absolution, of course, not availed. Now, though this might be, it don't seem to agree with one thing which, I own, is a poser to me. I mean, as the miracles wrought at the shrine, containing the bones brought from far Palestine, were so great and notorious, tis hard to combine this fact with the reason these people assign or suppose that the head of the murdered divine could be aught but what yankees would call genuine tis a very nice question but be it as it may the ghost of sir ingoldsby ci devant bray it is boldly affirmed by the folks great and small about milton and chalk and around cobham hall still on candlemas day haunts the old ruined wall and that many have seen him and more heard him squall. So I think, when the facts of the case you recall, my inference, reader, you'll fairly forestall, viz. that spite of the hope held out by the Pope, Sir Inglesby Bray was damned after all. Moral. Foot pages and servants of every degree, in livery or out of it, listen to me. See what comes of lying. Don't join in a league to humbug your master or aid an intrigue. Ladies, married and single, from this understand how foolish it is to send letters by hand. Don't stand for the sake of a penny, but when you've a billet to send to a lover or friend, put it into the post and don't cheat the revenue. Reverend gentlemen, you who are given to Rome, don't keep up a soft correspondence at home, but while you're abroad, lead respectable lives. Love your neighbors and welcome, but don't love their wives. And as bricklayers cry from the tiles and the leads, when they're shoveling the snow off, take care of your heads. Knights, whose hearts are so stout and whose arms are so strong, learn to twist a wife's neck is decidedly wrong. If your servants offend you or give themselves airs, rebuke them, but mildly. Don't kick them downstairs. To poor Richard's homely old proverb attend, if you want matters well managed, go, if not send. A servant's too often a negligent elf. If it's business of consequence, do it yourself. The state of society seldom requires people now to bring home with them unburied friars. But they sometimes do bring home an inmate for life. Now don't do that by proxy, but choose your own wife. For think how annoying t'would be when you're wed to find in your bed, on the pillow instead, of the sweet face you look for, a Saracen's Head. End of section 5. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, March 26, 2023.
Section 6 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Alas for Ingoldsby Abbey, alas that one should have to say, Periurunt itiam runae. Its very ruins now are tiny. There is something in the very sight of an old abbey, family associations apart, as Ossian says, or Macpherson for him, pleasing yet mournful to the soul. Nor could I ever yet gaze on the roofless walls and ivy-clad towers of one of these venerable monuments of the piety of bygone days without something very like an unbidden tear rising to dim the prospect. Something of this, I think, I have already hinted in, recording our picnic with the Seaforths at Bolsover. Since then I have paid a visit to the beautiful remains of what once was Netley, and never experienced the sensation to which I have alluded in a stronger degree. If its character was somewhat changed before we parted, it is not my fault. Still, be the drawbacks what they may, I shall ever mark with a white stone the day on which I for the first time beheld the time-worn cloisters of Netley Abbey, a legend of Hampshire. I saw thee, Netley, as the sun across the western wave was sinking slow, and a golden glow to thy roofless towers he gave, and the ivy sheen with its mantle of green that wrapped thy walls around shone lovely bright in that glorious light, and I felt t'was holy ground. Then I thought of the ancient time, the days of thy monks of old, when to matin and vesper and compline chime the loud hosanna rolled, and thy courts and long-drawn aisles among swelled the full tide of sacred song. And then a vision passed across my mental eye, and silver shrines and shaven crowns, and delicate ladies in bombazine gowns, and long white veils went by, stiff and staid and solemn and sad, but one, methought, winked at the gardener lad. Then came the abbot with mitre and ring and pastoral staff and all that sort of thing, and a monk with a book and a monk with a bell and dear little souls in clean linen stoles, swinging their censers and making a smell. And see where the choir master walks in the rear with front severe and brow austere, now and then pinching a little boy's ear when he chants the responses too late or too soon, or his do re mi fa so la's not quite in tune, then you know they'd a movable do, not a fixed one as now, and of course never knew how to set up a musical hullabaloo. It was in sooth a comely sight, and I welcomed the vision with pure delight. But then a change came o'er my spirit, a change of fear. That gorgeous scene I beheld no more, but deep beneath the basement floor, a dungeon dark and drear. And there was an ugly hole in the wall, for an oven too big, for a cellar too small, and mortar and bricks all ready to fix. And I said, here's a nun has been playing some tricks. That horrible hole, it seems to say, I'm a grave that gapes for a living prey, and my heart grew sick, and my brow grew sad, and I thought of that wink at the gardener lad. Ah me, ah me, tis sad to think that maiden's eye, which was made to wink, should here be compelled to grow blear and blink, or be closed for a in this kind of way, shut out forever from wholesome day, walled up in a hole with never a chink, no light, no air, no victuals, no drink. And that maiden's lip, which was made to sip, should here grow withered and dry as a chip. That wandering glance and furtive kiss, exceedingly naughty and wrong, I wis, should yet be considered so much amiss as to call for a sentence severe as this. And I said to myself, as I heard with a sigh, the poor lone victim stifled cry. Well, I can't understand how any man's hand could wall up that hole in a Christian land. 
why a Mussulman Turk would recoil from the work, and though when his ladies run after the fellows, he stands not on trifles, if maddened by jealousy, its objects, I'm sure, would declare, could they speak, in their Georgian, Circassian, or Turkish, or Greek, when all said and done, far better it was for us, tied back to back and sewn up in a sack, to be pitched neck and heels from a boat in the Bosphorus. Oh, a saint would vex to think that the sex should be treated no better than Combs double X. Sure, someone might run to the abbess and tell her a much better method of stocking her cellar. If ever on polluted walls heaven's red right arm in vengeance falls, if e'er its justice wraps in flame the black abodes of sin and shame, that justice in its own good time shall visit for so foul a crime. Ope desolation's floodgate wide, and blast thee netly in thy pride. Lo, where it comes, the tempest lowers, it bursts on thy devoted towers, ruthless tutor's bloated form rides on the blast and guides the storm. I hear the sacrilegious cry, down with the nests and the rooks will fly. Down, down they come, a fearful fall, arch and pillar and roof tree and all, stained pane and sculptured stone, there they lie on the green sward strown. Moldering walls remain alone, shaven crown, bombazine gown, mitre and crozier and all are flown. And yet, fair netly, as I gaze upon that gray and moldering wall, the glories of thy palmy days, its very stones recall. They come like shadows so depart. I saw thee as thou wert and art, sublime in ruin, grand in woe, lone refuge of the owl and bat. No voice awakes thine echoes now, no sound. Good gracious, what was that? Was it the moan? The parting groan of her who died forlorn and alone, embedded in mortar and bricks and stone? Full and clear, on my listening ear, it comes again, near and more near. Why, Zooks, it's the popping of ginger beer. I rush to the door, I tread the floor, by abbots and abbesses trodden before, in the good old chivalric days of yore. And what see I there? In a rush bottomed chair, a hag surrounded by crockery ware, vending in cups to the credulous throng, a nasty decoction miscalled Suchong, and a squeaking fiddle and wry necked fife are screeching away for the life, for the life, danced to by all the world and his wife. Tag, rag, and bobtail are capering there, worse seen I ween than Bartlemy Fair. Two or three chimney sweeps, two or three clowns, playing at pitch and toss, sport their browns. Two or three damsels, frank and free, are ogling and smiling and sipping bohe. Parties below and parties above, some making tea and some making love. Then the toot, toot, toot of that vile demi flute, the detestable din of that cracked violin, and the odors of stout and tobacco and gin. Dear me, I exclaimed, what a place to be in! And I said to the person who drove my shay, a very intelligent man, by the way. This, all things considered, is rather too gay. It don't suit my humor, so take me away. Dancing, drinking, cigar and song? If not profanation, it's coming it strong, and I really consider it all very wrong. Pray, to whom does this property now belong? He paused and said, scratching his head, Why, I really do think he's a little to blame but I can't say I knows the gentleman's name. Well, well, quoth I, as I heaved a sigh, and a teardrop fell from my twinkling eye. My vastly good man, as I scarcely doubt, that some day or other you'll find it out. Should he come in your way, or ride in your shay, as perhaps he may, be so good as to say that a visitor, whom you drove over one day, was exceedingly angry and very much scandalized, finding these beautiful ruins so vandalized. And thus of their owner to speak began, as he ordered you home in haste. No doubt he's a very respectable man. But I can't say much for his taste. End of section 6. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 14, 2023.
Section 7 of the Inglesby Legends Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Inglesby Legends Second Series by Richard Harris Barham. My very excellent brother in law, Seaforth, late of the Bombay Fencibles, lucky dog to have quitted the service before the shocking afghan business seems to have been even more forcibly affected on the evening when he so narrowly escaped being locked in westminster abbey and when but let him describe his own feelings as he has done indeed in the subjoined fragment a feeling sad came o'er me as i trod the sacred ground where tudors and plantagenets were lying all around i stepped with noiseless foot as though the sound of mortal tread might burst the bands of dreamless sleep that wraps the mighty dead the slanting rays of the evening sun shone through those cloisters pale with fitful light on regal vest and warriors sculptured mail as from the stained and storied pane it danced with quivering gleam each cold and prostrate form below seemed quickening in the beam now sinking low no more was heard the organ's solemn swell and faint upon the listening ear the last hosanna fell it died and not a breath did stir above each nightly stall unmoved the bannered brazenry hung waveless as a pall i stood alone a living thing midst those that were no more i thought on ages past and gone the glorious deeds of yore on edward's sable panoply on cress's tented plain the fatal roses twined at length on great eliza's reign i thought on naseby marston moor on worcester's crowning fight when on mine ear a sound there fell it chilled me with a fright as thus in low unearthly tones i heard a voice begin this here's the cap of general monk sir please put summer in Kaitera desideranto end of section seven read by alan mapstone section eight of the ingoldsby legends second series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Inglesby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. That Seafort's nervous system was powerfully acted upon on this occasion, I can well believe. The circumstance brings to my recollection a fearful adventure, or what might perhaps have proved one, of my own in early life while grinding gerunds at Canterbury. A sharp touch of the gout and the reputed sanatory qualities of a certain spring in St. Peter's Street, then in much repute, had induced my uncle to take up a temporary abode within the cathedral precinct. It was on one of those temporary visits which I was sometimes permitted to pay on half-holidays that, in self-defense, I had to recount the following true narrative. I may add that this tradition is not yet worn out a small maimed figure of a female in a sitting position and holding something like a frying pan in her hand may still be seen on the covered passage which crosses the brick walk and adjoins the house belonging to the sixth prebendal stall there are those whom i know who would even yet hesitate at threading the dark entry on a friday not of course that they believe one word about nell cook a legend of the dark entry the king's scholar's story from the brick wall branches off to the right a long narrow vaulted passage paved with flagstones vulgarly known by the name of the dark entry its eastern extremity communicates with the cloisters crypt 
and by a private staircase with the interior of the cathedral. On the west, it opens into the green court, forming a communication between it and the portion of the precinct called the Oaks, a walk round Canterbury, and so forth. Scene. A back parlor in Mr. John Inglesby's house in the precinct. A blazing fire. Mine uncle is seated in a high-backed easy chair, twirling his thumbs and contemplating his list shoe. Little Tom, the king's scholar, on a stool opposite. Mrs. John Inglesby at the table, busily employed in manufacturing a cabbage rose, cauliflower, in many colored worsteds. Mine uncle's meditations are interrupted by the French clock on the mantelpiece. He prologueth with vivacity. Hark! Listen, Mrs. Inglesby, the clock is striking nine. Give Master Tom another cake and half a glass of wine, and ring the bell for Jenny Smith and bid her bring his coat and a warm bandana handkerchief to tie about his throat, and bid them go the nearest way, for Mr. Birch has said that nine o'clock's the hour he'll have his boarders all in bed, and well we know when little boys their coming home delay, they often seem to walk and sit uneasily next day. Nay, nay, dear Uncle Inglesby, now send me not, I pray, back by that entry dark, for that you know's the nearest way. I dread that entry dark with Jane alone at such an hour. It fears me quite. It's Friday night, and then Nell Cook hath power. And who's Nell Cook, thou silly child? And what's Nell Cook to thee? That thou shouldst dread at night to tread with Jane that dark entry? Nay, list and hear, mine uncle dear, such fearsome things they tell of Nellie Cook that few may brook at night to meet with Nell. It was in bluff King Harry's days, and monks and friars were then, you know, dear Uncle Inglesby, a sort of clergyman. They'd coarse stuff gowns and shaven crowns, no shirts and no cravats, and a cord was placed about their waist. They had no shovel hats. It was in bluff King Harry's days, while yet he went to shrift, and long before he stamped and swore and cut the Pope adrift. There lived a portly canon then, a sage and learned clerk, he had, I trow, a goodly house, fast by that entry dark. The canon was a portly man, of Latin and of Greek, and learned lore he had good store, yet health was on his cheek. The priory fare was scant and spare, the bread was made of rye, the beer was weak, yet he was sleek, he had a merry eye. For though within the priory the fare was scant and thin, the canon's house it stood without, he kept good cheer within. And to the best he pressed each guest with free and jovial look, and Ellen Bean ruled his cuisine. He called her Nellie Cook. For soups and stews and choice ragouts, Nell Cook was famous still. She'd make them even of old shoes. She had such wondrous skill. Her manchets fine were quite divine. Her cakes were nicely browned. Her boiled and roast, they were the boast of all the precinct round. And Nellie was a comely lass, but calm and stayed her air, and earthward bent her modest look, yet she was passing fair, and though her gown was russet brown, their heads grave people shook. They all agreed no clerk had need of such a pretty cook. One day, twas on a Whitsun eve, there came a coach and four. It passed the green court gate and stopped before the cannon's door. The travel stain on wheel and rein bespoke a weary way, each panting steed relaxed its speed, outstepped a lady gay. Now welcome, welcome, dearest niece, the canon then did cry, and to his breast the lady pressed, he had a merry eye. Now welcome, welcome, dearest niece, in sooth thou'rt welcome here. Tis many a day since we have met, how fares my brother dear? Now thanks, my loving uncle, that lady gay replied, gramercy for thy benison, then out, alas, she sighed, my father dear, he is not near, he seeks the Spanish main. He prays thee give me shelter here till he return again. Now welcome, welcome, dearest niece, come lay thy mantle by. The canon kissed her ruby lip, he had a merry eye, but Nellie Cook askew did look. It came into her mind, they were a little less than kin, and rather more than kind. Three weeks are gone and over, full three weeks and a day, Yet still within the canon's house doth dwell that lady gay. On capons fine they daily dine, rich cates and sauces rare, 
and they quaff good store of Bordeaux wine, so dainty is their fare. And fine upon the virginals is that gay lady's touch, and sweet her voice unto the lute, you'll scarce hear any such. But is it, O oh, Sanctissima, she sings in dulcet tone, or angels ever bright and fair? Ah, no, it's Bobbing Joan. The canon's house is lofty and spacious to the view. The canon's cell is ordered well, yet Nelly looks askew. The lady's bower is in the tower, yet Nelly shakes her head. She hides the poker and the tongs in that gay lady's bed. Six weeks were gone and over, full six weeks and a day, yet in that bed the poker and the tongs unheeded lay, from which I fear it's pretty clear that Lady Rest had none, or if she slept in any bed, it was not in her own. But where that lady passed her nights, I may not well divine, perhaps in pious orations at good St. Thomas' shrine. And for her father, far away, breathe tender vows and true. It may be so, I cannot say, but Nelly looked askew. And still at night, by fair moonlight, when all were locked in sleep, she'd listen at the cannon's door. She threw the keyhole peep. I know not what she heard or saw, but fury filled her eye. She bought some nasty doctor's stuff, and she put it in a pie. It was a glorious summer's eve, with beams of rosy red. The sun went down, all nature smiled, but Nellie shook her head. Full softly to the balmy breeze rang out the vesper bell. Upon the cannon's startled ear, it sounded like a knell. Now here's to thee, mine uncle, a health I drink to thee. Now pledge me back in sherry's sack or a cup of malvoisie. The cannon sighed, but rousing cried, I answer to thy call, and a warden pies a dainty dish to mortify withal. Tis early dawn, the matin chime rings out for morning prayer, and prior and friar is in his stall, the cannon is not there, nor in the small refectory hall, nor cloistered walk is he. All wonder, and the sacristan says, Lauca daisy me. They've searched the aisles and baptistry, they've searched above, around, the sermon house, the audit room, the cannon is not found. They only find that pretty cook concocting a ragu. They ask her where her master is, but Nelly looks askew. They call for crowbars, jemmies, is the modern name they bear. They burst through lock and bolt and bar, but what a sight is there! The cannon's head lies on the bed, his niece lies on the floor. They are as dead as any nail that is in any door. The livid spot is on his breast, the spot is on his back. His portly form, no longer warm with life, is swollen and black. The livid spot is on her cheek, it's on her neck of snow, and the prior sighs and sadly cries, Well, here's a pretty go. All at the silent hour of night a bell is heard to toll, a knell is rung, a requiem sung as for a sinful soul. And there's a grave within the nave, it's dark and deep and wide, and they bury there a lady fair and a cannon by her side. And uncle, so tis whispered now throughout the sacred fane, and a niece whose father's far away upon the Spanish main. The sacristan, he says no word that indicates a doubt, but he puts his thumb unto his nose, and he spreads his fingers out. And where doth Terry Nelly cook, that staid and comely lass? I wear, for ne'er from forth that door was Nelly known to pass. Her coif and gown of russet brown were lost unto the view, and if you mentioned Nelly's name, the monks all looked askew. There is a heavy paving stone fast by the cannon's door of granite gray, and it may weigh some half a ton or more, and it is laid deep in the shade within that entry dark where sun or moonbeam never played or e'en one starry spark. That heavy granite stone was moved that night, t'was darkly said, and the mortar round its sides next morn seemed fresh and newly laid. But what within the narrow vault beneath that stone doth lie, or if that there be vault or no, I cannot tell, not I. But I've been told that moan and groan and fearful wail and shriek came from beneath that paving stone for nearly half a week. For three long days and three long nights came forth those sounds of fear, then all was o'er. They never more fell on the listening ear. 
A hundred years were gone and passed since last Nell Cook was seen. When worn by use, that stone got loose, and they went and told the dean. Says the dean, says he, my masons three, now haste and fix it tight. And the masons three peeped down to see, and they saw a fearsome sight. Beneath that heavy paving stone, a shocking hole they found. It was not more than twelve feet deep and barely twelve feet round. A fleshless, sapless skeleton lay in that horrid well, but who the deuce t'was put it there those masons could not tell. And near this fleshless skeleton a pitcher small did lie, and a mouldy piece of kissing crust, as from a warden pie. And Dr. Jones declared the bones were female bones, and zooks! I should not be surprised, said he, if these were Nellie Cook's. It was in good Dean Bargrave's days, if I remember right. Those fleshless bones beneath the stones, these masons brought to light. And you may well in the Dean's chapelle, Dean Bargrave's portrait view, who died one night, says old Tom Wright, in 1642. And so two hundred years have passed since that these masons three, with curious looks, did set Nell Cook's unquiet spirit free. That granite stone had kept her down till then, so some suppose. Some spread their fingers out and put their thumb unto their nose. But one thing's clear, that all the year on every Friday night, throughout that entry dark doth roam, Nell Cook's unquiet sprite. On Friday was that warden pie all by that cannon tried. On Friday died he, and that tidy lady by his side. And though two hundred years have flown, Nell Cook doth still pursue her weary walk, and they who cross her path the deed may rue. Her fatal breath is fell as death. The simoon's blast is not more dire, a wind in Africa that blows uncommon hot. But all unlike the simoon's blast, her breath is deadly cold, delivering quivering, shivering shocks unto both young and old. And whoso in that entry dark doth feel that fatal breath, he ever dies within the year some dire, untimely death. No matter who, no matter what condition, age, or sex, but some get shot, and some get drowned, and some get broken necks. Some get run over by a coach, and one beyond the seas got scraped to death with oyster shells among the Caribbees. Those masons three who set her free fell first. It is averred that two were hanged on Tyburn Tree for murdering of the third. Charles Story, too, his friend who slew, had ne'er, if truth they tell, been gibbeted on Chartham Downs, had they not met with Nell. Then send me not, mine uncle dear, oh, send me not, I pray, back through that entry dark to-night, but round some other way. I will not be a truant boy, but good, and mind my book, for heaven forfend that ever I foregather with Nell Cook." The class was called at morning tide, and Master Tom was there. He looked askew, and did eschew both stool and bench and chair. He did not talk, he did not walk, the tear was in his eye. He had not e'en that sad resource to sit him down and cry. Hence little boys may learn, when they from school go out to dine, they should not deal in rigmarole, but still be back by nine. For if when they've their great coat on, they pause before they part to tell a long and prosy tale, perchance their own may smart. Moral A few remarks to learned clerks in country and in town. Don't keep a pretty serving maid, though clad in russet brown. Don't let your niece sing bobbing Joan. Don't with a merry eye hobnob in sack and malvoisie. And don't eat too much pie. And oh, beware that entry dark, especially at night. And don't go there with Jenny Smith all by the pale moonlight. So bless the queen and her royal weans and the prince whose hand she took. And bless us all, both great and small. And keep us from Nell Cook. End of section 8. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois. April 20th, 2023. Section 9 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Ingoldsby Legends, second series, by Richard Harris Barham. Kind, good-hearted, gouty Uncle John, how well I remember all the kindness and affection which my mischievous propensities so ill repaid, his bright blue coat and resplendent gilt buttons, his frosty pow, si bien poudre, his little quill-like pigtail. Of all my praiseworthy actions, they were like angels' visits, few and far between, the never-failing and munificent rewarder. Of my naughty deeds, they were multitudinous as the sands on the seashore, the ever-ready palliator, my intercessor, and sometimes even my defender against punishment, staying harsh justice in its mid-career. Poor Uncle John, he will ever rank among the dearest of my nursery reminiscences. I remember, I remember, when I was a little boy, one fine morning in September, Uncle brought me home a toy. I remember how he patted both my cheeks in kindliest mood. Then, said he, you little fat head, there's a top because you're good. Grandmama, a shrewd observer, I remember gazed upon my new top and said with fervor, oh, how kind of Uncle John. While Mama, my form caressing, in her eye the teardrop stood, read me this fine moral lesson. See what comes of being good? I remember, I remember, on a wet and windy day, one cold morning in December, I stole out and went to play. I remember Billy Hawkins came, and with his pewter squirt, squibbed my pantaloons and stockings till they were all over dirt. To my mother for protection, I ran, quaking every limb, she exclaimed with fond affection, Goodness gracious, look at him! Pa cried when he saw my garment. T'was a newly purchased dress. Oh, you nasty little warmint! How came you in such a mess? Then he caught me by the collar, cruel only to be kind, and to my exceeding dollar gave me several slaps behind. Grandmama, while yet I smarted, as she saw my evil plight, said, was rather stony-hearted. Little rascal, sarve him right. I remember, I remember from that sad and solemn day, nevermore in dark December did I venture out to play. And the moral which they taught, I well remember, thus they said, little boys, when they are naughty, must be whipped and sent to bed. End of section 9, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 21st, 2023. Section 10 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Poor Uncle John, after life's fitful fever, he sleeps well in the old family vault in Denton Chancel, and dear Aunt Fanny, too, the latter also lewd me weel, as the Scotch song has it, and since, at this moment, I am in a most soft and sentimental humor, whiskey toddy should ever be made by pouring the boiling fluid, hotter if possible, upon the thinnest lemon peel, and then, but everyone knows what then, I dedicate the following true history to my beloved Aunt Fanny, a legend of a shirt. Virginibus Purisque Canto, Horace. Old maids and bachelors I chant to, T.I. I sing of a shirt that never was new in the course of the year 1802. Aunt Fanny began upon Grandmama's plan to make one for me then her dear little man. At the epoch I speak about, I was between a man and a boy, a hobbledehoy, a fat, little punchy concern of sixteen, just beginning to flirt, and ogle so pert. I'd been whipped every day, had I had my dessert, and Aunt Fan volunteered to make me a shirt. I've said she began it. Some unlucky planet no doubt interfered, for before she and Janet completed the cutting out, hemming, and stitching, a tall Irish footman appeared in the kitchen. This took off the maid, and I'm sadly afraid my respected Aunt Fanny's attention too strayed, for about the same period a gay son of Mars, Cornet Jones of the Tenth, 
than the prince's hussars. With his fine dark eyelashes and finer mustaches, and the ostrich plume worked on the corps' saber tashes. I say not of the gold and red cord of the sashes, or the boots far above the guard's vile spatter dashes. So eyed and so sighed and so lovingly tried to engage her whole ear as he lounged by her side, looking down on the rest with such dignified pride that she made up her mind she should certainly find Cornet Jones at her feet whispering, Fan, be my bride. She had even resolved to say yes, should he ask it, and I and my shirt were both left in the basket. To her grief and dismay, she discovered one day Cornet Jones of the Tenth was a little too gay, for besides that she saw him, he could not say nay, wink at one of the actresses capering away in a Spanish bolero one night at the play. She'd found he'd already a wife at Cambrai, one at Paris, a nymph of the Corps de Ballet, and a third down in Kent at a place called Foot's Cray. He was viler than dirt, Fanny vowed to exert all her powers to forget him and finish my shirt. But, oh, lackaday, how time slips away. Who'd have thought that while Cupid was playing these tricks, ten years had elapsed, and I'd turned twenty-six? I care not a whit, he's not grown a bit, says my aunt, it will still be a very good fit. So Janet and she, now about thirty-three, the maid had been jilted by Mr. McGee, each taking one end of the shirt on her knee, again began working with hearty good will, felling the seams and whipping the frill. For twenty years since, though the ruffle had vanished, a frill like a fan had by no means been banished. People wore them at playhouses, parties, and churches, like overgrown fins of overgrown perches. Now then, by these two thus laying their caps together, my shirt had been finished, perhaps. But for one of those queer little three-cornered straps, which the ladies call side bits that sever the flaps, here unlucky Janet took her needle and ran it right into her thumb and cried loudly, Ads cusset! I've spoiled myself now by that ear nasty gusset! For a month to come, poor dear Janet's thumb was in that sort of state vulgar people call rum. At the end of that time, a youth, still in his prime, the doctor's fat errand boy, just such a dolt as is kept to mix drafts and spread plasters and poultices, who a bread cataplasm each morning had carried her, sighed, ogled, proposed, was accepted, and married her. Much did Aunt Fan disapprove of the plan, she turned up her dear little snub at the man. She could not believe it, could scarcely conceive it. Was possible what? Such a place and then leave it? And all for a shrimp, not as high as my hat, a little contemptible shaver like that? With a broad pancake face and eyes buried in fat? For her part, she was sure she could never endure a lad with a lisp and a leg like a skewer. Such a name, too, twas pots, and so nasty a trade. No, no, she would much rather die an old maid. He a husband indeed? Well, mine, come what may come, shan't look like a blister or smell of guacam. But there, she declare, it was Janet's affair. Chacun a son goût, as she baked she might brew. She could not prevent her, twas no use in trying it. Oh, no, she had made her own bed and might lie in it. They repent at leisure who marry at random. No matter, de gustibus non disputantum. Consoling herself with this choice bit of Latin, Aunt Fanny resignedly bought some white satin. And as the soubrette was a very great pet after all, she resolved to forgive and forget, and sat down to make her a bridal rosette, with magnificent bits of some white-looking metal stuck in here and there, each forming a petal, on such an occasion one couldn't feel hurt, of course, that she ceased to remember my shirt. Ten years or nigh had again gone by, when Fan, accidentally casting her eye on a dirty old work basket hung up on high in the store closet, 
where herbs were put by to dry, took it down to explore it. She didn't know why. Within a pea soup colored fragment she spied, of the hue of a November fog in Cheapside, or a bad piece of gingerbread spoilt in the baking. I still hear her cry, I wish I may die, if here isn't Tom's shirt that's been so long a making. My gracious me, well, only to see, I declare it's as yellow as yellow can be. Why, it looks just as thought had been soaked in green tea. Dear me, did you ever? But come, twill be clever to bring matters round, so I'll do my endeavor. Better late, says an excellent proverb, than never. It is stained, to be sure, but grass bleaching will bring it to rights in a jiffy. We'll wash it and wring it, or stay. Hudson's liquor will do it still quicker, and, here the new maid chimed in, Ma'am, salt of lemon will make it in no time quite fit for the gemmin. So they set in the gathers, the large round the collar, while those at the wristbands, of course, were much smaller. The buttonholes now were at length overcast, then a button itself was sewn on, twas the last. All's done, all's won, never under the sun was shirt so late finished, so early begun. The work would defy the most critical eye. It was bleached, it was washed, it was hung out to dry. It was marked on the tail with a T and an I. On the back of a chair it was placed, just to air it, in front of the fire. Tom, tomorrow shall wear it. O oh, caca mens hominum, Fanny, good soul, left her charge for one moment but one. A vile coal bounced out from the grate and set fire to the hole. Had it been Dr. Arnott's new stove, not a grate, had the coal been a Lord Meyer's coal, namely a slate, what a different tale had I had to relate, and Aunt Fan and my shirt been superior to fate. One moment, no more, Fan opened the door. The draft made the blaze ten times worse than before, and Aunt Fanny sank down in despair on the floor. You may fancy, perhaps, Agrippina's amazement, when looking one fine moonlight night from her casement, she saw while thus gazing all Rome ablazing, and losing at once all restraint on her temper or feelings exclaimed, Hang that scamp of an emperor, although he's my son. He thinks it prime fun, no doubt. While the flames are demolishing Rome, there's my Nero a-fiddling and singing sweet home. Stay, I'm really not sure twas that lady who said the words I've put down as she stepped into bed. On reflection, I rather believe she was dead. But e'en when at college I fairly acknowledge, I never was very precise in chronology. So if there's an error, pray set down as mine, a mistake of no very great moment in fine, a mere slip, t'was some plebe's wife, if not Agrippina. You may fancy that warrior so stern and so stony, whom thirty years since we all used to call bony, when engaged in what he styled fulfilling his destinies, he led his rapscallions across the Borysthenes, and had made up his mind snug quarters to find in Moscow against the Katars and the Kofs, which are apt to prevail amongst the Auskies and Offs, at a time of the year when your nose and your ear are by no means so safe there as people's are here. Inasmuch as Jack Frost, that most fearful of boggles, makes folks leave their cartilage oft in their foggles, you may fancy, I say, that same bony's dismay when Count Rostopchin at once made him drop chin and turn up his eyes as his rapi he took with a sort of more de ma vie kind of look on perceiving that swing and all that sort of thing was at work, that he just lost the game without knowing it, that the Kremlin was blazing, the Russians a-going it, every plug in the place frozen hard as the ground and never a turncock at all to be found. You may fancy King Charles at some court fancy ball, the date we may fix in 1666, in the room built by Inigo Jones at Whitehall, whence his father the martyr, as such mourned by all, who in his wept the laws and the monarchy's fall, stepped out to exchange regal robes for a pall, you may fancy King Charles, I say, stopping the brawl as bursts on his sight the old church of St. Paul by the light of its flames now beginning to crawl from basement to buttress 
and topping its wall, you may fancy old Clarendon making a call and stating in cold, slow, monotonous drawl, Sire, from Pudding Lane's end, close by Fishmonger's Hall, to Pie Corner in Smithfield, there is not a stall there in market or street, not a house great or small, in which knight wields his falcon or cobbler his all, but's on fire. You may fancy the general squall and ball, as they all call for wimple and shawl. You may fancy all this, but I boldly assert, you can't fancy Aunt Fan as she looked on my shirt. Was Apelles or Zeuxis? I think twas Apelles. That artist of old, I declare I can't tell his exact patronymic. I write and pronounce ill these classical names, whom some Grecian town council employed, I believe, by command of the oracle, to produce them a splendid piece, purely historical, for adorning the wall of some fane or guild hall. And who for his subject determined to try a large painting in oils of Miss Iphigenia, at the moment her sire, by a special desire, of that spalpeen Odysseus, see Barney Maguire, has resolved to devote her beautiful throat to old Chalcus's knife and her limbs to the fire, an act which we moderns by no means admire, an offering, tis true, to Jove, Mars, or Apollo cost, no trifling sum in those days, if a holocaust. Still, although for economy we should condemn none, in an annex annex run, like the great Agamemnon, to give up the slaughter, an elegant daughter, after all the French music and dancing they taught her, and singing at heaven knows how much a quarter. In lieu of a calf, it was too bad by half, at a nigger so pitiful who would not laugh, and turn up their noses at one who could find no decenter method of raising the wind. No doubt, but he might, without any great flight, have obtained it by what we call flying a kite, or on mortgage, or sure, if he couldn't so do it, he must have succeeded by way of annuity. But there it appears, his crocodile tears, his o's and his ahs, his o laws and o dears, were all thought sincere, so in painting his victim, the artist was splendid, but could not depict him. His features and fizz awry showed so much misery, and so like a dragon he looked in his agony, that the foiled painter buried, despairing to gain a good likeness, his face in a printed bandana. Such a veil is best thrown o'er one's face when one's hurt, by some grief which no power can repair or avert. Such a veil I shall throw o'er Aunt Fan and my shirt. Moral. And now for some practical hints from the story of Aunt Fan's mishap, which I've thus laid before ye. For if rather too gay, I can venture to say, a fine vein of morality is in each lay of my primitive muse the distinguishing trait. First of all, don't put off till tomorrow what may, without inconvenience, be managed today. That golden occasion we call opportunity rarely is neglected by man with impunity. And the future, how brightly so e'er by hope's dupe colored, ne'er may afford you a lost chance restored till both you and your shirt are grown old and pea-soup colored. I would also desire you to guard your attire, young ladies, and never go too near the fire. Depend on't, there's many a dear little soul has found that a spark is as bad as a coal, and in her best petticoat burnt a great hole. Last of all, gentle reader, don't be too secure. Let seeming success never make you cocksure, but beware and take care when all things look fair, how you hang your shirt over the back of your chair. There's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. Be this excellent proverb then well understood, and don't halloo before you're quite out of the wood. End of section 10, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 22, 2023. Section 11 of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Noreen. The Ingoldsby Legends, second series by Richard Harris Barham. It is to my excellent and erudite friend Simpkinson that I am indebted for his graphic description of the well-known chalk pit between Ackle and Minster in the Isle of Thanet, known by the name of the Smuggler's Leap. The substance of the true history attached to it he picked up while visiting that admirable institution, the Sea Bathing Infirmary, of which he is a life governor, and enjoying his Osium Cum Dignitate, last summer at the least aristocratic of all possible watering places. Before I proceed to detail it, however, I cannot, in conscience, fail to bespeak for him the reader's sympathy in one of his own misadventures at Margate, a legend of Jarvis's jetty. Mr. Simpkinson, Locator. T'was in Margate last July I walked upon the pier, I saw a little vulgar boy. I said, What make you here? The gloom upon your youthful cheek speaks anything but joy. Again I said, What make you here, you little vulgar boy? He frowned, that little vulgar boy. He deemed I meant to scoff. And when the little heart is big, a little sets it off. He put his finger in his mouth. His little bosom rose. He had no little handkerchief to wipe his little nose. Hark! "'Don't you hear, my little man? It's striking nine, I said. "'An hour when all good little boys and girls should be in bed. "'Run home and get your supper, else your ma will scold. "'Oh, fie! It's very wrong indeed for little boys to stand and cry.' "'The teardrop in his little eye again began to spring. "'His bosom throbbed with agony. He cried like anything. "'I stooped, and thus, amidst his sobs, I heard him murmur, "'Ah! I haven't got no supper, and I haven't got no ma. My father, he is on the seas, my mother's dead and gone, and I am here on this here pier to roam the world alone. I have not had this live-long day one drop to cheer my heart, nor brown to buy a bit of bread with, let alone a tart. If there's a soul will give me food or find me in employ, by day or night, then blow me tight. He was a vulgar boy. And now I'm here, from this here pier, it is my fixed intent to jump as Master Levi did from off the monument. Cheer up, cheer up, my little man. Cheer up, I kindly said. You are a naughty boy to take such things into your head. If you should jump from off the pier, you'd surely break your legs, perhaps your neck. Then bogeyed have you, sure as eggs are eggs. Come home with me, my little man, come home with me and sup. My landlady is Mrs. Jones, we must not keep her up. There's roast potatoes at the fire, enough for me and you. Come home, you little vulgar boy, I lodge at number two. I took him home to number two, the house beside the foy. I bade him wipe his dirty shoes, that little vulgar boy. And then I said to Mistress Jones, the kindest of her sex, Pray be so good as go and fetch a pint of double X. But Mrs. Jones was rather cross. She made a little noise. She said she did not like to wait on little vulgar boys. She, with her apron, wiped the plates, and, as she rubbed the delf, said I might go to Jericho and fetch my beer myself. I did not go to Jericho. I went to Mr. Cobb. I changed a shilling, which in town the people call a bob. It was not so much for myself as for that vulgar child, and I said, A pint of double X, and please to draw it mild. When I came back, I gazed about. I gazed on stool and chair. I could not see my little friend, because he was not there. I peeped beneath the tablecloth, beneath the sofa too. I said, You little vulgar boy, why, what's become of you? I could not see my tablespoons. I looked, but could not see. The little fiddle-patterned ones I use when I'm at tea. I could not see my sugar-tongs, my silver watch. Oh, dear! I know it was on the mantelpiece when I went out for beer. I could not see my mackintosh. It was not to be seen. Nor yet my best white beaver hat, broad-brimmed and lined with green. My carpet-bag, my cruet-stand that holds my sauce and soy, 
my roast potatoes all are gone and so's that vulgar boy i rang the bell for mrs jones for she was down below oh mrs jones what do you think ain't this a pretty go that horrid little vulgar boy whom i brought here to-night he's stolen my things and run away says she and serve you right next morning i was up betimes i sent the cry around all with his bell and gold-laced hat to say i'd give a pound to find that little vulgar boy who'd gone and used me so but when the crier cried oh yes the people cried oh no i went to jarvis's landing-place the glory of the town there was a common sailor man a walking up and down i told my tale he seemed to think i'd not been treated well and called me poor old buffer what that means i cannot tell that sailor man he said he'd seen that morning on the shore a son of something twas a name i'd never heard before a little gallows lucky chap dear me what could he mean with a carpet swab and mucking togs and a hat turned up with green he spoke about his precious eyes and said he'd seen him sheer it's very odd that sailor men should talk so very queer and then he hitched his trousers up as is i'm told their use it's very odd that sailor men should wear those things so loose i did not understand him well but think he meant to say he'd seen that little vulgar boy that morning swim away in captain large's royal george about an hour before and they were now as he supposed somewheres about the north a landsman said i twig the chap he's been upon the mill and cause he gammons so the flats ve calls him veepin bill he said he'd done me worry brown and nicely stowed the swag that's french i fancy for a hat or else a carpet bag i went and told the constable my property to track he asked me if i did not wish that i might get it back i answered to be sure i do is what i'm come about he smiled and said sir does your mother know that you are out not knowing what to do i thought i'd hasten back to town and beg our own lord mayor to catch the boy who'd done me brown his lordship very kindly said he'd try and find him out but he rather thought that there were several vulgar boys about he sent for mr wither then and i described the swag my mackintosh my sugar tongs my spoons and carpet bag he promised that the new police should all their powers employ but never to this hour have i beheld that vulgar boy moral remember then what when a boy i've heard my grandma tell be warned in time by others harm and you shall do full well don't link yourself with vulgar folks who've got no fixed abode tell lies use naughty words and say they wish they may be blowed don't take too much of double x and don't at night go out to fetch your beer yourself but make the pot boy bring your stout and when you go to margate next just stop and ring the bell give my respects to mrs jones and say i'm pretty well End of section 11section 12 of the ingoldsby legend second series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the ingoldsby legends second series by richard harris barham and now for his legend which if the facts took place rather beyond the memory of the oldest inhabitant are yet well known to have occurred in the neighborhood once on a time and the scene of them will be readily pointed out by any one of the fifty intelligent fly drivers who ply upon the pier and who will convey you safely to the spot for a garden which they term three bob the smuggler's leap a legend of thanet near this hamlet acole is a long disused chalk pit of formidable depth known by the name of the smuggler's leap the tradition of the parish runs that a writing officer from sandwich called anthony gill lost his life here in the early part of the present last century while in pursuit of a smuggler a fog coming on both parties went over the precipice 
The smuggler's horse only, it is said, was found crushed beneath its rider. The spot has, of course, been haunted ever since. See Supplement to Lewis's History of Thanet by the Reverend Samuel Peggy, A.M., Vicar of Gomersham, West Bristow, Canterbury, 1796, page 127. The fire flash shines from Reculver Cliff, and the answering light burns blue in the skiff. And there they stand, that smuggling band, some in the water and some on the sand, ready those contraband goods to land. The night is dark, they are silent and still. At the head of the party is Smuggler Bill. Now lower away, come, lower away. We must be far ere the dawn of the day. If Exciseman Gill should get scent of the prey and should come and should catch us here, what would he say? Come lower away, lads, once on the hill. We'll laugh ho-ho at Exciseman Gill. The car goes lowered from the dark skiff's side and the tow-line drags the tubs through the tide. No flick nor flam, but your real sky-dam. Now mount, my merry men, mount and ride. Three on the crupper and one before, and the lead horse laden with five tubs more. But the rich point lace in the oilskin case, of proof to guard its contents from ill, the prime of the swag is with smuggler Bill. Merrily now in a goodly row, away and away those smugglers go, and they laugh at exciseman Gill, ho, ho! When out from the turn of the road to Hearn comes Gill, wide awake to the whole concern. Exciseman Gill, in all his pride, with his custom house officers all at his side. They were called custom house officers then. There were no such things as preventive men. Sauf qui peut, that lawless crew, away and away and away they flew. Some dropping one tub, some dropping two, some gallop this way and some gallop that, through Fordwich Level or Sandwich Flat, some fly that way and some fly this, like a covey of birds when the sportsmen miss. These in their hurry make for stirry, with Custom House officers close in their rear, down Rushbourne Lane, and so by Westbeer, none of them stopping, but shooting and popping, and many a Custom House bullet go slap through many a three-gallon tub like a tap, and the gin spurts out and squirts all about, and many a heart grew sad that day, that so much good liquor was thrown away. Sauf qui peut, that lawless crew, away and away and away they flew. Some seek Whistable, some grow fairy, spurring and whipping like madmen vary. For the life, for the life, they ride, they ride, and the custom house officers all divide, and they gallop on after them far and wide. All, all save one, exciseman Gill, he sticks to the skirts of Smuggler Bill. Smuggler Bill is six feet high. He has curling locks and a roving eye. He has a tongue and he has a smile, train the female heart to beguile. And there's not a farmer's wife in the aisle from St. Nicholas quite to the foreland light, but that eye and that tongue and that smile will wheedle her to have done with a grocer and make him her tea dealer. There is not a farmer there, but he still buys gin and tobacco from Smuggler Bill. Smuggler Bill rides gallant and gay on his dapple gray mare away and away, and he pats her neck, and he seems to say, Follow who will, ride after who may. In sooth he had need, fodder his steed, in lieu of lent corn with a quicksilver feed. Nor oats, nor beans, nor the best of old hay will make him a match for my own dapple gray. Ho, 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 says Smuggler Bill. He draws out his flask, and he sips his fill, and he laughs ho-ho at Exciseman Gill. Down Chrislet Lane, so free and so fleet, right Smuggler Bill and away to Up Street. Sar Bridge is won. Bill thinks it fun. Ho-ho, the old tub-gouging son of a gun. His wind will be thick, and his breeks be thin, ere a race like this he may hope to win. Away, away goes the fleet dapple gray, fresh as the breeze and free as the wind, and Exciseman Gill lags far behind. I would give my soul, quoth Exciseman Gill, for a nag that would catch that smuggler Bill. No matter for blood, no matter for bone, no matter for color, bay, brown, or roan. So I had but one, a voice cried, Done! A done, said Exciseman Gill, and he spied a custom house officer close by his side on a high-trotting horse with a dun-colored hide. Devil take me, again, quoth Exciseman Gill. If I had but that horse, I'd have Smuggler Bill. 
From his using such shocking expressions, it's plain that Exciseman Gill was rather profane. He was, it is true, as bad as a Jew, a sad old scoundrel as ever you knew. And he rode in his stirrup sixteen stone two. He just uttered the words which I've mentioned to you when his horse, coming slap on his knees with him, threw him head over heels, and away he flew, and Exciseman Gill was bruised black and blue. When he arose, his hands and his clothes were as filthy as could be. He pitched on his nose and rolled over and over again in the mud, and his nose and his chin were all covered with blood. Yet he screamed with passion, I'd rather grill than not come up with that smuggler bill. Mount, mount, quoth the custom house officer. Get on the back of my dun, you'll bother him yet. Your words are plain, though they're somewhat rough. Done and done between gentlemen's always enough. I'll lend you a lift. There, you're up on him so. He's a rum one to look at, a devil to go. Exciseman Gill dashed up the hill, and marked not, so eager was he in pursuit, the queer custom house officer's queer looking boot. Smuggler Bill rides on a mane. He slacks not girth, and he draws not rein. Yet the dapple gray mare bounds on in vain, for nearer now, and he hears it plain, sounds the tramp of a horse. Tis the gouger again. Smuggler Bill dashes round by the mill that stands near the road upon Moncton Hill. Now speed, now speed, my dapple gray steed. Thou ever, my dapple, wert good at need. Or Moncton Mead and through Minster level will baffle him yet, be he gouger or devil. For Manston Cave, away, away. Now speed thee, now speed thee, my good dapple gray. It shall never be said that Smuggler Bill was run down like a hare by Exciseman Gill. Manston Cave was Bill's abode, a mile to the north of the Ramsgate Road. Of late, they say, it's been taken away, that is leveled and filled up with chalk and clay by a gentleman there of the name of Day. Thither he urges his good dapple gray, and the dapple gray steed, still good at need, though her chest it pants and her flanks they bleed, dashes along at the top of her speed. But nearer and nearer Exciseman Gill cries, Yield thee, now yield thee, thou smuggler Bill. Smuggler Bill, he looks behind, and he sees a dun horse come swift as the wind. And his nostrils smoke, and his eyes they blaze, like a couple of lamps on a yellow post-chaise. Every shoe he has got appears red-hot, and sparks round his ears snap, crackle, and play, and his tail cocks up in a very odd way. Every hair in his mane seems a porcupine's quill, and there on his back sits Exciseman Gill, crying, Yield thee, now yield thee, thou smuggler Bill. Smuggler Bill from his holster drew a large horse pistol of which he had two. Made by knock, he pulled back the cock as far as he could to the back of the lock. The trigger he touched, and the welkin rang to the sound of the weapon. It made such a bang. Smuggler Bill, he ne'er missed his aim. The shot told true on the dun, but there came from the hole where it entered not blood, but flame. He changed his plan and fired at the man, but his second horse pistol flashed in the pan, and Exciseman Gill, with a hearty good will, made a grab at the collar of Smuggler Bill. The dapple gray mare made a desperate bound when that queer dun horse on her flank she found. Alack and alas! On what dangerous ground! It's enough to make one's flesh to creep, to stand on that fearful verge and peep down the rugged side so dreadfully steep, where the chalk hole yawns full sixty feet deep, or which that steed took that desperate leap. It was so dark then under the trees, no horse in the world could tell chalk from cheese. Down they went, or that terrible fall, horses, excisemen, smuggler, and all. Below were found, next day on the ground, by an elderly gentleman walking his round. I wouldn't have seen such a sight for a pound. All smashed and dashed, three mangled courses, two of them human, the third was a horse's. That good dapple gray and exciseman gill, yet grasping the collar of smuggler Bill. But where was the dun, that terrible dun? From that terrible night he was seen by none. There are some people think, though I am not one, that part of the story, all nonsense and fun, but the country folks there, one and all, declare, when the crowner's quest came to sit on the pair, they heard a loud horse laugh up in the air. 
If in one of the trips of the steamboat Eclipse, you should go down to Margate to look at the ships or to take what the bathing room people call dips, you may hear old folks talk of that quarry of chalk or go over, it's rather too far for a walk, but a three-shilling drive will give you a peep at that fearful chalk pit so awfully deep, which is called to this moment the smuggler's leap. Nay more, I am told, on a moonshiny night, if you're plucky and not over-subject to fright, and go and look over that chalk pit white, you may see, if you will, the ghost of old Gill grappling the ghost of Smuggler Bill, and the ghost of the dapple gray lying between em. I'm told so. I can't say I know one who's seen em. Moral. And now, gentle reader, one word ere we part. Just take a friend's counsel and lay it to heart. Imprimis, don't smuggle. If bent to please beauty, you must buy French lace. Purchase what is paid duty. Don't use naughty words in the next place, and ne'er in your language adopt a bad habit of swearing. Never say, devil take me, or shake me, or bake me, or such like expressions. Remember old Nick, to take folks at their word is remarkably quick. Another sound maxim I'd wish you to keep is mind what you're after, and look ere you leap. Above all, to my last gravest caution attend, Never borrow a horse you don't know of a friend. End of section 12, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 4th, 2023. Section 13 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. For the story which succeeds, I am indebted to Mrs. Botherby. She is a Shropshire lady by birth, and I overheard her a few weeks since, in the nursery, chanting the following, one of the legends peculiar to her native county, for the amusement and information of Seaforth's little boy, who was indeed all ears. As Ralph de Dicetto, who alludes to the main facts, was dean of St. Paul's in 1183, about the time that the temple church was consecrated, the history is evidently as ancient as it is authentic, though the author of the present paraphrase has introduced many unauthorized as well as anachronismatical interpolations. For the interesting note on the ancient family of Ketch, I need scarcely say, I am obliged to the Simkinson. Bloody Jack of Shrewsbury, the Shropshire Bluebeard, a legend of the proud Salopians. Ishe fere temporibus in agro salopiensi, quidam qui nomen Johannes, le sanglant, dendi nuncupatus uxores quam plurimas ducit, encat et ita referunt manducat, asa salum cani mirae magnitudinis relinquens, tum demum in flagrante delicto bel manu rubra ut dicunt juris consulti de prensus carnifice vix oprimatur, Radulfus de dicetto. Oh, why doth thine eye gleam so bright, bloody Jack? Oh, why doth thine eye gleam so bright? The mother's at home, the maid may not roam. She never will meet thee tonight by the light of the moon. It's impossible, quite. Yet thine eye is still brilliant and bright, bloody Jack. It gleams with a fiendish delight. Tis done, she is won. Nothing under the sun can loose the charmed ring, though it's slight. Ho, ho, it fits so remarkably tight. The wire is as thin as a thread, Bloody Jack. The wire is as thin as a thread. Though slight be the chain, again might and main, cannot rend it in twain. She is wed, she is wed. She is mine, be she living or dead. Ha, ha. Nay, laugh not, I pray thee, so loud, Bloody Jack. Oh, laugh not so loud and so clear. Though sweet is thy smile, the heart to beguile, yet thy laugh is quite shocking to hear. Oh, dear, it makes the blood curdle with fear. The maiden is gone by the glen, Bloody Jack. She is gone by the glen and the wood. It's a very odd thing she should wear such a ring, while her tresses are bound with a snood by the rood. 
It's a thing that's not well understood. The maiden is stately and tall, Bloody Jack, and stately she walks in her pride. But the young Mary Anne runs as fast as she can to o'ertake her and walk by her side, though she chide, she deems not her sister a bride. But the maiden is gone by the glen, Bloody Jack. Mary Anne, she is gone by the lee. She o'ertakes not her sister. It's clear she has missed her and cannot think where she can be. Dear me, ho, ho, we shall see, we shall see. Mary Anne is gone over the lee, Bloody Jack. Mary Anne, she is come to the tower. But it makes her heart quail, for it looks like a jail, a deal more than a fair lady's bower, so sour. Its ugly gray walls seem to lower. For the barbican's massy and high, Bloody Jack, and the oak door is heavy and brown, and with iron it's plated and machicolated to pour boiling oil and lead down. How you'd frown should a ladleful fall on your crown. The rock that it stands on is steep, Bloody Jack, to gain it one's forced for to creep. The portcullis is strong and the drawbridge is long, and the water runs all round the keep at a peep. You can see that the moat's very deep. The drawbridge is long, but it's down, Bloody Jack, and the portcullis hangs in the air, and no warder is near with his horn and his spear to give notice when people come there. I declare Mary Anne has run into the square. The oak door is heavy and brown, Bloody Jack, but the oak door is standing ajar, and no one is there to say, Pray, take a chair. You seem tired, miss, with running so far, so you are, with grown people, you're scarce on a par. But the young Mary Ann is not tired, Bloody Jack. She roams o'er your tower by herself. She runs through very soon each boudoir and saloon and examines each closet and shelf, your pelf, all your plate and your china and delf. She looks at your heiress so fine, Bloody Jack, so rich all description it mocks, and she now and then pauses to gaze at the vases, your pictures and ormolu clocks, every box, every cupboard and drawer she unlocks. She looks at the paintings so rare, Bloody Jack, that adorn every wall in your house, your impayable pieces, your Paul Veronese's, your Rembrandt's, your Guido's and Dow's, Moreland's cows, Claude's landscapes and Lancier's bow-wows. She looks at your statue so fine, Bloody Jack, and mighty great notice she takes of your Niobe crying, your Mirmillo dying, your Hercules strangling the snakes, how he shakes the nasty great things as he wakes. Your Laocoon, his serpents and boys, Bloody Jack, she views with some little dismay. A copy of that I can see in the Vatican, unless the Pope sent it away, as they say, in the globe he intended last May. There's your Belvedere Phoebus, with which, Bloody Jack, Mr. Millman says none other vies. His lines on Apollo beat all the rest hollow and gained him the Newdigate prize. How the eyes seem watching the shaft as it flies. There's a room full of satins and silks, Bloody Jack. There's a room full of velvets and lace. There are drawers full of rings and a thousand fine things. And a splendid gold watch with a case or its face is in every room in the place. There are forty fine rooms on a floor, Bloody Jack, and every room fit for a ball. It's so gorgeous and rich, with so lofty a pitch, and so long and so broad and so tall. Yes, all save the last one, and that's very small. It boasts not stool, table, or chair, Bloody Jack, but one cabinet, costly and grand, which has little gold figures of little gold niggers, with fishing rods stuck in each hand, it's japanned, and it's placed on a splendid bull stand. Its hinges and clasps are of gold, Bloody Jack, and of gold are its keyhole and key, and the drawers within have each a gold pin, and they're numbered with one, two, and three, you may see, all the figures in gold filigree. Number one's full of emeralds green, Bloody Jack. Number two's full of diamonds and pearl, but what does she see in drawer number three that makes all her senses to whirl? Poor girl, and each lock of her hair to uncurl? Wedding fingers are sweet, pretty things, Bloody Jack. To salute them one eagerly strives. When one kneels to propose, it's another quelque chose. 
when cut off at the knuckles with knives, from our wives, they are tied up in bunches of fives. Yet there they lie, one, two, three, four, Bloody Jack. There lie they, five, six, seven, eight. And by them in rows lie eight little great toes, to match in size, color, and weight. From their state it would seem they'd been severed of late. Beside them are eight wedding rings, Bloody Jack, and the gold is as thin as a thread. Ho, ho, she is mine. This will make up the nine. Dear me, who those shocking words said? She fled to hide herself under the bed. But alas, there's no bed in the room, Bloody Jack, and she peeps from the window on high. Only fancy her fright and the terrible sight down below which at once meets her eye. Oh, my, she half uttered but stifled her cry. "'for she saw it was you and your man, Bloody Jack, "'and she heard your unpleasant ha-ha "'while her sister stone dead by the hair of her head "'or the bridge you were trying to draw "'as she saw a thing quite contrary to law. "'Your man has got hold of her heels, Bloody Jack. "'Bloody Jack, you've got hold of her hair. "'But nor Jack nor his man can see young Mary Ann. "'She has hid herself under the stair, "'and there is a horrid great dog, I declare.' His eyeballs are bloodshot and blear, Bloody Jack. He's a sad, ugly cur for a pet. He seems of the breed of that Billy, indeed, who used to kill rats for a bet. I forget how many one morning he ate. He has skulls, ribs, and vertebrae there, Bloody Jack, and thigh bones, and though it's so dim, yet it's plain to be seen, he has picked them quite clean. She expects to be torn limb from limb, so grim, he looks at her and she looks at him. She has given him a bun and a roll, Bloody Jack. She has given him a roll and a bun and a shrewsbury cake of Palin's own make, which she happened to take ere her run she begun. She'd been used to a luncheon at one. It's a pretty particular fix, Bloody Jack. Above there's the maiden that's dead. Below, growling at her, there's that cannibal cur who at present is munching her bread instead of her leg or her arm or her head. It's a pretty particular fix, Bloody Jack. She is caught like a mouse in a trap. Stay, there's something, I think, that has slipped through a chink and fallen by a singular hap slap into poor little Mary Ann's lap. It's a very fine little gold ring, Bloody Jack, yet though slight, it's remarkably stout. But it's made a sad stain, which will always remain on her frock, for blood will not wash out. I doubt salts of lemon won't bring it about. She has grasped that gold ring in her hand, Bloody Jack. In an instant she stands on the floor. She makes but one bound, or the back of the hound, and a hop, skip, and jump to the door, and she's o'er the drawbridge she traversed before. Her hair's floating loose in the breeze, Bloody Jack, for gone is her bonnet of blue. Now the barbican's past, her legs go it as fast as two drumsticks a beating tattoo, as they do at Reveille Parade or Review. She has run into Shrewsbury Town, Bloody Jack. She has called out the Beadle and Mayor, and the Justice of Peace, and the Rural Police, till Battlefield swarms like a fair, and see there, e'en the Parsons beginning to swear. There's a pretty to-do in your tower, Bloody Jack. In your tower there's a pretty to-do, all the people of Shrewsbury playing old gooseberry with you choice bits of taste and virtu. Each bijou is upset in their search after you. They are playing the deuce with your things, Bloody Jack. There's your cupid is broken in two. And so to between us is each of your Venuses, the antique ones you bought of the Jew and the new one George Robin swears came from St. Cloud. The Califiges injured behind, Bloody Jack, the Demichis injured before, and the Anna Domines injured in so many places, I think there's a score, if not more, of her fingers and toes on the floor. They are hunting you upstairs and down, Bloody Jack. Every person to pass is forbid, while they turn out the closets and all their deposits. There's the dust hole, come lift up the lid. So they did, but they could not find where you were hid. Ah, ah, they will have you at last, Bloody Jack. The chimneys to search they begin. They have found you at last. There you are sticking fast, with your knees doubled up to your chin. Though you're thin, dear me, what a mess you are in. 
What a terrible pickle you're in, Bloody Jack. Why, your face is as black as your hat. Your fine Holland shirt is all over dirt, and so is your point lace cravat. What a flat to seek such an asylum as that. They can scarcely help laughing, I vow, Bloody Jack. In the midst of their turmoil and strife, you're not fit to be seen. You look like Mr. Keen in the play where he murders his wife. On my life, you ought to be scraped with a knife. They have pulled you down flat on your back, Bloody Jack. They have pulled you down flat on your back. And they smack and they thwack till your funny bones crack, as if you were stretched on the rack at each thwack. Good lack, what a savage attack. They call for the Parliament man, Bloody Jack, and the hangman, the matter to clinch. And they call for the judge, but others cry, Fudge! Don't budge Mr. Calcraft an inch. Mr. Lynch will do very well at a pinch. It is useless to scuffle and cuff, Bloody Jack. It is useless to struggle and bite, and to kick and to scratch you have met with your match, and the Shrewsbury boys hold you tight despite your determined attempts to show fight. They are pulling you all sorts of ways, Bloody Jack. They are twisting your right leg nor west, and your left leg due south, and your knees in your mouth, and your head is poked down on your breast, and it's pressed, I protest, almost into your chest. They have pulled off your arms and your legs, Bloody Jack, as the naughty boys serve the blue flies, and they've torn from their sockets and put in their pockets your fingers and thumbs for a prize, and your eyes a doctor has bottled from guise. Your trunk thus dismembered and torn, Bloody Jack, they hew and they hack and they chop, and to finish the whole, they stick up a pole in the place that's still called the wold cop, and they pop your grim gory head on the top. They have buried the fingers and toes, Bloody Jack, of the victim so lately your prey. From those fingers and a toes sprang early potatoes, Ladies' fingers they're called to this day, so they say, and you usually dig them in May. What became of the dear little girl, Bloody Jack? What became of the young Mary Ann? Why, I'm sadly afraid that she died an old maid, for she fancied that every young man had a plan to trepan her like poor sister Fan. So they say she is now leading apes, Bloody Jack, and men's bachelor's small clothes below, the story is old and has often been told, but I cannot believe it is so. No, no, depend on it, the tale is no go. Moral And now for the moral I'd fain, Bloody Jack, that young ladies should draw from my pen. It's don't take these flights upon moonshiny nights with gay harum scarum young men down a glen. You really can't trust one in ten. Let them think of your terrible tower, Bloody Jack, and don't let them liberties take, whether maidens or spouses in bachelors' houses, or some time or another they'll make a mistake and lose more than a Shrewsbury cake. End of section 13, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 5, 2023. Section 14 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Her niece, of whom I have before made honorable mention, is not a whit behind Mrs. Botherby in furnishing entertainment for the young folks, if little Charles has the aunt to so fall him into slumber, Miss Jenny is equally fortunate in the possession of a Sappho of her own. It is to the air of drops of brandy that Patty has adapted her version of a venerable ditty, which we've all listened to with respect and affection, under its old title of The Babes in the Wood, or The Norfolk Tragedy, an old song to a new tune. When we were all little and good, a long time ago, I'm afraid, miss, we were told of the babes in the wood, by their false cruel uncle betrayed, miss. Their pa was a squire or a knight, in Norfolk, I think his estate lay, that is, if I recollect right, for I've not read the history lately. Rumpty diddly dumpty doo 
their ma and their pa being seized with a tiresome complaint which in some seasons people are apt to be seized with who are not on their guard against plum seasons their medical man shook his head as he could not well get to the root of it and the babes stood on each side of the bed while their uncle he stood at the foot of it oh brother their ma whispered faint and low for breath seeming to labour who'd think that this horrid complaint that's been going about in the neighbourhood thus should attack me nay more my poor husband besides and so fall on him bring us so near to death's door that we can't avoid making a call on him now think tis your sister invokes your aid and the last word she says is be kind to those dear little folks when our toes are turned up to the daisies by the servants don't let them be snubbed let jane have her fruit and her custard and mind johnny's chilblains are rubbed well with whitehead's best essence of mustard you know they'll be pretty well off in respect to what's called worldly gear for john when his pa's in his coffin comes in to three hundred a year and jane's to have five hundred pound on her marriage paid down every penny so you'll own a worse match might be found any day in the week than our jenny here the uncle pretended to cry and like an old thorough-paced rogue he put his handkerchief up to his eye and devoted himself to old bogey if he did not make matters all right and said should he covet their riches he wished the old gentleman might fly away with him body and breeches no sooner however were they put to bed with a spade by the sexton than he carried the darlings away out of that parish into the next one giving out he should take them to town and select the best school in the nation that john might not grow up a clown but receive a genteel education greek and latin old twaddle i call says he while his mind's ductile and plastic i'll place him at dotheboys hall where he'll learn all that's new and gymnastic while jane as when girls have the dumps fortune hunters by scores to entrap em rise shall go to those worthy old frumps the two misses tickler of clapham rise having thought on the how and the when to get rid of his nephew and niece he sent for two ill-looking men and he gave them five guineas apiece says he each of you take up a child on the crupper and when you have trotted some miles through that wood lone and wild take your knife out and cut its carotid done and done is pronounced on each side while the poor little dears are delighted to think they a cock-horse shall ride and are not in the least degree frighted they say their ta ta as they start and they prattle so nice on their journey that the rogues themselves wish to their heart they could finish the job by attorney nay one was so taken aback by seeing such spirit and life in them that he fairly exclaimed i say jack i'm blowed if i can put a knife in them poof says his pal you great dunce you've pouched the good gentleman's money so out with your winger at once and scrag jane while i spifflicate johnny he refused and harsh language ensued which ended at length in a duel when he that was mildest in mood gave the truculent rascal his gruel the babes quake with hunger and fear while the ruffian his dead comrade jack buries then he cries loves amuse yourselves here with the hips and the haws and the blackberries i'll be back in a couple of shakes so don't dears be quivering and quaking i'm going to get you some cakes and a nice buttered roll that's a-baking he rode off with a tear in his eye which ran down his rough cheek and wet it as he said to himself with a sigh pretty souls don't they wish they may get it from that moment the babes ne'er caught sight of the wretch who thus wrought their undoing but passed all that day and that night in wandering about and boo-hooing the night proved cold dreary and dark so that worn out with sighings and sobbings next morn they were found stiff and stark and stone dead by two little cock robins these two little birds it sore grieves to see what so cruel a dodge i call they cover the bodies with leaves an interment quite ornithological it might more expensive have been but i doubt though i've not been to see em if among those in all kensal green you could find a more neat mausoleum now whatever your rogues may suppose conscience always makes restless their pillows 
and just as the blind has a nose that sniffs out all concealed peccadilloes, the wicked old uncle, they say, in spite of his riot and revel, was hippish and qualmish all day, and dreamt all night long of the devil. He grew gouty, dyspeptic, and sour, and his brow, once so smooth and so placid, fresh wrinkles acquired every hour, and whatever he swallowed turned acid. The neighbors thought all was not right, scarcely one with him ventured to parley, and Captain Swing came in the night, and burned all his beans and his barley. There was hardly a day but some fox ran away with his geese and his ganders, his wheat had the mildew, his flocks took the rot, and his horses the glanders. His daughters drank rum in their tea, his son, who had gone for a sailor, went down in a steamer at sea, and his wife ran away with the tailor. It was clear he lay under a curse. None would hold him with any communion. Every day matters grew worse and worse, till they ended at length in the union while his man being caught in some fact, the particular crime I've forgotten, when he came to be hanged for the act, split and told the whole story to Cotton. Understanding the matter was blown, his employer became apprehensive of what, when t'was more fully known, might ensue. He grew thoughtful and pensive. He purchased some sugar of lead, took it home, popped it into his porridge, ate it up and then took to his bed, and so died in the workhouse at Norwich. Moral. Ponder well now, dear parents, each word that I've wrote, and when serious rages in the dog days, don't be so absurd as to blow yourself out with green gauges. Of stone fruits in general be shy, and reflect it's a fact beyond question that grapes, when they're spelt with an I, promote anything else but digestion. When you set about making your will, which is commonly done when a body's ill, mind, and word it with caution and skill, and avoid, if you can, any codicil, when once you've appointed an heir to the fortune you've made or obtained, ere you leave a reversion, beware whom you place in contingent remainder. Executors, guardians, and all who have children to mind, don't ill-treat them, nor think that because they're small and weak you may beat them and cheat them. Remember that ill-gotten goods never thrive, their possessions but cursory, so never turn out in the woods little folks you should keep in the nursery. Be sure he who does such base things will ne'er stifle conscience's clamour, his riches will make themselves wings, and his property come to the hammer. Then he, and not those he bereaves, will have most cause for sighings and sobbings, when he finds himself smothered with leaves of fat catalogues, heaped up by robins. Rum de diddle dum de dee. End of section fourteen. Lilted by Sandra. Section fifteen of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. The incidents recorded in the succeeding legend were communicated to a dear friend of our family by the late lamented Sir Walter Scott. The names and localities have been scrupulously retained, as she is ready to testify. The proceedings in this case are, I believe, recorded in some of our law reports, though I have never been able to lay my hand upon them. The Dead Drummer a LEGEND OF SALISBURY PLAIN Oh, Salisbury Plain is bleak and bare, At least so I've heard many people declare, For I fairly confess I never was there. Not a shrub, nor a tree, nor a bush can you see, No hedges, no ditches, no gates, no stiles, Much less a house, or a cottage for miles. It's a very sad thing to be caught in the rain When night's coming on upon Salisbury Plain. Now I'd have you to know that a great while ago, the best part of a century may be or so, across this same plain, so dull and so dreary, a couple of travelers, way-worn and weary, were making their way, their profession, you'd say, at a single glance did not admit of a query. The pump-handled pigtail and whiskers worn then, with scarce an exception by seafaring men, the jacket, the loose trousers, bowsed up together all, guiltless of braces, as those of Charles Weatherall. The pigeon-toed step and the rollicking motion bespoke them two genuine sons of the ocean. 
and showed in a moment their real characters, the accent so placed on this word by our jactars. The one in advance was sturdy and strong, with arms uncommonly bony and long, and his Guernsey shirt was all pitch and dirt, which sailors don't think inconvenient or wrong. He was very broad-breasted and very deep-chested. His sinewy frame correspond with the rest did, except as to height, for he could not be more at the most, you would say, than some five feet four, and if measured perhaps had been found a thought lower. Dame Nature, in fact, whom some person or other, a poet, has called a capricious stepmother, you saw when beside him, had somehow denied him in longitude what she had granted in latitude, a trifling defect you'd the sooner detect from his having constructed a stoop in his attitude, square-built and broad-shouldered, good-humored and gay, with his collar and countenance open as day. The latter, t'was marked with smallpox, by the way, had a sort of expression good will to bespeak. He'd a smile in his eye and a quid in his cheek. And in short, notwithstanding his failure in height, he was just such a man as you'd say at first sight you would much rather dine or shake hands with than fight. The other, his friend and companion, was taller, by five or six inches at least, than the smaller. From his air and his mien, it was plain to be seen that he was or had been a something between the real Jack Tar and the Jolly Marine. For though he would give an occasional hitch, sailor-like to his slops, there was something the which, on the whole, savored more of the pipe clay than pitch. Such were now the two men who appeared on the hill, Harry Waters the tall one, the short spanking Bill. To be caught in the rain, I repeat it again, is extremely unpleasant on Salisbury Plain. And when with a good soaking shower there are blended blue lightnings and thunder, the matter's not mended. Such was the case in this wild, dreary place, on the day that I'm speaking of now, when the brace of travellers alluded to quickened their pace, till a good steady walk became more like a race, to get quit of the tempest which held them in chase. Louder and louder than mortal gunpowder, the heavenly artillery kept crashing and roaring, the lightning kept flashing, the rain too kept pouring, while they, helter-skelter, in vain sought for shelter, from what I have heard termed a regular pelter. But the deuce of a screen could be anywhere seen, or an object except that on one of the rises an old waypost showed, where the Lavington Road branched off to the left from the one to Devizes, and thither the footsteps of waters seemed tending, though a doubt might exist of the course he was bending, to a landsman at least who, wherever he goes, is content for the most part to follow his nose, while Harry kept backing and filling and tacking, two nautical terms which, I'll wager a guinea, are meant to imply what you reader and I would call going zigzag and not rectilinear. But here, once for all, let me beg you'll excuse all mistakes I may make in the words sailors use amongst themselves on a cruise or ashore with the Jews, or in making their court to their Pauls and their Sues, or addressing those shop-selling females afloat, women known in our navy as oddly named boat women. The fact is, I can't say I'm versed in the school so ably conducted by Marriott and Poole. See the last-mentioned gentleman's admiral's daughter, the grand vade mecum for all who to sea come, and get the first time in their lives in blue water. Of course, in the use of sea terms, you'll not wonder if I now and then should fall into some blunder, for which Captain Shummer or Mr. T.P. Cook would call me a lubber and son of a sea cook. To return to our muttons, this mode of progression at length upon spanking Bill made some impression. Hello, messmate, what cheer? How queer you do steer, cried Bill, whose short legs kept him still in the rear. Why, what's in the wind, Bo? What is it you fear? For he saw in a moment that something was frightening his shipmate much more than the thunder and lightning. Fear, stammered out Waters. Why, him, don't you see? What face is that drummer boy's making at me? How he dodges me so wherever I go? What is it he wants with me, Bill? Do you know? What drummer boy, Harry, cries Bill in surprise, with a brief exclamation that ended in eyes. What drummer boy, Waters? The coast is all clear. We haven't got never no drummer boy here. 
Why there, don't you see how he's following me? Now this way, now that way, and won't let me be. Keep him off, Bill, look here, don't let him come near. Only see how the blood drops his features besmear. What, the dead come to life again? Bless me, oh dear. Bill remarked in reply, This is all very queer. What, a drummer boy, bloody too, eh? Well, I never. I can't see no drummer boy here. What's some dever? Not see him? Why, there, look, he's close by the post. Hark, hark, how he drums at me now. He's a ghost. A what? returned Bill at that moment a flash more than commonly awful preceded a crash, like what's called in Kentucky an almighty smash. And down Harry Waters went plump on his knees, while the sound, though prolonged, died away by degrees. In its last sinking echoes, however, were some which Bill could not help thinking resembled a drum. Hello, Waters, I says, quoth he in amaze, why I never seed nothing in all my born days half so queer as this here, and I'm not very clear, but that one of us two has good reason for fear. You to jaw about drummers with nobody near us? I must say as how that I thinks it's mysterious. Oh, mercy, roared Waters, do keep him off, Bill, and Andrew forgive, I'll confess all, I will. I'll make a clean breast, and as for the rest, you may do with me just what the lawyers think best. But haunt me not thus. Let these visitings cease, and your vengeance accomplished, boy. Leave me in peace. Harry paused for a moment, then turning to Bill, who stood with his mouth open, steady, and still, began spinning what nauticals term a tough yarn, namely his tale of what Bill called this precious consarn. It was in such an hour as this, on such a wild and wintry day, the forked lightning seemed to hiss, and now athwart our lonely way, when first these dubious paths I tried, yon livid form was by my side. Not livid then, the ruddy glow of life and youth and health it bore, and bloodless was that gory brow, and cheerful was the smile it wore, and mildly then those eyes did shine, those eyes which now are blasting mine." They beamed with confidence and love upon my face, and Andrew Brand had sooner feared yon frightened dove than harm from Gervais Matcham's hand. I am no Harry Waters, men did call me Gervais Matcham then, and Matcham, though a humble name, was stainless as the feathery flake from heaven whose virgin whiteness came upon the newly frozen lake. Commander, comrade, all began to laud the soldier like the man." Nay, muse not, William, I have said, I was a soldier staunch and true, as any he above whose head old England's lion banner flew, and duty done, her claims apart, twas said I had a kindly heart, and years rolled on, and with them came promotion, corporal, sergeant, all, in turn I kept mine honest fame, our colonel self, who men did call the various martinet, even he, though cold to most, was kind to me. One morn, oh, may that morning stand accursed in the rolls of fate, till latest time there came command to carry forth a charge of weight to a detachment far away. It was their regimental pay. And who so fit for such a task as trusty Matcham true and tried, who spurned the inebriating flask with honor for his constant guide? On Matcham fell their choice, and he, young drum, should bear him company. And grateful was that sound to hear, for he was full of life and joy. The mess-room pet to each one dear was that kind, gay, light-hearted boy. The veriest churl in all our band had I a smile for Andrew Brand. Nay, glare not as I name thy name, that threatening hand, that fearful brow. Relax, avert that glance of flame. Thou seest I do thy bidding now. Vexed spirit, rest, twill soon be o'er. Thy blood shall cry to heaven no more. Enough, we journeyed on, the walk was long, and dull and dark the day, and still young Andrew's cheerful talk and merry laugh beguiled the way. Noon came, a sheltering bank was there, we paused our frugal meal to share. Then twas, with cautious hand I sought to prove my charge secure, and drew the packet from my vest, and brought the glittering mischief forth to view. And Andrew cried, No, t'was not he, it was the tempter spoke to me. But it was Andrew's laughing voice that sounded in my tingling ear. Now, Gervais, match em at thy choice, it seemed to say, are gods and gear, and all that wealth can buy or bring, ease, wassail, worship, everything. 
no tedious drill, no long parade, no bugle call at early dawn, for guardroom bench or barrack bed, the downy couch, the sheets of lawn, and I thy page, thy steps to tend, thy sworn companion, servant, friend. He ceased, that is, I heard no more, though other words passed idly by, and Andrew chattered as before, and laughed, I marked him not, not I, tis at thy choice. That sound alone rang in mine ear, voice else was none. I could not eat, the untasted flask mocked my parched lip, I passed it by, what ails thee, man, he seemed to ask. I felt, but could not meet his eye. Tis at thy choice. It sounded yet, a sound I never may forget. Haste, haste, the day draws on, I cried. And Andrew, thou hast far to go. Hast far to go, the fiend replied. Within me, t'was not Andrew, no. T'was Andrew's voice no more, t'was he. Whose then I was, and I must be. On, on we went. The dreary plain was all around us. We were here. Then came the storm, the lightning rain. No earthly living thing was near, save one wild raven on the wing, if that indeed were earthly thing. I heard its hoarse and screaming voice, high hovering o'er my frenzied head. "'Tis Gervais, Matcham, at thy choice, but he, the boy, methought it said. Nay, Andrew, check that vengeful frown. I love thee when I struck thee down. T'was done, the deed that damns me done. I know not how, I never knew. And here I stood, but not alone. The prostrate boy my madness slew was by my side, limb, feature, name. T'was he, another, yet the same. Away, away, in frantic haste. Throughout that live-long night I flew. Away, away, across the waste. I know not how. I never knew. My mind was one wild blank, and I had but one thought, one hope, to fly. And still the lightning plowed the ground, the thunder roared, and there would come amidst its loudest bursts a sound, familiar once. It was a drum. Then came the morn and light, and then streets, houses, spires, the hum of men. An ocean rolled before me, fain would I have whelmed me in its tide. At once beneath the billowy main, my shame, my guilt, my crime to hide. But he was there. He crossed my track. I dared not pass. He waved me back. And then rude hands detained me. Sure justice had grasped her victim, no. Though powerless, hopeless, bound, secure. A captive thrall, it was not so. Then cry, the Frenchman's on the wave. The press was hot, and I a slave. They dragged me o'er the vessel's side. The world of waters rolled below. The gallant ship in all her pride of dreadful beauty sought her foe. Thou sawest me, William, in the strife. Alack, I bore a charmed life. In vain the bullets round me fly. In vain mine eager breast I bear. Death shuns the wretch who longs to die. And every sword falls edgeless there. Still he is near and seems to cry, not here, nor thus, may Matcham die. Thou sawest me on that fearful day, when fruitless all attempts to save our pinnace foundering in the bay, the boat's crew met a watery grave, all, all, save one, the ravenous sea, that swallowed all, rejected me. And now, when fifteen sons have each fulfilled in turn its circling year, thrown back again on England's beach, our bark paid off, he drives me here. I could not die in flood or fight. He drives me here. And sarve you right. What? Bilk your commander? Desart and then rob? And go scuttling a poor little drummer boy's knob? Why, my precious eyes, what a bloodthirsty swab. There's old Davy Jones, who cracks sailor's bones, for his jaw work would never, I'm sure so help me, Bob, have come for to go for to do such a job. Hark ye, Waters, or Matcham, Whichever's your purser name, t'other your own is, I'm sartain, the worser name. Twelve years have we lived on like brother and brother. Now your course lays one way, and mine lays another. No, William, it may not be so. Blood calls for blood, tis heaven's decree. And thou with me this night must go, and give me to the gallows tree. Ha! See, he smiles, he points the way. On, William, on, no more delay.
Now Bill, so the story as told to me goes, and who, as his last speech sufficiently shows, was a regular Trump, did not like to turn nose, but then came a thunderclap louder than any of those that preceded, though there were so many, and hark, as its rumbling subside in a hum, what sound mingles too, by the hokey, a drum. I remember I once heard my grandfather say that some sixty years since he was going that way, when they showed him the spot where the gibbet was not, on which Matcham's course had been hung up to rot. It had fallen down, but how long before he'd forgot. And they told him, I think, at the bear in Devizes, the town where the sessions are held, or the sizes, that Matcham confessed and made a clean breast to the mayor, but that after he'd had a night's rest and the storm had subsided, he pooh-poohed his friend, swearing all was a lie from beginning to end, said he'd only been drunk, that his spirits had sunk at the thunder, the storm put him into a funk, that in fact he had nothing at all on his conscience, and found out in short he'd been talking great nonsense. But now one Mr. Jones comes forth and depones that fifteen years since he had heard certain groans on his way to Stonehenge to examine the stones described in a work of the late Sir John Soane's, that he'd followed the moans, and led by their tones, found a raven a-picking a drummer boy's bones. Then the colonel wrote word from the king's forty-third that the story was certainly true which they heard, for that one of their drummers and one sergeant Matcham had brushed with the dibs, and they never could catch him. So justice was sure, though a long time she'd lagged, and the sergeant, in spite of his gammon, got scragged, and people averred that an ugly black bird the raven, twas hinted, of whom we have heard, though the story I own appears rather absurd, was seen, Gervais Matcham not being interred, to roost all that night on the murderer's gibbet, an odd thing if so, and it may be a fib, it however's a thing nature's laws don't prohibit. Next morning they add that black gentleman flies out, having picked Matcham's nose off and gobbled his eyes out. Moral. Avis au voyageur. Imprimis. If you contemplate walking or Salisbury Plain, consult Mr. Murphy or more and refrain from selecting a day when it's likely to rain. Second, when traveling, don't flash your notes or your cash before other people. It's foolish and rash. Third, at dinner be cautious and note well your party. There's little to dread where the appetite's hearty, but mind and look well to your purse and your throttle when you see a man shirking and passing his bottle. Fourth, if you chance to be needy, your coat and hat seedy, in wartime especially, never go out when you've reason to think there's a press gang about. Fifth, don't chatter nor tell people all that you think, nor blab secrets, especially when you're in drink, but keep your own counsel in all that you do, or a counsel may some day or other keep you. Sixth, Discard superstition, and don't take a post if you happen to see one at night for a ghost. Last of all, if by choice or convenience you're led to cut a man's throat or demolish his head, don't do it in a thunderstorm. Wait for the summer, and mind above all things, the man's not a drummer. End of section 15, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 7, 2023. Section 16 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Among a bundle of letters, I find one from Suckle Thumbkin, dated from London, and containing his version of perhaps the greatest theatrical civil war, since the celebrated O. P. Rao, as the circumstances are now become matter of history, and poor Doldrum himself has been, alas, for some time the denizen of a far different house, I have ventured to preserve it. Perhaps it may be unnecessary to add that my honourable friend has of late taken to poetry, and goes without his cravat. A Rao in an Omnibus Box A Legend of the Haymarket Omnibus hoc vitium cantoribus, Horatio. Doldrum, the manager, sits in his chair, 
with a gloomy brow and dissatisfied air, and he says, as he slaps his hands on his knee, I'll have nothing to do with fiddle-dee-dee. But fiddle-dee-dee sings clear and loud, and his trills and his quavers astonish the crowd. Such a singer as he you'll nowhere see. They'll all be screaming for fiddle-dee-dee. Though fiddle-dee-dee sings loud and clear, and his tones are sweet, yet his terms are dear. The glove won't fit. The deuce a bit. I shall give an engagement to fal de tit The prompter bowed, and he went to his stall, and the green bays rose at the prompter's call, and fal de tit sang fol de roll lol but scarce had he done when a row begun such a noise was never heard under the sun fiddle-dee-dee where is he he's the artiste whom we all want to see doll drum doll drum bid the manager come it's a scandalous thing to exact such a sum for boxes and gallery stalls and pit then fob us off with fall de ral tit deuce a bit we'll never submit Vive fiddle dee dee, a ba fal de ral tit. Doldrum, the manager, rose from his chair with a gloomy brow and dissatisfied air, but he smoothed his brow, as he well knew how, and he walked on and made a most elegant bow, and he paused and he smiled and advanced to the lights in his opera hat and his opera tights. Ladies and gentlemen, then said he, pray. What may you please to want with me? Fiddly dee, fiddly dee. Folks of all sorts and of every degree, snob and snip and haughty grandee, duchesses, countesses, fresh from their tea, and shopmen who'd only come there for a spree, hallooed and hooted and roared with glee. Fiddle dee dee, none but he. Subscribe to his terms, whatever they be. Agree. Agree, or you'll very soon see in a brace of shakes we'll get up an O.P. Doldrum, the manager, full of care, with a gloomy brow and dissatisfied air, looks distressed, and he bows his best, and he puts his right hand on the side of his breast, and he says, says he, We can't agree. His terms are a vast deal too high for me. There's the rent, and the rates, and the cesses, and taxes. I can't afford fiddle-dee-dee what he axes. If you'll only permit, fal it. The generous public cried, Deuce a bit, doldrum. Doldrum, will none of us come. It's no go. It's gammon. It's all a hum. You're a miserly Jew. Cock-a-doodle-doo. He don't ask too much, as you know. So you do. It's a shame. It's a sin. It's really too bad. You ought to be shamed of yourself, so you had. Doldrum, the manager, never before in his life had heard such a wild uproar. Doldrum, the manager, turned to flee, but he says, says he, Mort de ma vie, I shall never engage with that fiddle Then all the gentlefolks flew in a rage, and they jumped from the omnibus on to the stage. Lords, squires, and knights, they came down to the lights in their opera hats and their opera tights. Mamselle Cherry Toes shook to her very toes. She couldn't hop on, so hopped off on her merry toes, and the evening concluded with three times three, hip, hip, hurrah for fiddle-dee-dee. Doldrum, the manager, full of care, with a troubled brow and dissatisfied air, saddest of men sat down and then took from his table a parian pen and he wrote to the news how macfoos and tragoos lord tom noddy sir carnaby jenks of the blues and the whole of their tale and the separate crews of the tags and the rags and the no one knows whose had combined monsieur falderal tit to abuse and make doldrum agree with fiddle-dee-dee who was not a bit better singer than he Doldrum declared he never could see for the life of him yet why fiddle-dee-dee, who in B-flat or C or whatever the key, could never at any time get below G, should expect a fee in the same degree as the great burly Bumbo who sings double D. Then slyly he added a little, N-B, if they'd have him in Paris he'd not come to me. The manager rings, 
and the prompter springs to his side in a jiffy, and with him he brings a set of those odd-looking envelope things, where Britannia, who seems to be crucified, flings to her right and her left funny people with wings, amongst elephants, Quakers, and catabaw kings, and a taper and wax, and small queen's heads in packs, which, when notes are too big, you're to stick on their backs. Doldrum, the manager, sealed with care the letter, and copies he'd written so fair, and sat himself down with a satisfied air. Without delay, he sent them away, in time to appear in our columns next day. Doldrum, the manager, full of care, walked on to the stage with an anxious air, and peeped through the curtain to see who were there. There was McFuse, and Lieutenant Tregoose, and there was Sir Carnaby Jenks of the Blues, and the Tags, and the Rags, and the no-one-knows-whos, and the Green Bays rose at the prompter's call, and they all began to hoot, bellow, and bawl, and cry, cock-a-doodle, and scream, and squall, dole drum, dole drum, bid the manager come. You'd have thought, from the tones of their hisses and groans, they were bent upon breaking his opera bones. And Doldrum comes, and he says, says he, Pray, what may you please to want with me? Philly dee, Philly dee, we'll have nobody give us soul fa but he, for he's the artiste whom we all want to see. Manager Doldrum says, says he, and he looks like an owl in a hollow beech tree, Well, since I see the thing must be, I'll sign an agreement with Fiddle Dee. Then McFuse and Tregoose and Jenks of the Blues and the Tags and the Rags and the No One Knows Who's, extremely delighted to hear such good news, desist from their shrill cock a doodle doos. Vive fiddle dee Doldrum and he, they are jolly good fellows as ever need be, and so's Burly Bumbo, who sings double D, and whenever they sing, why, we'll all come and see. So, after all this terrible squall, fiddle dee dees at the top of the tree, and Doldrum and Falderall tit sing small. Now, fiddle dee dee sings loud and clear, and I can't tell you how many thousands a year, and Falderall Tit is considered small beer, and Mamselle Cherry Toes sports her merry toes, dancing away to the fiddles and flutes in what the folks call a Lithuanian in boots. So here's an end to my one, two, and three, and bless the queen, and long live she, and grant that there never again may be such a hullabaloo as we've happened to see about nothing on earth but fiddle dee End of section 16, read by Sandra, Montreal, 2023. Section 17 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. We come now to the rummaging of Father John's stores. The extracts which I shall submit from them are of the same character as those formerly derived from the same source and may be considered as theologico-historical or tracts for his times. With respect to the first legend on this list, I have to remark that, though the good father is silent on the subject, there is every reason to believe that the little curly wig gentleman who plays, though passively, so prominent a part in it, had Ingoldsby blood in his veins. This conjecture is supported by the fact of the arms of Scroop impaling Ingoldsby being found, as in the Bray case, in one of the windows, and by a very old marriage settlement, nearly or quite illegible, a facsimile of the seal affixed to which is appended to this true history. The Lay of St. Cuthbert, or the Devil's Dinner Party, a legend of the North Country. Nobilis quidam, qui nomen Monseigneur le Scrop, chivaler, cum invitas et convivas, et ora convivi jam instante et apparatu facto, spe frustratus esset, excusantibus se convivas, cur non comporaren prorupit iratus in aic verba. Veniat igitur omnes demons, 
si nullis hominum mecum esse potest, quod cum fiere et dominus et famuli et ancile ad domo properantes forte obliti infantum incunis jacentum secum non afrunt, timons incipiunt commissari et vociferari prospicereque per fenestras formis usorum luporum felium et mostrare pocula vino repleta. Ah, encit pater, ubi infants meus, vix cum aec dixisset, unes ex demonibus ulnis, sui infantum ad venestram gestat, etc. Chronicon de Bolton. It's in Bolton Hall, and the clock strikes one, and the roast meat's brown, and the boiled meat's done, and the barbecued sucking pigs crisp to a turn, and the pancakes are fried and beginning to burn. The fat stubble goose swims in gravy and juice, with the mustard and applesauce ready for use. Fish, flesh, and fowl, and all of the best, want nothing but eating, and they're already dressed. But where is the host, and where is the guest? Pantler and serving man, henchman and page, stand sniffing the duck stuffing, onion and sage, and the scullions and cooks, with fidgety looks, are grumbling and muttering and scowling as black as cooks always do when the dinner's put back. For though the board's decked and the napery fair as the unsun snowflake is spread out with care and the dais is furnished with stool and with chair and plate of orfevry costly and rare, apostle spoons, salt cellar, all are there. And mess John in his place with his rubicund face and his hands ready folded prepared to say grace. Yet where is the host? And his convives, where? The scroop sits lonely in Bolton Hall, and he watches the dial that hangs by the wall. He watches the large hand, he watches the small, and he fidgets and looks as cross as the cook's, and he utters a word which will soften to zooks, as he cries, what on earth has become of them all? What can delay, devoe, and to say, what makes Sir Gilbert de Umfraville stay? What's gone with points and Sir Reginald Bray? Why are Ralph Ufford and Marney away? And de Noakes and de Stiles and Lord Marmaduke Grey? And de Roe and de Doe? Poynings and Vavasour? Where be they? Fitz Walter, Fitz Osbert, Fitz Hugh and Fitz John and the Mandevilles pair a feast, father and son. Their cards said, Dinner precisely at one. There's nothing I hate in the world like waiting. It's a monstrous great bore when a gentleman feels a good appetite thus to be kept from his meals. It's in Bolton Hall and the clock strikes two and the scullions and cooks are themselves in a stew and the kitchen maids stand and don't know what to do for the rich plum puddings are bursting their bags and the mutton and turnips are boiling to rags, and the fish is all spoiled, and the butter's all oiled, and the soup's got cold in the silver tureen, and there's nothing, in short, that is fit to be seen. While Sir Guy Le Scroop continues to fume, and to fret by himself in the tapestried room, and still fidgets and looks more cross than the cook's, and repeats that bad word which we've softened to zooks, Two o'clock's come and two o'clock's gone, and the large and the small hands move steadily on. Still, nobody's there, no de Russe or de Clare, to taste of the scroop's most delicate fare, or to quaff off a health unto Bolton's heir, that nice little boy who sits there in his chair, some four years old and a few months to spare, with his laughing blue eyes and his long curly hair, now sucking his thumb, and now munching his pear. Again, Sir Guy, the silence broke. It's hard upon three. It's just on the stroke. Come, serve up the dinner. A joke is a joke. Little he deems that Stephen de Hoax, who his fun, as the Yankees say, everywhere pokes, and is always a great deal too fond of his jokes, has written a circular note to de Noakes, and to Stiles, and to Rowe, and the rest of the folks, one and all, great and small, who were asked to the hall to dine there and sup and wind up with a ball and had told all the party a great bouncing lie he cooked up that the fete was postponed sine die 
the dear little curly-wigged heir of Le Scroop being taken alarmingly ill with the croup. When the clock struck three and the page on his knees said, And please you, Sir Guy Le Scroop, on a servi. And the knight found the banquet hall empty and clear, with nobody near to partake of his cheer. He stamped and he stormed, then his language, oh dear, t'was awful to see and t'was awful to hear. And he cried to the button-decked page at his knee, who had told him so civilly, on a servi. Ten thousand fiends seize them wherever they be. The devil take them, and the devil take thee, and the devil may eat up the dinner for me. In a terrible fume, he bounced out of the room. He bounced out of the house, and page, footman, and groom bounced after their master, for scarce had they heard of this left-handed grace the last finishing word. Ere the horn at the gate of the Barbican Tower was blown with a loud twenty-trumpeter power, and in rushed a troop of strange guests, such a group as had ne'er before darkened the doors of the scroop. This looks like to say, yet, it is not to say, and this is, no, tis not, Sir Reginald Bray, this has somewhat the favor of Marmaduke Gray, but stay, where on earth did he get those long nails? Why, they're claws, then good gracious, they've all of them tails. That can't be DeVoe. Why, his nose is a bill, or I would say a beak, and he can't keep it still. Is that Poinings? Oh, Gemini, look at his feet. Why, they're absolute hoofs. Is it gout or his corns that have crumpled them up so? By Jingo, he's horns. Run, run, there's Fitzwalter, Fitzhugh, and Fitzjohn, and the Mandevilles, Père et Fils, father and son, and Fitzospert and Euford. They've all got them on. Then their great saucer eyes, it's the father of lies and his imps. Run, run, run. They're all fiends in disguise, who've partly assumed, with more sombre complexions, the forms of Sir Guy Lescroop's friends and connections. And he, at the top there, that grim-looking elf, run, run, that's the muckle-horned Clutie himself. And now what a din, without and within, for the courtyard is full of them. How they begin to mop and to mow and make faces and grin, cock their tails up together, like cows in hot weather, and butted each other, all eating and drinking, the viands and wine disappearing like winking. And then such a lot, as together had got, Master Cabbage, the steward, who'd made a machine to calculate with and count noses, I ween, the cleverest thing of the kind ever seen, declared when he'd made by the said machine's aid up what's now called the tottle of those he surveyed. There were just how he proved it I cannot divine, nine thousand nine hundred and ninety and nine exclusive of him who giant in limb and black as the crow they denominate jim with a tail like a bull and a head like a bear stands forth at the window and what holds he there which he hugs with such care and pokes out in the air and grasp as its limbs from each other he tear Oh, grief and despair, I vow and declare, it's Le Scroop's poor, dear, sweet, little, curly-wigged heir, whom the nurse had forgot, and left there in his chair, alternately sucking his thumb and his pear. What words can express the dismay and distress? Sir Guy, when he found what a terrible mess his cursing and banning had now got him into, that words which to use are a shame and a sin, too, had thus on their speaker recoiled, and his malazone placed in the hands of the devil's own pal, his son. He sobbed, and he sighed, and he screamed, and he cried, and behaved like a man that is mad or in liquor. He tore his peaked beard, and he dashed off his vicary, stamped on the jay as though he were crazy, and staggering about just as if he were hazy, exclaimed, Fifty pounds! A large sum in those times— to the person, whoever he may be, that climbs to that window above there, on ogive and painted, and brings down my curly wig, here Sir Guy fainted. With many a moan and many a groan, what with tweaks of the nose and some eau de cologne, he revived, reason once more remounted her throne, or rather the instinct of nature toward treason to her, in the Scroop's case perhaps to say reason, but what saw he then, oh my goodness, a sight enough to have banished his reason outright. 
In that broad banquet hall, the fiends, one and all, regardless of shriek and of squeak and of squall, from one to another, were tossing that small, pretty, curly-wigged boy as if playing at ball. Yet none of his friends or his vassals might dare to fly to the rescue or rush up the stair and bring down in safety his curly-wigged heir. Well a day, well a day, all he can say, is but just so much trouble and time thrown away. Not a man can be tempted to join the melee. In those words, cabalistic, I promise to pay fifty pounds on demand, have for once lost their sway. And there the knight stands, wringing his hands, in his agony when, on a sudden, one ray of hope darts through his midriff, his saint, oh, it's funny and almost absurd that it never occurred, I, this group's patron saint, he's the man for my money, saint, who is it? Really, I'm sadly to blame, on my word, I'm afraid, I confess it with shame, that I've almost forgot the good gentleman's name, cut, let me see, cut beard? No, Cuthbert, egad, St. Cuthbert of Bolton. I'm right, he's the lad. Oh, holy St. Cuthbert, if forebears of mine, of myself I say little, have knelt at your shrine, and have lashed their bare backs, and no matter with twine, oh, list to the vow which I make to you now, only snatch my poor little boy out of the row, which that imp's kicking up with his fiendish bow-wow, and his head like a bear, and his tail like a cow. Bring him back here in safety, perform but this task, and I'll give, oh, I'll give you whatever you ask. There is not a shrine in the county shall shine with a brilliancy half so resplendent as thine, or have so many candles, or look half so fine. Haste, holy St. Cuthbert, then hasten in pity. Conceive a surprise when a strange voice replies, It's a bargain, but mine, sir, the best spermacetti. Say, who's that voice? Who's that form by his side? That old, old gray man with his beard long and wide, in his coarse palmer's weeds, and his cockle in beads? And how did he come? Did he walk? Did he ride? Oh, none could determine. Oh, none could decide. The fact is, I don't believe anyone tried. For while everyone stared, with a dignified stride and without a word more, he marched on before, up a flight of stone steps, and so through the front door, to the banqueting hall that was on the first floor, while the fiendish assembly were making a rare little shuttlecock there of the curly-wigged air, I wish, gentle reader, that you could have seen the pause that ensued when he stepped in between, with his resolute air and his dignified mien, and said in a tone most decided though mild, Come, I'll trouble you just to hand over that child. The demoniac crowd in an instant seemed cowed. Not one of the crew volunteered a reply, all shrunk from the glance of that keen flashing eye, save one horrid humgruffin, who seemed by his talk and the airs he assumed to be cock of the walk. He quailed not before it, but saucily met it, and as saucily said, Don't you wish you may get it? My goodness, the look that the old palmer gave, and his frown, t'was quite dreadful to witness. Why, slave, you rascal, quoth he, this language to me? At once, Mr. Nicholas, down on your knee, and hand me that curly-wigged boy I command it. Come, none of your nonsense. You know I won't stand it. Old Nicholas trembled. He shook in his shoes, and seemed half inclined, but afraid to refuse. Well, Cuthbert, said he, if so it must be, for you've had your own way from the first time I knew ye. Take your curly-wigged brat, and much good may he do ye. But I'll have an exchange. Here his eye flashed with rage. That chap with the buttons, he gave me the page. Come, come, the saint answered. You very well know. The young man's no more his than your own to bestow. Touch one button of his if you dare, Nick. No, no. Catch your stick, sir. Come, mizzle. Be off with you. Go. The devil grew hot. If I do, I'll be shot. And you come to that, Cuthbert, I'll tell you what's what. He has asked us to dine here and go, we will not. Why, you skin flint, at least you may leave us the feast. Here we've come all that way from our brimstone abode. Ten million good leagues, sir, as ever you strode. And the deuce of a luncheon we've had on the road. Go, mizzle, indeed. Mr. Saint, who are you, I should like to know. Go, I'll be hanged if I do. 
He invited us all. We've a right here. It's known that a baron may do what he likes with his own. Here, Asmodeus, a slice of that beef. Now the mustard. What have you got? Oh, apple pie. Try it with custard. The saint made a pause, as uncertain, because he knew Nick is pretty well up in the laws, and they might be on his side, and then he'd such claws. On the whole, it was better, he thought, to retire, with the curly-wigged boy he'd picked out of the fire, and give up the victuals to retrace his path, and to compromise, spite of the member for bath. So to old Nick's appeal, as he turned on his heel, he replied, well, I'll leave you the mutton and veal, and the soup à la reine, and the sauce béchamel. As this group did invite you to dinner, I feel, I can't well turn you out. T'would be hardly genteel. But be moderate, pray, and remember thus much. Since you're treated as gentlemen, show yourself such. And don't make it late, but mind and go straight home to bed when you've finished, and don't steal the plate, nor wrench off the knocker, or bell from the gate. Walk away like respectable devils in peace, and don't lark with the watch or annoy the police. Having thus said his say, that Palmer Gray took up little the scroop and walked coolly away, while all the demons all set up a hip hip hooray, then fell tooth and claw on the victuals as they had been guests at Guildhall upon Lord Mayor's Day, all scrambling and scuffling for what was before him. No care for precedence or common decorum. Few ate more hearty than Madame Astarte, and Hecate considered the bells of the party. Between them was seated Leviathan, eager to do the polite and take wine with Belfigur. Here was Morbleu, a French devil, supping soup meager, and there munching leeks Davy Jones of Tredegar, a Welsh one, who'd left the domains of Ap Morgan to follow the sea and next him de Morgorgon, then Pan with his pipes and fawns grinding the organ to Mammon and Belial and half a score dancers who joined with Medusa to get up the lancers. Here's Lucifer lying blind drunk with Scotch ale, while Beelzebub's tying huge knots in his tail. There's Satibus storming because Mephistophilus gave him the lie, said he'd blacken his eye, and dashed in his face a whole cup of hot coffee lees. Ramping and roaring, hiccuping, snoring, never was seen such a riot before in a gentleman's house or such profligate reveling at any soiree where they don't let the devil in. Hark, as sure as fate, the clock striking eight, an hour which our ancestors called getting late, when Nick, who by this time was rather elate, rose up and addressed them. "'Tis full time,' he said, "'for all elderly devils to be in their bed.' For my own part, I mean to be jogging, because I don't find myself now quite so young as I was. But, gentlemen, ere I depart from my post, I must call on you all for one bumper. The toast, which I have to propose, is our excellent host. Many thanks for his kind hospitality. May we also be able to see at our table himself and enjoy in a family way his good company downstairs at no distant day. You'd, I'm sure, think me rude if I did not include in the toast my young friend there, the curly-wigged heir. He's in very good hands, for you're all well aware that St. Cuthbert has taken him under his care. Though I must not say bless, why, you'll easily guess. May our curly-wigged friend's shadow never be less. Nick took off his heel-taps, bowed, smiled with an air, most graciously grim, and vacated the chair. Of course, the elite rose at once on their feet and followed their leader and beat a retreat when a skylarking imp took the president's seat and requesting that each would replenish his cup, said, Where we have dined, my boys, there let us sup. It was three in the morning before they broke up. I scarcely need say, Sir Guy didn't delay to fulfill his vow made to St. Cuthbert or pay for the candles he'd promised, or make light as day the shrine he assured him he'd render so gay. In fact, when the votaries came there to pray, all said there was not to compare with it nay, for fear that the abbey might think he was shabby, for brethren thenceforward to cleric to lay, he adorned should take charge of a new-founded chantry, with six marks apiece and some claims on the pantry. In short, 
The whole county declared through his bounty the Abbey of Bolton exhibited fresh scenes from any displayed since Sir William de Machines, and Cecilia Rumelli came to this nation with William the Norman and laid its foundation. For the rest, it is said, and I know I have read in some chronicle, whose has gone out of my head, that what with these candles and other expenses, which no man would go to if quite in his senses, he reduced and brought low his property so that at last he'd not much of it left to bestow, and that many years after that terrible feast, Sir Guy in the Abbey was living a priest, and there in one thousand and something deceased. It's supposed by this trick he bamboozled old Nick and slipped through his fingers remarkably slick, while as to young Curlywig, dear little soul, would you know more of him? You must look at the roll which records the dispute and the subsequent suit commenced in 1375, which took root in Le Grovener's assuming the arms Le Scroop swore that none but his ancestors ever before in foray, joust, battle, or tournament war, to wit, on a Prussian blue field, a bend oar, while the governor averred that his ancestors bore the same, and Scroop lied like a somebody tore off the simile, so I can tell you no more, till some A double S shall the fragment restore. Moral. This legend sound maxims exemplifies, for example, first, should anything tease you, annoy, or displease you, remember what Lily says, animum reggae. And as for that shocking bad habit of swearing, in all good society, voted pass-bearing, eschew it, and leave it to dustmen and mobs, nor commit yourself much beyond zooks or odds bobs. Second, when asked out to dine by a person of quality, mind and observe the most strict punctuality. For should you come late and make dinner wait, and the victuals get cold, you'll incur such a fate, the master's displeasure, the mistress's hate. And though both may perhaps be too well-bred to swear, they heartily wish you I need not say where. Third, look well to your maidservants. Say you expect them to see to the children and not to neglect them. And if you're a widower, just throw a cursory glance in at times when you go near the nursery. Perhaps it's as well to keep children from plums and from pears in the season and sucking their thumbs. Fourth, to sum up the whole with a saw of much use, be just and be generous, don't be profuse. Pay the debts that you owe, keep your word to your friends, but don't set your candles alight at both ends. For of this be assured, if you go it too fast, you'll be dished like Sir Guy, and like him, perhaps, die a poor, old, half-starved country parson at last. End of section 17, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 9, 2023. Section 18 of the Ingoldsby Legends Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ingoldsby Legends Second Series by Richard Harris Barham. For the legend that follows, Father John has, it will be seen, the grave authority of a Romish prelate. The good father, who, as I have before had occasion to remark, received his education at Douai, spent several years in the earlier part of his life upon the continent. I have no doubt but that during this period he visited Blois, and there, in all probability, picked up in the very scene of its locality the history which he has thus recorded. The Lay of St. Alois A Legend of Blois Sanct Aloius in hac urbe fuit episcopus qui defunctus sepulturus est a fidelibus nocte autum sequenti veniens quidam paganus lapidam qui sarcophagum tegebat revolvit erectum que contra se corpus sancti spoliare conatur ad ille lacertis constrictum ad se hominum fortita amplexatur et usque mane 
populus spectantibus tanquam constipatum loris ita miserum braces detinabat judex loci sepulcri violatorum jupet abstrahi et legali pene sententia condemnari sed non laxabatur a sancto tunc intelligens voluntatum defuncti judex facta de vita permissioni absorvit deende laxator et sic in columnes reditor non vero fio de missus quin se vitam monastericam amplexorum spopondisat de gloria confessorum st alois was the bishop of blois and a pitiful man was he he grieved and he pined for the woes of mankind and of brutes in their degree he would rescue the rat from the claws of the cat and set the poor captive free though his cassock was swarming with all sorts of vermin he'd not take the life of a flea kind tender forgiving to all things living from injury still he endeavoured to screen em fish flesh or fowl no difference between em nihil putavit asse alienum the bishop of blois was a holy man a holy man was he for holy church he'd seek and he'd search as a bishop in his degree from foe and from friend he'd wrap and he'd rend to augment her treasury naught would he give and little he'd lend that holy church might have more to spend count stephen of blois was a worthy peer his breeches cost him but a crown he held them sixpence all too dear and so he called the tailor laun had it been the bishop instead of the count and he'd overcharged him to half the amount he had knocked that tailor down not for himself he despised the pelf he dressed in sackcloth he dined off delf and when it was cold in lieu of a surtout the good man would wrap himself up in his virtue alack that a man so holy as he so frank and free in his degree and so good and so kind should mortal be yet so it is for loud and clear from st nicholas's tower on the listening ear with solemn swell the deep-toned bell flings to the gale a funeral knell and hark at its sound as a cunning old hound when he opens at once causes all the young whelps of the cry to put in their less dignified yelps so the little bells all no matter how small from the steeples both inside and outside the wall with bell-metal throat respond to the note and join the lament that a prelate so pious is forced thus to leave his disconsolate diocese or as blois lord mayor is heard to declare should leave this here world for to go to that there and see the portals opening wide from the abbey flows the living tide forth from the doors the torrent pours acolytes monks and friars in scores this with his chasuble that with his rosary this from his incense pot turning his nose awry holy father and holy mother holy sister and holy brother holy son and holy daughter holy wafer and holy water every one dressed like a guest in his best in the smartest of clothes they're permitted to wear serge sackcloth and shirts of the same sort of hair as now we make use of to stuff an armchair or weave into gloves at three shillings a pair and employ for shampooing in cases rheumatic a special specific i'm told for sciatica through groined arch and by cloistered stone with mosses and ivy long o'ergrown slowly the throng come passing along with many a chaunt and solemn song adapted for holidays high days and sundays dies ire and de profundis misereri and domine dirige nos such as i hear to a very slow tune are all commonly chanted by monks at a funeral to secure the defunct's repose and to give a broad hint to old nick should the news of a prelate's decease bring him there on a cruise that he'd better be minding his p's and his q's and not come too near since they can if they choose make him shake in his hoofs as he does not wear shoes still on they go a goodly show with footsteps sure though certainly slow two by two in a very long row with feathers and mutes in morning suits undertakers men walking in hat-bands and boots then comes the crozier 
all jewels and gold, borne by a lad about eighteen years old, next on a black velvet cushion the mitre, borne by a younger boy, cause it is lighter, eight Franciscans, sturdy and strong, bear in the midst the good bishop along. Eight Franciscans, stout and tall, walk at the corners and hold up the pall. Eight more hold a canopy, high over all, with eight trumpeters tooting the dead march in Saul. Behind, as chief mourner, the Lord Abbot goes, his monks coming after him, all with posies, and white pocket-handkerchiefs up at their noses, which they blow whenever his lordship blows his. And, oh, tis a comely sight to see how lords and ladies of high degree veil as they pass upon bended knee, while quite as polite are the squires and the knights in their helmets and hauberks and cast-iron tights. Aye, tis a comely sight to behold as the company march through the rounded arch of that cathedral old, singers behind em and singers before em, all of them ranging in due decorum, around the inside of the sanctum sanctorum while brilliant and bright an unwanted light i forgot to premise this was all done at night the links and the torches and flambeaux shed on the sculptured forms of the mighty dead the dress below mostly buried in lead and above recumbent in grim repose with their mailed hose and their dogs at their toes and little boys kneeling beneath them in rows their hands joined in prayer all in very long clothes with inscriptions on brass begging each who survives as they some of them seem to have led so-so lives to pray for the souls of themselves and their wives the effect of the music too really was fine when they let the good prelate down into his shrine and by old and young the requiem was sung not vernacular french but a classical tongue that is latin I don't think they meddled with Greek. In short, the whole thing produced, so to speak, what in Blois they would call a coup d'oeil magnifique. Yet, surely, when the level ray of some mild eve's descending sun lights on the village pastor grey in years ere ours had well begun, as there in simplest vestment clad he speaks beneath the churchyard tree in solemn tones, but yet not sad, of what man is, what man shall be and clustering round the grave, half hid by that same quiet churchyard you, the rustic mourners bend to bid the dust they loved a last adieu. That ray, methinks, that rests so sheen upon each briar-bound hillock green, so calm, so tranquil, so serene, gives to the eye a fairer scene, speaks to the heart with holier breath than all this pageantry of death. But chacun a son goût, this is talking at random. We all know de gustibus non disputandum. So canter back, muse, to the scene of your story, the cathedral of Blois, where the saint Adalois is by this time, you'll find, left alone in his glory. In the dead of night, though with labour oppressed, some mortals disdain the calm blessings of rest. Your cracksman, for instance, thinks night-time the best to break open a door or the lid of a chest, and the gypsy who close round your premises prowls to ransack your hen-roost and steal all your fowls always sneaks out at night with the bats and the owls so do witches and warlocks ghosts goblins and ghouls to say nothing at all of these troublesome swells who come from the playhouses flashkins and hells to pull off people's knockers and ring people's bells well tis now the hour ill things have power and all who in blois entertain honest views have long been in bed and enjoying a snooze naught is waking save mischief and faking and a few who are sitting up brewing or baking when an ill-looking infidel sallow of hue who stands in his slippers some six feet two a rather remarkable height for a jew creeps cautiously out of the churchwarden's pew into which during service he'd managed to slide himself while all were intent on the anthem and hide himself from his lurking place with stealthy pace through the long-drawn aisle he begins to crawl as you see a cat walk on the top of a wall when it's stuck full of glass and she thinks she shall fall he proceeds to feel for his flint and his steel 
an invention on which we've improved a great deal of late years the substitute best to rely on is what jones of the strand calls his pyrogenion he strikes with despatch his tinder catches now where is his candle and where are his matches tis done they're found he stands up and looks round by the light of a dip of sixteen to the pound what is it now that makes his nerves to quiver his hand to shake and his limbs to shiver fear poof it's only a touch of the liver all is silent all is still it's gammon it's stuff he may do what he will carefully now he approaches the shrine in which as i've mentioned before about nine they had placed in such state the lamented divine but not to worship no no such thing his aim is to prig the pastoral ring fancy his fright when with all his might having forced up the lid which they'd not fastened quite of the marble sarcophagus all in white the dead bishop started up bolt upright on his hinder end and grasped him so tight that the clutch of a kite or a bulldog's bite when he's most provoked and in bitterest spite may well be conceived in comparison slight and having thus tackled him blew out his light oh dear oh dear the fright and the fear no one to hear nobody near in the dead of the night at a bad time of year a defunct bishop squatting upright on his bier and shouting so loud that the drum of his ear he thought would have split as these awful words met it aha my good friend don't you wish you may get it oh dear oh dear twas a night of fear i should dislike to know if the boldest man here in his situation would not have felt queer the wretched man bawls and he yells and he squalls but there's nothing responds to his shrieks save the walls and the desk and the pulpit the pews and the stalls held firmly at bay kick and plunge as he may his struggles are fruitless he can't get away he really can't tell what to do or to say and being a pagan don't know how to pray till through the east window a few streaks of grey announce the approach of the dawn of the day oh a welcome sight is the rosy light which love lily heralds a morning bright above all to a wretch kept in durance all night by a horrid dead gentleman holding him tight of all sorts of gins that a trespasser can trap the most disagreeable kind of a man trap oh welcome that bell's matin chime which tells to one caught in this worst of all possible snares that the hour is arrived to begin morning prayers and the monks and the friars are coming downstairs conceive the surprise of the choir how their eyes are distended to twice their original size how some begin bless some anathematize and all look on the thief as old nick in disguise while the mystified abbot cries well i declare this is really a very mysterious affair bid the bandy-legged sexton go run for the mare the mayor and his suite are soon on their feet his worship kept house in the very same street at once he awakes his compliments makes he'll be up at the church in a couple of shakes meanwhile the whole convent is pulling and hauling and bawling and squalling and terribly mauling the thief whose endeavour to follow his calling had thus brought him into a grasp so enthralling now high now low they drag to and fro now this way now that way they twist him but no the glazed eye of st alois distinctly says poof you may pull as you please i shall not let him go nay more when his worship at length came to say he was perfectly ready to take him away and fat him to grace the next auto da fe still closer he pressed the poor wretch to his breast while a voice though his jaws still together were jammed was heard from his chest if you do i'll here slammed the great door of the church with so awful a sound that the close of the good bishop's sentence was drowned out spake frere jehan a pitiful man oh a pitiful man was he and he wept and he pined for the sins of mankind as a friar in his degree remember good gentlefolks so he began dear alois was always a pitiful man that voice from his chest has clearly expressed he has pardoned the culprit and as for the rest before you shall burn him he'll see you all blessed the monks and the abbot 
the sexton and clerk were exceedingly struck with the friar's remark and the judge who himself was by no means a shark of a lawyer and who did not do things in the dark but still leaned having once been himself a gay spark to the merciful side like the late alan park agreed that indeed the best way to succeed and by which this poor caitiff alone could be freed would be to absolve him and grant a free pardon on a certain condition and that not a hard one viz that he the said infidel straightway should ope his mind to conviction and worship the pope and every man jack in an amice or cope and that to do so he should forthwith go to rome and salute there his holiness's toe and never again read voltaire or tom paine or percy bishy shelley or lord byron's cane his pilgrimage or take st francis habit if anything lay about never to nab it or at worst if he should light on articles gone astray to be sure and deposit them safe in the monastery the oath he took as he kissed the book nave transept and aisle with a thunderclap shook the bishop sank down with a satisfied look and the thief released by the saint deceased fell into the arms of a neighbouring priest it skills not now to tell you how the transmogrified pagan performed his vow how he quitted his home travelled to rome and went to st peter's and looked at the dome and obtained from the pope an assurance of bliss and kissed whatever he gave him to kiss toe relic embroidery not came amiss and how pope urban had the man's turban hung up in the sistine chapel by the way of a relic and how it hangs there to this day suffice it to tell which will do quite as well that the whole of the convent the miracle saw and the abbot's report was sufficient to draw every bon catholique in la belle france to blois among others the monarch himself francois the archbishop of rennes and his pious jack daw and there was not a man in church chapel or meeting-house still less in cabaret hotel or eating-house but made an oration and said in the nation if ever a man deserved canonization it was the kind pitiful pious alois so the pope says says he then a saint he shall be so he made him a saint and remitted the fee what became of the pagan i really can't say but i think i've been told that when he entered their fold and was now a franciscan some twenty days old he got up one fine morning before break of day put the picks in his pocket and then ran away moral i think we may coax out a moral or two from the facts which have lately come under our view first don't meddle with saints for you'll find if you do they're what scotch people call kittle cattle to shoe and when once they have managed to take you in tow it's a deuced hard matter to make them let go now to you wicked pagans who wander about up and down regent street every night on the scout recollect the police keep a sharpish lookout and if once you're suspected your skirts they will stick to till they catch you at last in flagrante delicto don't the inference draw that because he of blois suffered one to bilk old father antic the law that our mayors and our aldermen and we've a city full show themselves at our guild hall quite so pitiful lastly as to the pagan who played such a trick first assuming the tonsure then cutting his stick there is but one thing which occurs to me that is don't give too much credit to people who rat never forget early habits a net which entangles us all more or less in its mesh and what's bred in the bone won't come out of the flesh we must all be aware nature's prone to rebel as old juvenal tells us naturam expellas tamen usque recurrit there's no making her rat so that all that i have on this head to advance is whatever they think of these matters in france there's a proverb the truth of which each one allows here you never can make a silk purse of a sow's ear End of section eighteen read by sandra Montreal, 2023. Section 19 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
read by Ben Tucker. The Ingoldsby Legends, second series by Richard Harris Barnum. In the succeeding legend, we come nearer home. Father Ingoldsby is particular in describing its locality, situate some eight miles from the hall, less if you take the bridle road by the churchyard, and so along the valley by Mr. Fector's Abbey. In the enumeration of the various attempts to appropriate the treasure, drawn from a later source, is omitted one, said to have been undertaken by the worthy ecclesiastic himself, who, as Mrs. Botherby insinuates, is reported to have started for Dover one fine morning, duly furnished with all the means and appliances of exorcism. I cannot learn, however, that the family was ever enriched by his expedition. The Lay of the Old Woman Clothed in Grey, A Legend of Dover Once there lived, as I've heard people say, an old woman clothed in grey, so furrowed with care, so haggard her air, in her eye such a wild supernatural stare, that all who espied her immediately shied her and strove to get out of her way. This fearsome old woman was taken ill, she sent for the doctor, he sent her a pill, and by way of a trial, a two-shilling file, of green-looking fluid like lava diluted, to which I've professed an abhorrence most rooted. One of those drafts they so commonly send us, labelled hostis catharticus mane somendus. She made a wry face, and without saying grace, tossed it off like a dram, it improved not her case. The leech came again, he now opened a vein, so the little old woman continued in pain, so her medical man, although loth to distress her, conceived it high time that her father confessor should be sent for to shrive and to soily and bless her, that she might not slip out of these troublesome scenes, unannealed and unhouseled, whatever that means. Footnote. Alack for poor William Lindley to settle the point. His elucidation of Macbeth's hurly-burly casts a halo around his memory. In him the world lost one of its kindliest spirits, and the Garrick Club its acutest commentator. End footnote. Growing afraid, he calls to his aid a bandy-legged neighbor, a tailor by trade. Footnote. All who are familiar with the police reports and other records of our courts of justice will recollect that every gentleman of this particular profession invariably thus describes himself in contradistinction to the bricklayer, whom he probably presumes to be indigenous and to the shoemaker, born a snob. End footnote. Tells him his fears, bids him lay by his shears, his thimble, his goose, and his needle, and high, with all possible speed, to the convent hard by, requests him to say that he begs they'll all pray, viz. the whole pious brotherhood, cleric and lay, for the soul of an old woman clothed in grey who was just at that time in a very bad way, and he really believed couldn't last out the day, and to state his desire that some erudite friar would run over at once and examine and try her, for he thought he would find there was something behind, a something that weighed on the old woman's mind. In fact, he was sure from what tell from her tongue that this little old woman had done something wrong. Then he wound up the whole with this hint to the man, Mind and pick out as holy a friar as you can. Now I'd have you to know that the story of woe which I'm telling you happened a long time ago. I can't say exactly how long, nor I own what particular monarch was then on the throne. But twas here in old England, and all that one knows is it must have preceded the War of the Roses. Footnote. An antient and most pugnacious family, says our bath friend. One of their descendants, George Rose Esquire, late M.P. for the Christ Church, an elderly gentleman, now defunct, was equally celebrated for his vocal abilities and his wanton destruction of furniture when in a state of excitement. Sing old Rose and burn the bellows has grown into a proverb. End footnote. Inasmuch as the times described in these rhymes were as fruitful in virtues as ours are in crimes, and if amongst the laity unseemly gaiety sometimes betrayed an occasional taint or two, at once all the clerics went into hysterics, while scarcely a convent, but boasted its saint or two. So it must have been long ere the line of the Tudors, as since then the breed of saints rarely indeed, with their dignified presence, have darkened our pew doors. Hence the late Mr. Froud and the lively Dr. Pusey, we moderns consider as each worth a Jew's eye. Though Wiseman and Dolman, 
combine against Newman, with doctors and proctors, and say he's no true man. Footnote. The worthy Jesuit's polemical publisher, I'm not quite sure as to the orthography. It's idem sonans, at all events. End footnote. But this, by the way, the convent I speak about, had saints in scores, they said, mass week and week about, and the two now on duty were each for their piety, second to none in that holy society, and well might have borne those words which are worn by our nullae secundus club, poor dear lost muttons, of guardsmen on club days inscribed on their buttons. They would read, write, and speak, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, a radish bunch munch for a lunch or a leek. Those scoffers and boobies ascribe certain rubies that garnished the nose of the good father Hilary to the overmuch use of canary and sillery. Some said spiritus compounds of viler distillery. Ah, little wrecked, they'd say, that with friars who say, fifty paters a night and a hundred a day, a very slight sustenance goes a great way. Thus the consequence was that his colleague Basilius won golden opinions by looking more bilious. From all who conceive strict monastical duty by no means conducive to personal beauty, and being more meagre and thinner and paler, he was snapped up at once by the bandy-legged tailor. The latter's concern for a speedy return scarce left the monk time to put on stouter sandals or go round to his shrines and snuff all his saints' candles. Still less had he leisure to change the hair shirt he had worn the last twenty years, probably thirty, which not being washed all that time had grown dirty. It seems there's a sin in the wearing clean linen which friars must askew at the very beginning, though it makes them look frowsy and drowsy and blousy, and a rhyme modern etiquette never allows ye. As for the rest, e'en if time had not pressed, it didn't much matter how Basil was dressed, nor could there be any great need for adorning, the night being almost at odds with the morning. O oh, sweet and beautiful is night when the silver moon is high, and countless stars like clustering gems hang sparkling in the sky, while the balmy breath of the summer breeze comes whispering down the glen, and one fond voice alone is heard, O oh, night is lovely then, but when that voice in feeble moans of sickness and of pain, but mocks the anxious ear that strives to catch its sounds in vain, when silently we watch the bed by the taper's flickering light, where all we love is fading fast. How terrible is night! More terrible yet, if you happen to get, by an old woman's bedside who all her life long had been what the vulgar call coming it strong, in all sorts of ways that are naughty and wrong. As confessions are sacred, it's not very facile to ascertain what the old hag said to Basil, but whatever she said, it filled him with dread, and made all his hair stand on end on his head, no great feat to perform, inasmuch as said hair, being clipped by the tonsure, his crown was left bare, so of course Father Basil had little to spare, but the little he had seemed as though it had gone mad. Each lock, as by action galvanic, uprears in the two little tufts on the top of his ears. What, the old woman said, that so filled him with dread, we should never have known any more than the dead, if the bandy-legged tailor, his errand thus bed, had gone quietly back to his needle and thread, as he ought. But instead, curiosity led, a feeling we all deemed extremely well-bred, he contrived to secrete himself under the bed, not that he heard one half or a third of what passed as the monk and the patient conferred, but here and there managed to pick up a word, such as knife and life, and he thought she said wife, and money, that source of all evil and strife. Then he plainly distinguished the words gore and gash, whence he deemed and I don't think this inference rash, she had cut someone's throat for the sake of his cash. Intermixed with her moans and her sighs and her groans, enough to have melted the hearts of the stones, came at intervals Basil's sweet, soft, silver tones, for somehow it happened, I can't tell you why, the good friar's indignation, at first rather high, to judge from the language he used in reply, ere the old woman ceased, had a good deal gone by, and he gently addressed her in accents of honey, Daughter, don't you despair. What's become of the money? And one just at death's door, it was really absurd to see how her eye lighted up at that word. Indeed, there's not one in the language that I know, save its synonym, Spanish, blunt, stumpy, and rhino, which acts so direct and with so much effect on the human sensorium, or makes one erect, one's ears so as soon as the sound we detect. It's a question with me, which of the three, Father Basil himself, though a grave STP, 
such as he have, you see, the degree of DD, or the eavesdropping bandy like a tailor, or she caught it quickest. However, traditions agree that the old woman perked up as brisk as a bee. "'Twas the last quivering flare of the taper, the fire it so often emits when about to expire. Her excitement began the same instant to flag. She sank back and whispered, "'Safe! Safe! In the bag!' Now I would not by any means have you suppose that the good father Basil was just one of those who entertains views were so apt to abuse as neither befitting Turks, Christians, nor Jews, who haunt deathbed scenes by underhand means to toady or tease people out of a legacy. For few folk indeed had such good right to beg as he, since Rome in her pure apostolical beauty not only permits but enjoins as a duty her sons to take care that let who will be heir the pontiff shall not be choused out of his share, nor stand any such mangling of chattels and goods as they say was the case with the late Jimmy Woods. Her conclaves and councils and synods, in short, maintain principles adverse to statutes of Mortmain. Besides, you'll discern it at once when you learn that Basil had something to give in return, since it rested with him to say how she would burn, nay, as to her ill-gotten wealth should she turn it all to use he named he could say you shan't burn at all or nothing to signify not what you'd call dignify so much as even to call it a roast but a mere little singeing or scorching at most what many would think not unpleasantly warm just to keep up appearance mere matter of form all this in her ear he declared but i fear that her senses were wandering she seemed not to hear or at least understand for mere unmeaning talker. Parched lips babbled now, such as, Hokey and Walker! She expired with her last breath, expressing a doubt, if his mother were fully aware he was out. Now it seems there's a place they call purgatory, so I must write it, my verse not admitting the O. But as for the venue, I vow I'm perplexed to say if it's in this world or if in the next. Or whether in both, for tis very well known that St. Patrick, at least, has got one of his own in a tight little island that stands in a lake, called Laudirg, that's the Red Lake, unless I'm mistake, in Fermanagh, or Untrim, or Donegal, which I declare I can't tell, but I know very well. It's in latitude 54, nearly their pitch. At Tappington now I could look in the gazetteer, but I'm out on a visit and nobody has it here. There are some I'm aware who don't stick to declare. There's no differ at all twixt this here and that there. That it's all the same place, but the saint reserves his entry from the separate use of the finest of peasantry. And that his is no more than a mere private door for the ronde chance, as some call the ground floor, to the one which the Pope had found out long before. But no matter lay the locale where you may, and where it is no one exactly can say. There's one thing at least which is known very well, that it acts as a taproom to Satan's hotel. Entertainment, there's worse, both for man and for horse, for broiling the souls. They use Lord Mayor's coals than the sulphurous inferior, and boils up much slower than the fine fruity brimstone they give you down lower. It's by no means so strong, mere slow leaves to Souchong. The prokers are not half so hot or so long, by an inch or two, either in handle or prong. The vipers and snakes are less sharp in the tooth, and the nondescript monster is not near so uncouth. In short, it's a place the good pope, its creator, made for what's called by cockneys a minor theater. Better suited, of course, for a minor performer than the house that's so much better lighted and warmer. Below in that queer place, which nobody mentions, you understand where, I don't question down there, where in lieu of wood blocks and such modern inventions, the paving commissioners use good intentions, materials which here would be thought on by few men, with so many founts of asphaltic bitumen at hand at the same time to pave and illumine. To go on with my story, this same purgatory, there I've got in the O to my muse's great glory, is close locked, and the Pope keeps the keys of it that I can boldly affirm in his desk in the Vatican, not those of St. Peter, those of which I now treat are a bunch by themselves and much smaller and neater. And so cleverly made Mr. Chubb could not frame a key better contrived for its purpose, nor Brahma. Now it seems that by these most miraculous keys not only the Pope but his clergy with ease can let people in and out just as they please, and 
provided you make it all right about fees. There is not a friar Dr. Wiseman will own of them, but can always contrive to obtain a short loan of them. And Basil, no doubt, had brought matters about if the little old woman would but have spoke out. So far as to get for her one of those tickets, or passes, which clear both the great gates and wickets, so that after a grill or short turn on the mill, and with no worse ascending to purge her iniquity than a Freemason gets in the Lodge of Antiquity, she'd have rubbed off old scores, popped out of doors, and sheared off at once for a happier port, like a whitewashed insolvent that's gone through the court. But Basil was one who was not to be done by any one, either in earnest or fun, the cunning old beads telling son of a gun, in all bargains, unless he'd his quid for his quo, would shake his bald pate and pronounce it no-go. So unless you're a dunce, you'll see clearly at once, when you come to consider the facts of the case he, of course, never gave her his vade impesi. And the consequence was, when the last mortal throw released her pale ghost from these regions of woe, the little old woman had nowhere to go. For what could she do? She very well knew, if she went to the gates I have mentioned to you, without Basil's or some other passport to shew, the check-takers never would let her go through, while as to the other place, e'en had she tried it, and really had wished it, as much as she shied it, for no one who knows what it is can abide it, had she knocked at the portal with ne'er so much din, though she died in what folks at Rome call mortal sin, yet old Nick, for the life of him, daren't take her in as she'd not been turned formally out of the pale. So much the bare name of the Pope made him quail. In the times that I speak of, his courage would fail, of Rome's vassals the lowest and worst to assail, or e'en touched with so much as the end of his tail. Though now he's grown older, they say he's much bolder, and his holiness not only gets the cold shoulder, but Nick rumps him completely and don't seem to care a dump, that's the word, for his triple tiara. Well, what shall she do? What's the course to pursue? Try St. Peter, this step is a bold one to take, for the saint is there can't be a doubt. Wide awake. But then there's a quaint old proverb says, Faint heart, ne'er one fair lady, than how when a saint. I've a great mind to try, one can but apply. If things come to the worst, why, he can but deny. The sky's rather high, to be sure, but now I, that cumbersome carcass of clay have laid by. I'm just in the order which some folks, though why, I am sure I can't tell you, would call apple pie. Then never say die, it won't do to be shy. So I'll tuck up my shroud, and here goes for a fly. So said and so done, she was off like a shot, and kept on the whole way at a pretty smart trot. When she drew so near that the saint could see her, in a moment he frowned and began to look queer, and scarce would allow her to make her case clear, ere he pursed up his mouth twixt a sneer and a jeer with, it's all very well, but you do not lodge here. Then calling her everything but my dear, he applied his great toe with some force all derriere, and dismissed her at once with a flea in her ear. Alas, poor ghost, it's a doubt which is most to be pitied, one doomed to fry, broil, boil, and roast, or one bandied about thus from pillar to post, to be all abroad, to be stumped, not to know where, to go so disgraced as not to be placed, or as Crocky would say to Jim Bland, to be nowhere, however that be. The affair was fini, and the poor wretch rejected by all, as you see. Mr. Oliver Goldsmith observes, not the Jew, that the hare whom the hounds and the huntsmen pursue, having no other sort of asylum in view, returns back again to the place whence she flew, a fact which experience has proved to be true. Mr. Gray, in opinion, with whom Johnson clashes, declares that our wanted fires live in our ashes. Footnote. Even in our ashes live their wanted fires. Gray. End footnote. These motives combined perhaps brought back the hag, the first to her mansion, the last to her bag. When only conceive her dismay and surprise, as a ghost how she opened her cold stony eyes, when there on the spot where she hid her supplies, in an underground cellar of very small size, Working hard with a spade, all at once she surveyed that confounded old bandy-legged tailor by trade. Fancy the tone of the half-moan, half-groan, which burst from the breast of the ghost of the crone, as she stood there, a figure twixt moonshine and stone, only fancy the glare in her eyeballs that shone. Although, as Macbeth says, they'd no speculation, 
while she uttered that word, which American bird, or James Fenimore Cooper, would render tarnation. At the noise which she made, down went the spade, and up jumped the bandy-legged tailor by trade, who had shrewdly conjectured from something that fell her deposit was somewhere concealed in the cellar. Turning round at a sound so extremely profound, the moment her shadowy form met his view, he gave vent to a sort of a lengthened boo, with a countenance Keeley alone could put on, made one grasshopper spring to the door and was gone. Eruppet, vasset, as at Rome they would phrase it. His flight was so swift, the eye scarcely could trace it. Though elderly, bandy-legged, meager, and sickly, I doubt if the ghost could have vanished more quickly. He reached his own shop and then fell into fits, and it's said never rightly recovered his wits, while the chuckling old hag takes his place and there sits. I'll venture to say she'd sat there to this day, brooding over what Cobbett calls vile yellow clay, like a vulture or other obscene bird of prey, over the nest full of eggs she has managed to lay. If, as legends relate, and I think we may trust em, her stars had not brought her another guest customer, t'was Basil himself come to look for her pelf, but not like the tailor to dig delve and grovel, and grub in the cellar with pickaxe and shovel. Full well he knew such tools would not do, far other the weapons he brought into play, viz a wax paper hallowed on Candlemas day, to light her ducats, holy water, two buckets, made with salt, Half a peck to four gallons, which bruise a strong triple X strike. See, Jacob de Chuse. With these two he took his bell and his book. Not a nerve ever trembled, his hand never shook, as he boldly marched up where she sat in her nook, glowering round with that wild, indescribable look, which some may have read of, perchance, in Nell Cook. All in Martha the Gypsy by Theodore Hook. And now for the reason I gave you before of what passed then and there I can tell you no more, as no tailor was near with his ear to the door. But I've always been told with respect to the gold for which she her jewel eternal had sold, that the old Herodan, who no doubt knew her man, made some compromise, hit upon some sort of plan, by which friar and ghost were both equally pinned. Heaven only knows how the agreement got wind, but its purport was this, that the things done amiss by the hag should not hinder her ultimate bliss, provided, imprimis, the cash from this time is, the churches impounded for good pious uses. Father B shall dispose of it just as he chooses and act as trustee, in the meantime that she, the said ghostess, or ghost, as the matter may be, from impediment, hindrance, and let shall be free to sleep in her grave or wander as he the said friar with said ghost may hereafter agree moreover the whole of the said cash or coal shall be spent for the good of said old woman's soul it is farther agreed while said cash is so spending said ghost shall be fully absolved from attending and shall quiet remain in the grave her domain to have and enjoy and uphold and maintain without molestation or trouble or pain hindrance let or impediment over again from old nick or from any one else of his train whether power domination or princedom or throne or by what name soever the same may be known footnote Thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers. End footnote. Howsoever called by poets or styled by divines, himself, his executors, heirs, and assigns, provided that nevertheless, notwithstanding, all herein contained, if whoever's a hand in dispensing said cash or said coal shall dare venture to misapply money, note, bill, or debenture, to use as not named in this present indenture, then that such sum or sums shall revert and come home again. Back to said ghost, who thenceforward shall roam again, until such time or times, as the said ghost produces, some good man and true, who no longer refuses, to put some or sums aforesaid to said uses, which duly performed, the said ghost shall have rest, the full term of her natural death of the best, in full consideration of this, her bequest, in manner and form aforesaid, as expressed, in witness whereof we, the parties aforesaid, hereunto set our hands and our seals, and no more said, being all that these presents intend to express, whereas notwithstanding, and nevertheless. Signed, sealed, and delivered this twentieth of May, 
Anno Domini, blank, though I've mentioned the day. Signed, Basil, old woman, late, clothed in grey. Basil now, I am told, walking off with the gold, went and straight got the document duly enrolled, and left a testatrix to mildew and mould in her sepulchre, cosy, cool, not to say cold, but somehow, though how I can hardly divine, a runlet of fine, rich, malvoisy wine, found its way to the convent that night before nine, with custards and flans and a fair florentine, peach apricot, nectarine, melon, and pine, and some half a score nuns of the rule Brigitine, abbess and all, were invited to dine at a very late hour, that is, after complying. Father Hillary's rubies began soon to shine with fresh luster as though newly dug from the mine. Through all the next year, indeed, t'would appear that the convent was much better off as to cheer. Even Basil himself, as I very much fear, no longer addicted himself to small beer. His complexion grew clear, while in front and in rear, he enlarged so his shape seemed approaching a sphere. No wonder at all, then, one cold winter's night, that a servant girl going downstairs with a light to the cellar we've spoken of saw, with a fright, an old woman astride on a barrel invite her to take, in a manner extremely polite, with her left hand a bag she had got in her right. For tradition asserts that the old woman's purse had come back to her scarcely one penny the worse. The girl, as they say, ran screaming away, quite scared by the old woman, clothed in grey. But there came down a night, at no distant a day, sprightly and gay as the bird on the spray, one Sir Rufus Montfartington, Lord of Footscray whose estate, not unlike those of most our swell bow, was what's by a metaphor termed out at elbows, and the fact was said knight was now merely delayed from crossing the water to join the crusade, for converting the pagans with Bilbo and Blade, by the want of a little pecuniary aid, to buy arms and horses, the tools of his trade, and enable his troop to appear on parade. The unquiet shade, thought Sir Rufus, tis said, just the man for her money, she readily paid. For the article named, and with pleasure conveyed, To his hands every farthing she ever had made. But alas, I'm afraid, most unwisely she laid out her cash, The beau of a Saracen maid. Truth compels me to say a most pestilent jade, Converted the gallant converter, betrayed, Him to do everything which a knight could degrade. E'en to worship my hound, she required, he obeyed. The consequence was all the money was wasted On infidel pleasures he should not have tasted, so that after a very short respite the hag was seen down in her cellar again with her bag. Don't fancy, dear reader, I mean to go on, seriatim through so many ages bygone, and to bore you with names of the squires and the dames who have managed at times to get hold of the sack, but spent the cash so that it always came back. The list is too long to be given in my song. There are reasons beside would perhaps make it wrong. I shall merely observe in those orthodox days, when Mary set Smithfield all o'er in a blaze, and showed herself very severe against heresy, while many a wretch scorned to flinch or to scream as he burnt for denying the papal supremacy. Bishop Bonner the bag got, and all thought the hag got, released as he spent all in fuel and fagot, but somehow, though how I can't tell you I vow, I suppose by mismanagement, ere the next reign, the spectre had got all her money again. The last time I'm told that the old woman's gold was obtained as before, for the asking t'was had by a Mr. O. something from Balanafad, and the whole of it, so tis reported, was sent to John Wright's an account for the Catholic rent, and thus like a great deal more money it went. So tis said at Maynooth, but I can't think it's the truth, Though I know it was boldly asserted last season, still I cannot believe it, and that for this reason it's certain the cash has got back to its owner. Now no part of the rent to do so e'er was known, or in any shape ever come home to the donor. Gentle reader, you must know the proverb, I think, to a blind horse a nod is as good as a wink, which some learned chap in a square college cap perhaps would translate by the words versum sap. Now should it so chance that you're going to France in the course of next spring, as you probably may, do pull up and stay, pray, if but for a day, at Dover, through which you must pass on your way, at the York or the ship, whereas all people say you'll get good wine yourself and your horses good hay. 
Perhaps, my good friend, you may find it will pay, and you cannot lose much by so short a delay. First dine, you can do, that on joint or ragu, then say to the waiter, I'm just passing through. Pray, where can I find out the old maison du? He'll show you the street. The French call it a rue, but you won't have to give here a petite écu. Well, when you've got there, never mind how you're taunted, ask boldly, pray, which is the house here that's haunted? I'd tell you myself, but I can't recollect the proprietor's name, but he's one of that sect who call themselves friends and whom others call Quakers. You'll be sure to find out if you ask at the baker's. Then go down with a light to the cellar at night, and as soon as you see her, don't be in a fright, but ask the old hag at once for the bag. If you find that she's shy or your senses would dazzle, say, ma'am, I insist, in the name of St. Basil. If she gives it you, seize it, and do as you please, but there is not a person I've asked but agrees. You should spend, part at least, for the old woman's ease. For the rest, if it must go back some day, why, let it. Meanwhile, if you're poor and in love or in debt, it may do you some good, and I wish you may get it. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Inglesby Legends, second series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Inglesby Legends, second series, by Richard Harris Barham. To whom is the name Cornelius Agrippa otherwise than familiar? since a magician of renown not inferior to his own has brought him and his terrible black book again before the world that he was celebrated among other exploits for raising the devil we are all well aware how he performed this feat at least one and that perhaps the most certain method by which he did it is thus described raising the devil a legend of cornelius agrippa and hast thou nerve enough he said that old grey man above whose head unnumbered years had rolled and hast thou nerve to view he cried the incarnate fiend that heaven defied art thou indeed so bold say canst thou with unshrinking gaze sustain rash youth the withering blaze of that unearthly eye that blasts where'er it lights the breath that like the simoom scatters death on all that yet can die darest thou confront that fearful form that rides the whirlwind and the storm in wild unholy revel the terrors of that blasted brow archangels once though ruined now i darest thou face the devil i dare the desperate youth replied and placed him by the old man's side in fierce and frantic glee unblenched his cheek and firm his limb no paltry juggling fiend but him the devil i fain would see in all his gorgon terrors clad his worst his fellow shape the lad rejoined in reckless tone have then thy wish agrippa said and sighed and shook his hoary head with many a bitter groan he drew the mystic circles bound with skull and crossbones fenced around he traced for many a sigil there he muttered many a backward prayer that sounded like a curse he comes he cried with wild grimace the fellest of apollyon's race then in his startled pupil's face he dashed an empty purse End of section 20, read by Alan Mapstone.
Section 21 of the Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Noreen. The Ingoldsby Legends, Second Series, by Richard Harris Barham. One more legend, and then, gentle reader, a Merry Christmas to you, and a Happy New Year. We have travelled over many lands together, and had many a good-humoured laugh, by the way. If we have occasionally been more merry than wise, at least we have not jostled our neighbours on the road, much less have we kicked anyone into a ditch. So, wishing you heartily all the compliments of the season, and thanking you cordially for your good company, I, Thomas Inglesby, bid you heartily farewell, and leave you in that of St. Medard, a legend of Afric. Heus tu, inquit Diablos, he mihi, vesis in super humeris reponenda est sarcina, fer opem quaeso. Le Diable a de vis, c'est là ce qui le perd. Il est gourmand. Il est, dans cette minute-là, l'idée de joindre l'âme de Médard aux autres âmes qu'il allait emporter. Se rejeter en arrière, saisir de sa main droite son poignard, et en percer l'outre avec une violence et une rapidité formidables. C'est ce que fit Médard. Le diable poussa un grand cri. Les âmes délivrées s'enfuirent par l'ici que le poignard venait de leur ouvrir, laissant dans l'outre leur noisseur, le crime et leur méchanceté, etc., etc. In good King Dagobert's palmy days, when saints were many and sins were few, old Nick, tis said, was sore bested one evening and could not tell what to do. He had been east and he had been west, and far had he journeyed o'er land and sea, for women and men were warier then, and he could not catch one, where now he'd catch three. He had been north, and he had been south, from Zembla's shores unto far Peru, ere he filled the sack which he bore on his back. Saints were so many, and sins so few. The way was long, and the day was hot, his wings were weary, his hoofs were sore, and scarce could he trail his nerveless tail as it furrowed the sand on the Red Sea shore. The day had been hot, and the way was long, hoof sore and weary, and faint was he. He lowered his sack, and the heat of his back, as he leaned on a palm trunk, blasted the tree. He sat himself down in the palm tree's shade, and he gazed and he grinned in pure delight as he peeped inside the buffalo's hide he had sewn for a sack and had crammed so tight for though he'd gone over a good deal of ground and game had been scarce he might well report that still he had got a decentish lot and had had on the whole not a bad day's sport he had picked up in france a maitre de dance a maîtresse en titre, two smart grisettes, a courtier at play, and an English roué who had bolted from home without paying his debts. He had caught in Great Britain a scrivener's clerk, a Quaker, a baker, a doctor of laws, and a jockey of York, but Paddy from Cork. They saved the old devil and slipped through his claws. In Moscow, a boyar knouting his wife a corsair's crew in the isles of Greece, and under the dome of St. Peter's at Rome he'd snapped up a nice little cardinal's niece. He had bagged an inquisitor fresh from Spain, a mendicant friar, of monks a score, a grave don or two, and a Portuguese Jew, whom he'd nabbed while clipping a new mois d'or. And he said to himself, as he licked his lips, those nice little dears, what a delicate roast! Then that fine fat friar, at a very quick fire, dressed like a woodcock 
and served on toast. At the sight of titbits so toothsome and choice, never did mouth water more than Nick's, but alas and alack, he had stuffed his sack so full that he found himself quite in a fix. For all he could do, or all he could say, when a little recruited he rose to go, alas and alack, he could not get the sack up again on his shoulders, whether or no. Old Nick looked east, old Nick looked west, with many a stretch and with many a strain. He bent till his back was ready to crack, and he pulled and he tugged, but he tugged in vain. Old Nick looked north, old Nick looked south. Weary was Nicholas, weak and faint, and he was aware of an old man there, in palmer's weeds, who looked much like a saint. Nick eyed the saint, then he eyed the sack, the greedy old glutton, and thought, with a grin, Dear heart alive, if I could but contrive to pop that elderly gentleman in. For were I to choose among all the ragouts, the cuisine can in exhibit, flesh, fowl, or fish, to myself I can paint that a barbecued saint would be for my palate the best side dish. Now, St. Medard dwelt on the banks of the Nile, in a pyramid fast by the lone Red Sea. We call it Semiramis. Why not say Pyramis? Why should we change the S into a D? St. Medard, he was a holy man. A holy man, I ween, was he. And even by day, when he went to pray, he would light up a candle that all might see. He salaamed to the east, he salaamed to the west, of the gravest cut and the holiest brown were his palmer's weeds, and he fingered his beads with the right side up and the wrong side down. Hiatus in Manuscript Valde de Flendus St. Medard dwelt on the banks of the Nile. He had been living there years for score, and now, taking the air and saying a prayer, he was walking at eve on the Red Sea shore. Little he deemed, that holy man, of old Nick's wiles and his fraudful tricks, when he was aware of a stranger there, who seemed to have got himself into a fix. Deeply that stranger groaned and sighed, that wayfaring stranger, grisly and grey. I can't raise my sack on my poor old back. Oh, lend me a lift, kind gentleman, pray. For I have been east, and I have been west. Footsore, weary, and faint am I. And unless I get home, ere the curfew boom, here in this desert I well may die. Now heaven thee save. Nick winced at the words, as ever he winces at words divine. Now heaven thee save. What strength I have, it's little I wis, shall be freely thine. For foul befall that Christian man, who shall fail in a fix, woe worth the while, his hand to lend, to foe or to friend, or to help a lame dog, over a stile. St. Medard hath boned himself for the task. To hoist up the sack he doth well begin. But the fardel feels like a back full of eels, for the folks are all curling and kicking within. St. Medard paused. He began to smoke, for a saint, if he isn't exactly a cat, has a very good nose, as this world goes, and not worse than his neighbours for smelling a rat. The saint looked up, and the saint looked down. He smelt the rat, and he smoked the trick. When he came to view his comical shoe, he saw in a moment his friend was Nick. He whipped out his oyster-knife, broad and keen, a brummagem blade which he always bore, to aid him to eat, by way of a treat, the natives he found on the Red Sea shore. He whipped out his brummagem blade so keen, and he made three slits in the buffalo's hide, and all its contents, through the rents and the vents, came tumbling out, and away they all hide. Away went the Quaker, 
Away went the baker, away went the friar, that fine fat ghost, whose marrow, old Nick, had intended to pick, dressed like a woodcock and served on toast. Away went the nice little cardinal's niece, and the pretty grisettes, and the dons from Spain, and the corsair's crew, and the coin-clipping Jew, and they scampered, like lamplighters, over the plain. Old Nick is a black-looking fellow at best, ay, even when he's pleased, but never before had he looked so black as on seeing his sack thus cut into slits on the Red Sea shore. You may fancy his rage and his deep despair when he saw himself thus befooled by one whom, in anger wild, he profanely styled a stupid old snuff-coloured son of a gun. Then his supper, so nice, that had cost him such pains, such a hard day's work, now all on the go. T'was beyond a joke, and enough to provoke the mildest and best-tempered fiend below. Nick snatched up one of those great big stones, found in such numbers on Egypt's plains, and he hurled it straight at the saint's bald pate, to knock out the gruel he called his brains. Straight at his pate he hurled the weight, the crushing weight of that great big stone. But St. Medard was remarkably hard and solid about the parietal bone. And though the whole weight of that great big stone came straight on his pate with a great big thump, it failed to graze the skin or to raise on the tough epidermis a lump or a bump. As the hail bounds off from the penthouse slope, as the cannon recoils when it sends its shot, as the finger and thumb of an old woman come from the kettle she handles and finds too hot, or, as you may see in the fleet or the bench, many folks do in the course of their lives, the well-struck ball rebound from the wall when the gentlemen jailbirds are playing at fives. All these and a thousand fine similes more, such as all have heard of, or seen, or read, recorded in print, may give you a hint how the stone bounced off from St. Medard's head. And it curled, and it twirled, and it whirled in the air, as this great big stone at a tangent flew. Just missing his crown, it at last came down, plump, upon Nick's orthopedical shoe. Oh, what a yell and a screech were there! How did he hop, skip, bellow, and roar? Oh, dear! Oh, dear! You might hear him here, though we're such a way off from the Red Sea shore. It smashed his shin, and it smashed his hoof, notwithstanding his stout orthopedical shoe. And this is the way that from that same day old Nick became what the French call boiteux. Quakers and bakers, grisettes and friars, and cardinals' nieces, wherever ye be, St. Medard bless, you can scarcely do less, if you of your core possess any esprit. And mind, and take care yourselves, and beware how you get in Nick's buffalo bag. If you do, I very much doubt if you'll ever get out, now sins are so many, and saints so few. Moral. Gentle reader, attend to the voice of a friend, and if ever you go to Herne Bay or South End, or any gay watering place outside the Nore, don't walk out at eve on the lone seashore, unless you're too saintly to care about Nick, and are sure that your head is sufficiently thick. Learn not to be greedy, and when you've enough, don't be anxious your bag's any tighter to stuff. Recollect that good fortune too far you may push, and a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Then turn not each thought to increasing your store, nor look always like Oliver, asking for more. Gourmandise is a vice, a sad failing at least. So remember, enough is as good as a feast. And don't set your heart on stewed, fried, boiled, or roast, nor on delicate woodcocks served up upon toast. Don't give people nicknames, don't, even in fun, call anyone 
snuff-coloured son of a gun. Nor fancy because a man now seems to lack, that whenever you please you can give him the sack. Last of all, as you'd thrive and still sleep in whole bones, if you've any glass windows, never throw stones. End of section 21 End of the Ingoldsby Legends, second series, by Richard Harris Barham